section one of whitman an interpretation in narrative this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org whitman an interpretation in narrative by emory holloway section one preface each year walt whitman looms larger on the literary horizon of america in nineteen fifteen he received ten votes for the hall of fame in nineteen twenty twenty in nineteen twenty five forty four or almost a majority of the electors in the last named year was started the first movement to erect a statue to the poet in new york city at the same time the new york public library opened in its main exhibition room a great display of whitmanania forty cases were crammed with whitman editions manuscripts photographs works of art personalia and criticism oil paintings busts plaques medals and etchings added testimony that the good grey poet's striking individuality had caught the eye of the artist as well as that of the reader and the maker of books the exhibition was one to impress even the casual observer with the fact that for better or worse here was a man who had left his mark upon time the translations from his writings alone numbered some twenty-five volumes marking his influence as it has spread from france germany italy and denmark to south america and japan but the sixty volumes of biography and criticism showed that like many a prophet and innovator he has been the storm centre of controversies some of which bear only accidental relations to the man himself and though his genius is to-day generally recognized by the intelligent many opinions obtain as to his personal character his philosophic teachings his artistic importance thoreau moncure conway dr richard maurice buck and john burroughs found in whitman something of the demigod stevenson and john annington simons discovered in him a sadly needed tonic for the anemia of too much civilization many modern poets sculptors and painters found in him an inspiring crusader of art emerson the first to praise him at once greeted him at the beginning of a great career yet there have been those who could describe him as neither poet nor philosopher while others have sought to show that his life was immoral and his mentality abnormal such a life cannot be neglected though to the biographer it may seem to bristle with contradictions here certainly is no subject to be simplified by a theory no ideal to be emphasized by discreet silence he himself would not have it so do i contradict myself very well then i contradict myself i am large i contain multitudes we may find indeed that the contradiction is more fundamental than he realized that it was often the undisciplined emotionalism of the child rather than the complex cerebration of the normal adult but even so youth is immortal and knows itself to be and if in whitman's form there be not always that perfection which makes art of so long life there is a compensating vitality which provokes in the reader something more than ordinary aesthetic pleasure or literary dislike in another sense the multitudes which he includes are the hosts of humanity in the america of the nineteenth century being in a curious sense a composite of our several cultures a blend as the future american must be of more than one race whitman reminds every man a little of himself yet no class in america seems to perceive in him the american perhaps he makes too concrete our crudity our inexperience our brag and possibly the more readily for that very reason he is accepted by other countries as typical of us all in any case he is a literary figure almost unique in his strange blending of oriental and occidental influences his absorbing of a country is yet ununified in its temper and its ambition his equal relish for the classical and the romantic his realism and his mystic idealism his childish naivete and his profound and far-seeing faith but if this phenomenon 
be a matter of interest there is inspiration in the demonstration his life gives of the opportunity enjoyed by a man with no advantages other than his character and his talent to rise in a democracy to a position of honour and influence so much new light has been thrown upon the life and writings of whitman since the last biography was published that a new telling of his story seems appropriate perhaps there will always be a new one as age after age interprets him after its will or need and doubtless the personal equation of the writer enters into the present story also but at least i have attempted to paint a faithful picture of the man wherever possible in his own words nothing has been included merely for its intrinsic interest nothing excluded because it lacks such interest if the book be readable it must be because it provokes the reader to traverse with sympathy though not without caution the life events of this great but human poet yet i have abbreviated the narrative by picking it up only where it has character and where the abundance of records makes it possible without invention to tell an imaginative story and i have refrained from employing the man as a mere pedestal for his book or from telling the story of that book's now world-wide influence except in so far as it affected his personal life so greatly has his fame spread since his death in eighteen ninety two than not to make this distinction would mar the symmetry of my plan indeed the story of the book deserves a volume of its own though i myself have no intention of attempting to write it i have had two main purposes in writing this book first i have tried through thirteen years of study and research to find the necessary facts and the proper point of view for such a picture of whitman as would remove him from the field of fruitless controversy that all that is noble in his poetry and in his example might begin to function in a larger realm than academic and artistic circles second i have tried to present the picture in a manner acceptable to the general reader who for whatever reason as yet knows nothing of whitman rather than for the scholar already versed in whitman literature the latter will accordingly find as in any new whitman biography he must things he has seen before though perhaps here displayed in a new light i have not delayed the narrative to cite evidence or authority even when fuller knowledge has caused me to alter some of my previously published conclusions about whitman most of that evidence can be found in my two volumes the uncollected poetry and prose of walt whitman here it will be sufficient to add that in this study i have included nothing which is not as i believe provable fact or a logical deduction from such facts in addition to all those who lent assistance in my earlier whitman publications i wish to thank messrs doubleday page and company for permission to reprint the poem on pages three fourteen to fifteen of which they hold the copyright professor bliss perry and messrs houghton mifflin and company for permission to quote from a manuscript in the former's most helpful biography mr lewis i haber and the new york evening post for permission to use the letter given on pages two hundred to two hundred and five and the owners of the various pictures and manuscripts used as illustrations whose names will be found in the list of illustrations e h brooklyn january one nineteen twenty six end of section one section two of whitman and interpretation in narrative by emory holloway this librivox recording is in the public domain book one a journalist in brooklyn part one when in january eighteen forty six the brooklyn daily eagle lost by death its editor the fact was of some consequence to the paper but of much more to its new pilot walter whitman for though at the age of twenty-seven he had given no promise of genius yet he was destined to go far and it was as editor of the eagle that he began to think of himself in connection with the unique role he was to play in the history of his country to him it appeared it is true only as a welcome opportunity to realize his life ambition as a journalist 
leaving at the age of twelve a school in which he was learning little he soon had gravitated to the local printing offices first as devil and then as compositor but always with his eye upon the editorial sanctum at twenty after teaching a few country schools on his native long island he had started a weekly newspaper at huntington but his fondness for basking in the sunlight or for floating languidly in the waters of the bay had occasioned such an irregular delivery of his papers that before the end of the year a more conventional and dependable editor had come to take his place since that time he had been trying his hand at many things dabbling in politics teaching school writing sentimental prose and verse for the magazines devoting a dime melodrama to the washingtonian crusade against intemperance working as compositor or editor of now forgotten newspapers in new york at the moment he was writing a little each week for the brooklyn star whose lack of enterprise he despised and for this he was being paid four or five dollars a week if in his record there was little save party regularity to recommend him to the democratic bosses who controlled the eagle started a few years before as a campaign sheet there was still less in his training or his social position in the community his almost complete lack of schooling betrayed him into many slips in his grammar and confirmed him in many obtrusive mannerisms he had known no discipline except that of the printing office and while many men of letters have come from the school with sharp eyes and awakened sympathies it is after all a training in which interest counts more than accuracy feeling more than form in a sense the city itself had been his chief teacher for he went everywhere enjoying the romance of a young world with undiscriminating enthusiasm he also read widely but without much plan at home he found no library for his parents were not educated either walter whitman senior was a carpenter though when walt was born he had been living on an excellent farm inherited from more successful ancestors he was a reliable workman and an honest man but as he was not shrewd in business his large family often knew the pinch of poverty and still oftener lived in the shadow of a mortgage of course such a parent could impart to his children no more sense of mastery than he had himself which was small indeed they grew up according to their varying natures acquiring some family affection but very little sense of family solidarity in a day when religion was itself a discipline in respectability the whitman home knew no family worship no wonder that for an imaginative boy the city would have to serve both as school and as home from his father walt inherited english traits the line running back to an early new england puritan which made him peculiarly responsive to the transcendental and reformatory sentimentality characteristic of his day equally important to him was the counterpoise which he owed to the healthy this worldliness of his devoted dutch mother she was the heart of the family and to her walt was most strongly attached but the whitmans though honest and respectable were nobodies in the community when it came to lending prestige to their son or to his new paper yet in whitman himself there was a large friendliness a sanity of outlook and an inflexible determination that invited trust physically he was above average his six feet of height his two hundred pounds of weight his large but shapely hands his deep rich voice and his untrimmed beard gave him the appearance of an athlete yet when he disrobed for his daily swim at gray's salt-water baths at the foot of fulton street he disclosed skin as pink as a baby's as tender as a woman's and in his mental make-up there was no, to appear the same persistent paradox with courage and vigour such as the eighteen forties associated only with masculine minds he yet had a sentimentality a tenderness as commonly associated with feminine hearts one is not surprised to find in him therefore a strange blending of politics and religion 
his first tutor in the printing craft was an old man who had many stories to tell of revolutionary heroes by chance whitman himself had been kissed as a lad of six by lafayette on the occasion of the latter's visit to brooklyn in eighteen twenty five in religion he took more after his mother's family who were quakers though he had attended regular sunday schools and methodist revivals never a member of the church he nevertheless encouraged others to go to church especially the churches which retained a measure of primitive democratic simplicity pride and formalism he detested with the self-righteousness of the social inferior as we shall see this blending of religion and patriotism ultimately gave direction and form to his mission in life an editor of such qualities and antecedents was a risk for a party paper beyond doubt but the eagle had little to lose in its few years of existence it had developed but a small circulation its office force consisted of only five or six persons including the proprietor isaac van anden and the devil will sutton the first and the last of its four pages were devoted to advertising and legal notices as was part of the third page on the second page editorials and news stories jostled each other as did communications and the latest intelligence from europe later that is by twenty-seven days than it was in london this page was a mental transcript of the mind of the man who must be editor reporter dramatic critic and book reviewer all in one the work was congenial to whitman the pay good and the future anything he could make it before long the paper began to take on new life more space was given to reading matter excerpts were liberally reprinted from the books the editor was reading for the pious a column of sabbath reading was run on saturdays and the paper was gradually made the organ not so much of a party except when an election impended as of a personality van anden though sometimes irritated by his editor's irregular hours exerted himself to make the most of the new order of things one day when new type had been bought for the eagle whitman taking his readers into his confidence wrote an editorial to urge trial subscriptions and incidentally to describe the relation he wished to establish with his public there is a curious kind of sympathy haven't you ever thought of it before that arises in the mind of the newspaper conductor with the public he serves he gets to love them daily communion creates a sort of brotherhood and sisterhood between the two parties as for us we like this we like it better than the more dignified part of editorial labors the grave political disquisition the contests of faction and so on and we want as many readers of the brooklyn eagle even unto the half of long island as possible that we may increase the number of these friends for are not those who listen to us friends perhaps no office requires a greater union of rare qualities than that of a true editor no wonder then that so few come under that flattering title no wonder that we are all derelict in some particular in general information an editor should be complete particularly with that relating to his own country he should have a fluent style elaborate finish we do not think requisite in daily writing his articles had far better be earnest and terse than polished they should ever smack of being uttered on the spur of the moment like political oratory an editor needs withal a sharp eye to discriminate the good from the immense mass of unreal stuff floating on all sides of him and always bearing the counterfeit presentment of the real with all and any drawbacks however much good can always be done with such a potent influence as a well-circulated newspaper to wield that influence is a great responsibility there are numerous noble reforms that have yet to be pressed upon the world people are to be schooled in opposition perhaps to their long-established ways of thought in politics too the field of improvement is wide enough yet the harvest is large and waiting to be reaped and each paper however humble may do good in the ranks nor is it a mere monotonous writer after old fashions that can achieve the good we speak of editing a paper was thus a form of democratic statesmanship with whitman patriotism was a sort of religion and he conceived of it as essentially a new religion it had glamour it inspired it involved responsibilities 
in a word it made life at once serious and romantic in this he shared a feeling common in his day the young country was so loosely held together was so heterogeneous in its varied provincialisms was so conscious of the experimental nature of its government that it felt a natural need to stress the more what unifying memories and ideals it had the fourth of july for instance was more than a patriotic gesture it had the value of a sacrament for weeks whitman had been urging a proper observance of independence day when it arrived he found that rain had sadly thinned the procession yet he waded through the mud in the ardour of an enthusiast saying to all whom he recognised a fine day he could not afford to admit defeat at hands of the weather for it was in a way his own show he had volunteered to write an ode to be sung to the tune of the star-spangled banner and he thought it not the worst of his efforts so far o god of columbia o shield of the free more grateful to you than the fames of old story must the blood bedewed soil the red battleground be where our forefathers championed america's glory then how priceless the worth of the sanctified earth we are standing on now lo the slopes of its girth where the martyrs were buried nor prayers tears or stones mark their crumpled in coffins their white holy bones and shall not the years as they sweep o'er and o'er shall they not even here bring the children of ages to exult as their fathers exulted before in the freedom achieved by our ancestral sages and the prayer rise to heaven with pure gratitude given and the sky by the thunder of cannon be riven yea yea let the answer responsively roll the echo that starts from the patriot's soul decidedly it was not a good song even when judged by the conventional poetic standards of his day yet the emotion it attempted to give voice was genuine for whitman had personal links with fort green the spot he celebrated and largely through his efforts in the eagle it was a little later converted into a public park his great-uncle had fallen in the battle of brooklyn and major brush a maternal ancestor had perished in an english prison of the prison ship martyrs to whose uncared for remains he alludes in the ode he could speak temperately no more than could philip freneau his uncles had been in camp near by during the last war with england to whitman it was sacred ground if only because washington had trod upon it the vociferous celebration of the fourth of july emphasized the national tendency to glorify liberty rather than equality or fraternity whitman had read his rousseau and had some knowledge of the tyrannical conditions in europe which made the contract social so welcome a polemic his patriotism began in his reverence for revolutionary heroes already becoming legendary saints in fiction in drama and in political oratory heroes whose heroism consisted in the fact that they had at cost to themselves won for the colonies the right henceforth to do as they pleased but what specifically did whitman wish the young country freed from for one thing from class rule and in this aspiration the young editor voiced not only the zeitgeist but also a personal need his political religion like every religion that grows sought to free the worshipper from his but half realized limitations through his faith no one could have found fault with the opinion of benjamin halleck whitman's school-teacher that the boy would never amount to anything without family prestige without education without regular habits or a systematic mind with dogged determination to have his way rather than steadiness of purpose how far could one hope to go in an aristocracy but in a democracy he thought it must be different in being a strict constructionist the conception of government held by the young editor was emerson's that the best government is that which governs least the government he said should make no more laws than those used for preventing a man or body of men from infringing on the rights of other men since the function of the federal government was to do this for the states the union must be preserved at all costs lest in its dissolution sections of the country revert to aristocracy and injustice when one day the new york sun expressing the sentiment of the south declared our government is a union of free states and not a consolidation of states whitman was quick to feel the possibility of civil war 
with uncommon courage for a democratic paper the eagle took issue with its new york contemporary the worst of such insidious articles as the sun's is that they depress the idea of the sacredness of the bond of union of these states that bond is the foundation of incomparably the highest political blessings enjoyed in the world and the position of things at present demands that its sacredness should be recognized by every and all american citizens however they may differ on points of doctrine or abstract rights yet to maintain his party's position on the question of the supremacy of local self-government he was willing to play hands off so far as the national government was concerned even in the matter of an institution so inimical to his theory of democratic equality as was slavery in the south with the present slave states he counselled his readers no human being anywhere out from themselves has the least shadow of a right to interfere when however it came to the extension of slavery into the free lands of the west he was more and more outspoken that touched the national life both in principle and in fact it was not strange that the indeterminate west should have caught his imagination in the days of his eagle editorship america's main achievements had been performed in the spirit and by the methods of the pioneer a spirit which had been recently stimulated by the opening up of the regions from the mississippi to the pacific and whitman was the prophet as later he was to be the poet of the pioneer o oh, you youths western youths so impatient full of action full of manly pride and friendship plain i see you western youths see you tramping with the foremost pioneers o oh, pioneers have the elder races halted do they droop and end their lesson wearied there beyond the seas we take up the task eternal and the burden and the lesson pioneers o oh, pioneers in this west without a past democracy might achieve a life suitable to its nature when two years later the mania for owning things as whitman called it lured thousands of adventurous or disgruntled easterners to take ship or caravan for the california eldorado he remained untempted content to enjoy the newest national enterprise in his fancy alone in the west he pictured the average man in his true glory radical true far-scoped and thorough-going democracy may expect great things from the west he announced from his editorial tripod the hardy denizens of those regions where common wants and the cheapness of the land level conventionalism that poison to the democratic vitality begin at the roots of things at first principles and scorn the doctrines founded on mere precedent and imitation there is something refreshing even in the extremes the faults of western character neither need the political or social fabric expect half as much harm from those untutored impulses as from the staled and artificialized influence which enters too much into politics and amid richer not really richer either and older settled sections whitman was unable to see that the world being settled and largely controlled from settled communities mere pioneering can in itself neither test nor establish a social or governmental experiment the old must be regenerated not simply escaped in a spirit of youthful protest yet whitman's instinctive faith in the west not only was typical of the youth of his generation but was a prophetic symbol of our history probably he would not have stated it so but the democratic form of government was adopted in america as the only possible solution the solution by compromise of the conflicts between various colonial cultures and ambitions it was then even less than now a melting-pot from which emerged average americans nor did it really wish to be it was rather a communal experiment in living together successful in proportion as it safeguarded the integrity of each as well as the rights of all but in what section was that ideal to be so well realized as in the great western region peopled by all sections yet detached from the cultural past of all there if anywhere the paradox of american colonization duplicated in the many paradoxes of whitman's ancestry and character might be resolved through an idealization whose crude expression was found in pioneering lincoln the liberator the conciliator came by no accident from that west 
yet there would be inaccuracy in inferring that whitman desired a return to nature only as an escape from the complexities and refinements of civilization he wanted the natural in civilization and nothing could seem natural to him which repressed man's wholesome emotions or retarded their growth government only meddled and muddled when it tried to make a people happy they must do that for themselves and this they could not do if too conscious of other laws than those of their own nature for this reason whitman following emerson rather than longfellow declared for a thoroughly indigenous art and literature this could be accomplished he thought without prejudice to our traditional hospitality toward the trade and the peoples of the old world the great tide of immigration from germany and ireland if encouraged not only would extend the blessings of the chosen nation to peoples less fortunate but would have the practical advantage of settling our immense domain with the very class who would most appreciate those blessings and do most to perpetuate them the narrow and selfish nativists the one hundred per cent americans of that day like the know nothings and the ku klux klan of later periods were in spirit not americans at all as he understood the term on the shores of europe were panting multitudes who sicken with nakedness and starvation they weep they curse life they die partly through the excess of population and partly through the grossly partial nature of the laws and the distribution of property half the aggregate number of the natives of the old world live in squalor want and misery some seasons famine stalks through whole provinces and thousands are struck down ere the new moon fills her crescent then emaciated corpses strew the fields and the groans of pale children are heard on the wayside and savage murders are committed to get the means of life for dying women and infants amid the cities too those great cities which many of our people would like to emulate in grandeur poverty stalks unchecked dragging by the hand his brother crime there is too much mankind and too little earth and then look here at america stretching between the allegheny mountains and the pacific ocean are millions on millions of uncultivated acres of land long rolling prairies interminable savannas where the fat earth is covered with grass reaching to a height unknown in our less prolific north forests amid whose boughs nothing but silence reigns and the birds are not shy through fear of humankind rich openings by the side of rivers trees and verdure making from year to year their heavy deposits on the remains of the trees and verdure that decayed before them the mind becomes almost lost in tracing in imagination those hidden and boundless tracts of our territory where rolls the oregon and hears no sound save its own dashing we perhaps wonder what can be the intention of the creator in leaving for so long a time such capacities for human existence and comfort undeveloped we lose ourselves in the anticipation of what may be seen there in future times the flourishing cities the happy family homes the stately edifices of public improvement the sights and sounds of national prosperity how then can any man with a heart in his breast begrudge the coming of europe's needy ones to be the plentiful storehouse of the new world but they were not to transplant in america the manners and customs of their native lands they were to become americans nor were those manners and customs reminiscent of feudalism and aristocracy any longer to be imported by our publishers and imitative provincial writers scott was great reading for a boy but after all scott was a bourbon a tory and a high church and state man a poor guide for the children of democracy even shakespeare incomparable analyst of the human heart was later to come under this indictment for his page had caught its purple glamour from those who wore the purple not from the common man on whose run romantic shoulders rested the throne of the king but dickens now beginning to rival the earlier popularity of scott there was a man for us when four years before the washington globe had attacked dickens as a vulgarian the young whitman then a compositor on the brother jonathan reading the stories of boz as fast as they were pirated in america had chivalrously come to the defence of dickens and the dickensian literature and this in the name of democracy 
a democratic writer i take it is one of the tendency of whose pages is to destroy those old landmarks which pride and fashion have set up making impassable distinctions between the brethren of the great family to render in their deformity before us the tyranny of partial laws to show us the partial workings of the thousand distortions engrafted by custom upon our notions of what justice is to make us love our fellow-creatures and own that although social distinctions place others far higher or far lower than we yet are human beings alike as links of the same chain and one whose lines are imbued from preface to finis with that philosophy which teaches to pull down the high and bring up the low i consider mr dickens to be a democratic writer indeed the enthusiastic young american had been so caught by dickens theatric method of catering to the popular taste for a sentimental extravagance that he never quite outgrew the tendency to mix propaganda with art this was painfully apparent in franklin evans the temperance novelette which he wrote in unsuccessful imitation of his english favourite one should not suppose however that whitman's mind was closed to the literature of the old world any more than to classical writings with which he was familiar for the beautiful creations of the great intellects of europe for the sweetness of majesty of shakespeare goethe and some of the italian poets the fiery breath of byron the fascinating melancholy of rousseau the elegance and candour of hume and gibbon and much more besides we of the western world bring our tribute and respect presumptuous and vain would be would it be for us to decry their glorious merits nevertheless every age and every nation must clothe itself in literature of its own and it was high time he felt for american writers to begin the creation of native fashions whitman's book review seldom praised mere sentimentality but he enjoyed the gentler writers lamb and isaac walton he admired their placidity their way of taking literature as a personal conversation with individual readers clearness he demanded even carlyle was not to be praised for his turgidity but in spite of it miss bremer's stories of domestic life were then finding hosts of readers among the subscribers to the then popular but effeminate american annuals avoiding the affected sentimentality of bulwer and the verbosity of g p r james they were full of interest for the editor of the eagle the best books the whole range of romance writing can furnish he declared they glorified the potent mild virtues charity forbearance love especially the love of a good gentle mother such as whitman himself adored with a sort of mariolatry and ruskin steeped though he was in the art and culture of the old world showed what might be accomplished when a man of the upper classes obeyed in his writings the code of intellectual chivalry noblesse oblige relating art to life aesthetics to the moral groundwork of character he looked forward to an age less stilted insincere and superficial than his own and whitman could respond to such enthusiasm and high-toned sincerity has it too belonged with the torch-bearers for once a history of the french revolution went to the bottom of the matter and exposed the cataclysm for what it was a noble grand work the eagle exclaimed a democratic work it is a wholesome book for the young fresh life of our republic we hear of the horrors of the french revolution as if mere blotches on the skin an unsightly eruption athwart the face of a man were more horrible than the long dreary deadness the lethargy and decay of the vital organs within while the blood should stagnate in the veins and million nerves were forbidden their power and function we too dread the horrors of the sword of violence of bloodshed in a maddened people but we would rather the this moment over every kingdom on the continent of europe that the people should rise and enact the same prodigious destruction as those of the french revolution could they thus root out the kingcraft and priestcraft which are annually dwindling down humanity there to a lower and lower average an appalling prospect ahead for any one who thinks ahead prophetic words those though uttered in an obscure american print for within the year france would be in the throes of another revolution and following her example Kosuth in hungary and garibaldi in italy would voice the aspirations of their oppressed peoples for autonomy and democracy while germany and austria would make similarly vigorous though short-lived efforts for freedom then the young democrat's heart would throb in that dawn however false a dawn to be alive yes hazlitt had had the right attitude toward the french revolution and carlyle had been right too in his masterly diagnosis of the hidden causes of that eruption when carlyle died in eighteen eighty one whitman declared that rugged mountainous volcanic 
he was himself more a french revolution than any of his volumes his keen mind had detected what a feeded gasbag much of modern radicalism is but then his great heart demanded reform demanded change often at terrible odds with his scornful brain in time whitman was to be enabled to escape the carlylean despair through a sole sight of that divine clue and unseen thread which holds the whole congeries of things all history all time and all events however trivial however momentous like a leashed dog in the hand of a hunter but meanwhile he might learn something from the scotchman's honest satire and might discover the shortcomings of democracy as carlyle had exposed those of feudalism he might benefit also by study of carlyle's individual dynamic style when he first encountered that style in reviewing the heroes and hero worship for the eagle he was as unprepared as other readers for the galvanic shock it gave him no great writer achieves anything worthy of him he asserted defensively by merely inventing a new style style in writing is much as dress in society sensible people will conform to the prevailing mode and it is not of infinite importance anyhow and can always be so varied as to fit one's peculiar way convenience or circumstance yet even in dress whitman was soon to be as unconventional as carlyle ever was in language once he got used to the carlyle's style whitman found it strangely agreeable and for one who would stand out from the general run of writers to lift up his voice in the barbaric yawp of prophecy a method strangely effective and dramatic goethe was another great writer to whom the young whitman responded gladly when the latter read the dichtung at Warheit in park godwin's translation he was amazed at the discovery of what a history of the soul and body's growth might be the simple easy truthful narrative of the existence and experience of a man of genius how his mind unfolded in his earliest years the impressions things made upon him how and when the religious sentiment dawned upon him what he thought of god before he was inoculated with books ideas the development of his soul when he first loved the way circumstances imbued his nature and did him good or worked him ill with all the long train of occurrences adventures mental processes exercises within and trials without which go to make up the man for character is the man after all what a road-map that sentence is of the life he himself was to live the book he was to write such a hint as to how direct intimate personal and vital the autobiography of a poet might be was sufficient to cause goethe to remain through whitman's life as the supreme example of personal identity when whitman turned to american books he found a number of authors to give him hope irving he accepted for his charm of style and his sentiment longfellow he quoted most often whose simple lyrics of domestic sentiment and whose reverential translation of the european culture whitman luxuriated in like the child of his age that he was while the harvard poet's tendency to celebrate american traditions was he thought a step in the right direction melville's earlier romances he found most readable but he would have had to wait four years more for moby dick to blend in fiction as he himself was to blend in verse mystic romance with accurate realism bryant he always ranked high and he liked personally but emerson in the heroic aspirations of his free thought taught him most of all end of section two section three of whitman and interpretation in narrative by emory holloway this librivox recording is in the public domain book one a journalist in brooklyn part two turning over the pages of the new york exchanges one day whitman noticed a highly spiced review of a performance by the keens which as he chanced to know had for some reason not come off at all at once his lance was levelled most of the criticisms in the metropolitan press he told his readers are written before the plays are played and paid for by the theatre or other parties of those which are not so paid for the majority are the fruits of solicitation favouritism and so on in the midst of all that stale and unwholesome utterance the speaking of a single paragraph of unbiased truth falls like an alarming and terrible thing he himself expected and had long 
accepted free tickets or passes to public performances which he attended in his capacity as editor but he would have the donors know that his freedom of opinion was not to be bribed by such means he loved the theatre too well the drama of this country can be the mouthpiece of freedom refinement liberal philanthropy beautiful love for all our brethren polished manners and an elevated good taste it can wield potent sway to destroy any attempts at despotism it can attack and hold up to scorn bigotry fashionable affectation avarice and all unmanly follies youth may be warned by its fictitious portraits of the evil of unbridled passions wives and husbands may see perhaps for the first time in their lives a long-needed lesson of the absurdity of contentious tempers and of those small but painful disputes that in bitter domestic life contrasted with the pleasant excellence of a forbearing forgiving and affectionate spirit the son or daughter just entering the door of dissipation may get timely view of that inward rottenness which is concealed in such an outside of splendour all every age and every condition in life may with profit visit a well-regulated dramatic establishment and go away better than when they came but he added for this the whole method of theatricals as at present pursued in new york needs first to be overthrown its weakness lay in its imitation affectation insincerity whitman himself had acted sundry second parts in an amateur dramatic company up on broadway and though he did not excel as an actor he came to value highly the performer who could feel his role that was what gave macready his power even when silent upon the stage it was what he admired in mrs siddons in keen and in charlotte cushman so with booth and richard or the merchant of venice and edwin forrest in payne's brutus at the bowery it was the bowery's insistence upon this sincerity in its actors that had led whitman some years previous to frequent it rather than the more select park theatre opposite the astor house on broadway five or six years before his connection with the eagle the bowery plays had become to the drama what the dime novel was to standard fiction cheap vulgar melodramatic but in the days when forrest and booth had played there and the last days of pompey mazeppa the lion doomed and cooper's wept of the wish ton wish held the boards it was full of american character unrestrained by the growing ambition to ape the english what a cross-section of american life in the two thousand persons who crowded it from pit to gallery he could recall and describe it half a century later the audience mainly of alert well-dressed full-blooded young or middle-aged men the best average of american-born mechanics the emotional nature of the whole mass aroused by the power and magnetism of as mighty mimes as ever trod the stage the whole crowded auditorium and what seethed in it and flushed from its faces and eyes to me as much a part of the show as any bursting forth in one of those long kept-up tempers of hand-clapping peculiar to the bowery no dainty kid-glove business but electric force and muscle from perhaps two thousand full sinewed men the inimitable and chromatic tempest of one of those ovations to edwin forrest welcoming him back after an absence comes up to me at this moment i can yet remember for i always scanned an audience as rigidly as a play the faces of the leading authors poets editors of those times fenimore cooper bryant paulding irving charles king watson webb n p willis hoffman halleck mumford morris leggett l g clark r a locke and others occasionally peering from the first tier boxes and even the great national eminences presidents adams jackson van buren and tyler all made short visits there on their eastern tours not but what there was more or less rankness in the crowd even then for types of sectional new york those days the streets east of the bowery that intersect division grand and up to third avenue types that never found their dickens or hogarth or balzac and have passed away unportraitured the young shipbuilders cartmen butchers firemen the old-time soap-lock or exaggerated mose or sexy of chanfrau's plays they too were always to be seen in these audiences racy of the east river and the dry dock 
slang wit occasional shirt-sleeves and a picturesque freedom of looks and manners with a rude good nature and restless movement were generally noticeable yet there never were audiences that paid a good actor or an interesting play the complement of more sustained attention or quicker rapport but if the manager attempted bombast and fustian he might expect to hear from these children of nature in the pit thinking of these great days in which the drama had spoken to the heart whitman was oppressed by the bills the theatres offered in eighteen forty six to eighteen forty seven yankee hill was filling the house with his exaggerated burlesques of new england rustics at the chatham the chambers street opera house was presenting high-class italian music but the olympic was altogether popular while at the park one got only english managers english actors and english plays already a group of younger men writers and artists were voicing a demand for something native and natural after all whitman patriotically assured his public anything appealing to the national heart of the people as to the peculiar and favored children of freedom as to a new race with a character separate from the kingdoms of other countries would meet with a ready response and strike at once the heart of all true men who love america their native or chosen land but a moses was needed if this chosen people were to escape from their inferiority complex a man of courage and genius and unselfish public spirit such a man did not instantly arise at the summons of the brooklyn eagle but the song is to the singer and comes back most to him the teaching is to the teacher and comes back most to him the love is to the lover and comes back most to him the gift is to the giver and comes back most to him it cannot fail the oration is to the orator the acting is to the actor and actress not to the audience and no man understands any greatness or goodness but his own or the indication of his own so the young editor's aspiration for a nobler drama for his country came back most to him though in a form of art which was to bear the impress of many another aspiration as well his desire for a new music for example from youth whitman had heard good music in franklin evans he had decried the use of sirens in saloons as an unfair enticement to drink but when he had learned to moderate his glass he went freely and with enjoyment to hear the cheneys and the hutchinsons in niblo's garden and such places he was pleased with their rustic simplicity their freedom from dancing school bows hand kissing and the patent leather curled haired chaponicadum style he hoped that american singers might always sing without affectation the simple melodies of the heart for his party would be uncomfortable in a civilization beset by so many complex fears so many refined inhibitions such a hothouse culture that it must needs protect itself by a conventionalized art it was he thought really unnecessary to admit the fact that america was as old as england in her life if not in her institutions let her rather continue to claim the prerogatives and the privileges of youth and yet he knew that age or nationality has little to do with really great art for the italian opera when sung by an alboni a mario or badi ali or a bettini he always had words of gratitude and praise the impersonal technical perfection which reached its culmination in the popular coliatura singing of jenny lind whom he heard at castle garden in eighteen fifty was what left him cold just as the writers of nineteenth-century lyrics singers who were in no sense answerers left him disgusted by their low ambition and their unheroic quest for beauty our young editor must not be imagined however as always seriously employed with the politics and culture of his day he was not incapable of levity of a sort he relished upon as much as later columnists do what do you think sir reader when we tell you that three ladies slippers were pulled off and bestowed upon us this morning we have em now in a glass of water when he did not feel disposed to write he was as frank about it as emerson was concerning his hatred of ritualistic prayers the brooklyn eagle begs leave to state that this is one of the dullest days it has ever experienced a flat turgidity seems to pervade everything leaden clouds cover the heavens the air is bitter and raw there ain't any news and b e is not i the vein for knitting editorials at all but on sunny days summer or winter he would go abroad not only in quest of news but to preserve the magnificent health which meant much more to whitman than making money or even holding his job 
let us enjoy life a little he would say to his readers has god made this beautiful earth the sun to shine all the sweet influences of nature to operate and planted a man a wish for their delights and all for nothing let us go forth a while and get better air in our lungs he was not much of an athlete being as he said more a floater than a swimmer but he enjoyed watching clerks and apprentices at a game of baseball for his own part nothing pleased him more than to climb up to the driver's box of one husted and kendall's east brooklyn omnibuses to ride as far as they went and then to strike off a foot across fields and into the woods to forget the din of babel and to renew his sense of personal identity with creation sometimes william cullen bryant accompanied him talking of his many european travels on other days whitman would go in the opposite direction reaching the door of the eagle office he would see as often as not crowds of men and women rushing then as now lest they miss a ferry-boat but whitman never hurried posterity surely cannot attach anything of the dignified or august he philosophized to a people who run after steamboats with hats flying off and skirts flying behind think of any of the roman senators or the worthies of greece in such a predicament and he was thinking of them thinking that america's contribution to history should be comparable to that of greece and rome he tried to live in the philosophic spirit of socrates of epictetus we like the ancient and manly beard he confessed the concomitant of the apostles of the men of rome of petrarch and tasso and shakespeare like bryant he could not bring himself to shave a little later he was to become indolent in sartorial matters letting his beard grow into a bush as if willing that since he was a child of nature nature should do as she would with his personal appearance possibly there was also a desire to conceal the sensuous lips which so contradicted the direct glance of his eye and the obstinate purposefulness of his nose or was it to be the badge of the commoner like the open-throated shirt he would soon be affecting there are eminent scientists who deny sex to be fundamental in nature tracing sexual variation to a preponderance of masculine or feminine cells in the individual in whitman if we may borrow a figure from science there seemed to be as he was to discover no great preponderance of masculine cells did the beard serve as a silent necessary assertion of his masculinity whitman has meanwhile probably missed his very but he will catch the next one and he is content to him the interest of a journey never lay in getting somewhere though he had the freedom of the boat and moved on terms of comradeship among all who ran it his favourite occupation was to stand at the side of the vessel lost in poetic contemplation he was about his muse's business though it would be another ten years before his mouth would be unstopped so that he could give musical utterance to the thoughts that filled him now crowds of men and women attired in the usual costumes how curious you are to me on the ferry-boats the hundreds and hundreds that cross returning home are more curious to me than you suppose and you that shall cross from shore to shore years hence are more to me and more in my meditation than you might suppose the impalpable sustenance of me from all things at all hours of the day the simple compact well-joined scheme myself disintegrated every one disintegrated yet part of the scheme the similitudes of the past and those of the future the glories strung like beads on my smallest sights and hearings on the walk in the street and the passage over the river the current rushing so swiftly and swimming with me far away the others that are to follow me the ties between me and them the certainty of others the life love sight hearing of others others will enter the gates of the ferry and cross from shore to shore others will watch the run of the flood tide others will see the shipping of manhattan north and west and the heights of brooklyn to the south and east others will see the islands large and small fifty years hence others will see them as they cross the sun half an hour high hundred years hence or ever so many hundred years hence others will see them will enjoy the sunset the pouring in of the flood tide the falling back of the ebb tide it avails not time nor place distance avails not i am with you men and women of a generation or ever so many generations hence just as you feel when you look on the river and the sky so i felt just as any of you is one of a living crowd i was one of a crowd just as you are refreshed by the gladness of the river and the bright flow i was refreshed 
just as you stand and lean on the rail yet hurry with the swift current i stood yet was hurried just as you look on the numberless masts of ships and the thick stemmed pipes of steamboats i looked these and all else were to me the same as they are to you i loved well those cities loved well the stately and rapid river the men and women i saw were all near to me others the same others who looked back on me because i looked forward to them the time will come though i stop here to-day and to-night what is it then between us what is the count of the scores or hundreds of years between us going ashore when the ferry touched at fulton street new york whitman had various opportunities for the sort of experiences he most enjoyed and on various days he embraced them all he might stroll up to plum's famous photograph gallery and spend hours looking at the dog-ear types of the noted men and women of the day seeking some hint of their lives in their faces as on the streets he was continually doing or he might go to hear a concert by de Mayer at the tabernacle and be haunted by it for a month he took great interest also in the phrenological cabinet believing phrenology to be a real science he was eager to welcome assistance from science any science in his effort to pierce the conventional surface of life that he might discover its inner spirit when fowler the phrenologist read the bumps on his head whitman was not displeased with the result was not the skill of the phrenologist attested by his affirmation of what whitman knew to be facts as when he rated very high the young man's caution intuition firmness self-esteem benevolence destructiveness and love of good living and rated no less high those twin expressions of the sex instinct amativeness and adhesiveness otherwise disposed whitman might stroll to the well-shaded battery to watch the children at play meditating meanwhile a sentimental lyric upon the theme one day near castle garden he saw men in diving suits racing on the bottom of the river sometimes he would get a whitehall boatman to row him over to governor's island to have a look at the awkward young men being whipped into shape as stevenson's california regiment later to play so large a part in the acquisition of that far territory for the government of anglo-saxons climbing the winding stairs in the turret of the old fort he would then look out upon a scene he loved far far up stretched the rolling hudson with its elevated banks dressed in green and the white houses of hoboken and jersey city and the innumerable river craft coming and crossing and going on its capacious breast to the southwest lay the sleepy-looking hills of staten island their sides dotted with dwellings and with not a flaw in the varied spread of their gracefulness or every side was the moving panorama of vessels and flapping waves there too was the great metropolis to the northeast its perpetual hum coming indistinctly to the ear far above its loftiest roofs towered the proud spire of old trinity and over the splendid verdure of the battery trees rose the oval cupola of the exchange while a thick forest of masts hid the shores of the right altogether from the eye nor must we forget our own beautiful brooklyn with its saucy browed heights studding out on the river and proffering their claims for admiration to the sight of everybody in the neighbourhood and over those old battlements the ocean wind sweeps incessantly and it was a huge joy to breathe such stuff after coming from the streets and slushed gutters of the city at times whitman would flee from the city altogether taking train to the newly accessible eastern end of long island always dear to him from association with his boyhood wanderings and the later rustifications of his manhood he shared with his age a fondness for melancholy and now and then he would take the stage for greenwood cemetery then miles out of town and spend the late afternoon pondering on life and death on fame and the vicissitudes of that genius which is to madness so near alive but he was not always so disposed to solitude though he was always given to contemplation one hot july day he was invited as a member of the press to join a party arranged by the contractors of the new city hall now borough hall some sixty men drove off in four large six-horse stages for coney island to enjoy an outing and a clam bake there a dance on the hard sand and then a splash and souse in the cool water here whitman was thoroughly at home in the form of ocean wave the poet of nature might hug her to his bosom with more tangible satisfaction than the eye could know in caressing the sunset or the cheek when bared to the salutation of the breeze 
the clams were roasted in their own broth indian style in beds covered with brush and chips after the repast good champagne was passed from lip to lip and good fellowship with it toasts were drunk whitman taking to himself a share of credit for that which congressman henry murphy proposed to the local press but best of all was the return to brooklyn in the cool of the evening first activity giving rein to the body and the social instincts then the quiet meditations of the soul that memories might be placed in, in amber so after his custom the young poet climbed to the high seat beside the driver his eyes upon the rising stars his nostrils happy with the smell of new-mown hay but whitman observed the life of brooklyn which went on indoors as well like most self-educated men he was always interested in schools he had himself spent several years in the profession of teaching and even as editor and later as poet he was always less a historian less a critic than a teacher he argued for free seminaries he urged that formal instruction be supplanted by a method addressed to the reason and the individual reactions of the pupil something in his nature compelled him to cry out against the use of the rod in his own schoolroom he had forsworn it and established himself on a basis of friendly personal helpfulness to his students he had once written a melodramatic story for the democratic review about a death from flogging and had been pleased to see it reprinted again and again with horace mann and emerson and thoreau he took advanced ground in favor of moral suasion in the government of men though he was not yet ready to deprive nations of the sword in flogging he saw a certain human indignity and its use in the navy he denounced as roundly as did dana and melville nor should such disciplinary methods be condoned even in the prison he himself had seen what sing sing was like and the mount auburn state prison for women he knew some of the inmates and he did not believe the prison made them better the reformatory work of the kind-hearted mrs e w farnham at the latter institution similar to that of mrs fry at newgate or that of thomas mott obsborne at sing sing in recent years he applauded whitman was as law-abiding as most men and yet feeling that real justice should look upon the responsible impulse rather than its accidental expression he knew all men to be potential criminals you felons on trial in courts you convicts in prison cells you sentenced assassins chained and handcuffed with iron who am i too that i am not on trial or in prison me ruthless and devilish as any that my wrists are not chained with iron or my ankles with iron in all his life whitman was in court but once and that was rather a joke while fishing in a pond near babylon one day not far from his father's farm he was continually annoyed by a mischievous boy determined to have his fun if not at the expense of the fish then at whitman's finally exasperated the latter coaxed the lad to row near in his boat and then administered a sound thrashing with his rod the culprit's father had walt arrested entrusting the prosecution of the case in the justices court to general nicholas udall sure of himself whitman undertook his own defence he admitted the thrashing but excused it on the ground that he was defending the vested rights of fishermen the jury whose foreman was a hard-headed farmer with a yorkshire brogue returned almost immediately have you arrived at a verdict asked the justice we have your honour what is the verdict we find he didn't it him half a hard enough despite the repeated protests on the part of the justice that the form of the verdict was irregular that verdict stood as for capital punishment whitman could tolerate the idea no more than could alden spooner or horace greeley or bryant or whittier and he skilfully argued the case largely on sentimental grounds towards the other classes of unfortunates the editor of the eagle was equally sympathetic working women enslaved in the sweatshops and earning often as little as fifty cents a week appealed not in vain to the championship of his pen nor did he neglect the institution of negro slavery so inimical to his theories of liberty and equality while he recognized the strength of the historical and constitutional arguments advanced by calhoun he nevertheless believed like washington and jefferson that even in the south human bondage would have to go of course the horrors of the middle passage should be stopped even in the brazilian trade though it might take high-manded measures on the part of british and american men of war to do it he published a very realistic description of these horrors as one of his first eagle editorials but he had little more to say on the subject till the very end of the year 
meanwhile he was watching with varying emotions the war with mexico begun in april the result of which was to precipitate national questions concerning slavery which would test both him and the union itself war often works the very mischief with a poet in reveals latent heroisms it is true it opens new vistas it effectively displays the national spirit against the lurid background of an enemy's villainy and it makes him peculiarly conscious of being present at one of the birth throes of history all this appeals through his imagination to the patriotism the aspirations the generosity of the poet heart but being better equipped as an advocate then as a judge whitman did not realize how blindly partisan how stupidly patriotic how imperialistic the war psychology was making him greeley was but eight years his senior yet he was much more mature and in using the new york tribune a whig organ to rally a fearless opposition to the selfish and partisan machinations of president polk he might have studied whitman's own judgment had the latter been able to believe there was any democracy save in the democratic party james russell lowell too under the influence of ab abolitionist wife had no illusions as to the real purpose of this defensive war into the heart of a weaker nation the satirical wit of his hard-headed hosea biglow was making a reputation for his creator but whitman was as unlikely to learn wisdom from an abolitionist as from a whig his faith in the average man had as yet no universal application it applied only to america and the america he knew where the average man was an anglo-saxon freeholder dwelling in the holy land of democracy he felt some sympathy for the mexican people but he was not hopeful concerning their future unless they should come under the protecting wing of the american eagle nor had he forgotten the texan war of independence wars of autonomy had always appealed to his love of freedom and his prejudice against the mexicans had been deepened by their gratuitous cruelties the month before the mexican war began whitman had chanced to read in blackwood's an excerpt translated from a campaign in texas this was the autobiographical story of a young german one von ehrenberg one of the three or four of fannin's men to escape from the massacre at goliad the narrative impressed him so strongly that he ran a column of extracts in the eagle and years later he had no difficulty in retelling the experience in the first person as one of the incidents in his imaginative history fit to be recorded side by side with episodes in his personal life the mexican war therefore did not provoke in him any great conflict of feeling as for instance a civil war might do when general taylor routed arista at resaca de la palma whitman exulted he was sensitive to the long-lived american superstition that might proves our right and that an unbroken record of successful wars must in some way be due to the approval of the democratic lord of hosts he was in a mood to declare war at once without that delay which was being counselled by calhoun and the abolitionists alike with him it was a war of revenge at least at the beginning who has read the sickening story of those brutal wholesale murders so useless for any purpose except gratifying the cowardly appetite of a nation of bravos willing to shoot down men by the hundred in cold blood without panting for the day when the prayer of that blood should be listened to when the vengeance of a retributive god should be meted out to those who so ruthlessly and needlessly slaughtered his image that day has arrived let our arms now be carried with a spirit which shall teach the world that while we are not forward for a quarrel america knows how to crush as well as how to expand but young patriot did not see that america was crushing only to expand and that editors like himself were unwittingly playing the game of the adroit politician james polk only the preceding year while writing for the brooklyn star whitman had expostulated eloquently against the jingoes who were trying to bring on a war with england over the oregon boundary dispute a situation in which there was almost an equal casus belli but less prejudice accepting every move of the democratic president without a question save when he demoted the popular hero of buena vista for party reasons whitman was arguing a year before the war was won that the annexation of a large part of mexico was a foregone conclusion 
he salved his democratic conscience so far as mexican autonomy was concerned by believing that the mexican people at least those living in yucatan were themselves eager for annexation in the presumptuous manner of a twentieth century culture he argued nor is it the much condemned lust of power that makes the heart respond to the idea of these new acquisitions such greediness might very properly be the motive of widening a less liberal form of government but such greediness is not ours we pant to see our country and its rule far-reaching he could imagine canada and alaska as parts of our future empire only inasmuch as it will take off the shackles that prevent men that even chance of being happy and good as most governments are now constituted that the tendency is very much the other way we have no ambition for the mere physical grandeur of this republic such grandeur is idle and deceptive enough or at least it is only desirable as an aid to reach the truer good the good of the whole people but the satisfaction afforded such a man as whitman by the indulgence of the belligerent spirit even when it masqueraded as an angel of light were of necessity soon exhausted not till the next year did the magnetic telegraph reach even as far as new orleans so that the news of a campaign three weeks away lost some of its glory in transmission moreover the richard harding davis type of war correspondent was as yet unknown while the publicity director was the invention of later statesmen and men of affairs then too whitman embraced in his nature many of the conflicting traditions of his country and pacifism was such a tradition as hosea biglow's astounding popularity was conclusively proving when news arrived that general taylor had successfully stormed monterey with an army half the size of that defending the city the eagle expressed the hope that the government of the united states will bow sufficiently to that public opinion which over the whole civilized world is arrayed against war except on an extreme contingency as to leave no way untried to stop this contest of ours with mexico and allow the united states to pursue its peaceful conquests which are far grander more blessed and more enduring than any conquests of force but the war did not stop and whitman had to console himself with the belief that the figures of our losses had been exaggerated that this was as wars went a relatively bloodless conflict that in view of the fact that the population of the invaded country fraternized and traded with our soldiers one could hardly call it a war at all of course he could not then know that in the peace negotiations the mexican government would present enormous claims for damages done to the property of this civilian population by these same fraternizing soldiers but in the due time the young sentimentalist would have an opportunity to learn at close range what a war really is then he would cry god damn all wars by january eighteen forty seven he had had enough declaring that he had upheld the president and the army from the start in a just cause he insisted nevertheless that the time had arrived when all citizens should speak candidly and firmly on this subject of the mexican war let it go no further enough has been done to revenge our offended honor the mexicans have been punished enough but the martial imp would not retreat to his bottle at the command of a young man in brooklyn no nor that of soldiers and diplomats and the fall of eighteen forty seven found whitman still asking without hope of an answer when will the war be ended he then advised that an energetic push be made with a large army and have it done with not that he would accept peace at any price the peace without victory being suggested by the aged albert gallatin he would not annex the whole of mexico to be sure but americans should not forget that after all they were the conquerors and that the war had been expensive moreover their manifest destiny pointed to the southwest but that destiny was more trouble than the eagle could have foreseen in that distant land were being planted the seeds of civil war many hands were quick to prevent it webster and greeley and lincoln and bryant and most of the whigs and all of the abolitionists nevertheless the seeds fell and grew like dragon's teeth by december eighteen forty six whitman perhaps with the wilmot proviso in mind but certainly not influenced by the example of any other editor had come out courageously for free soil if there are any states to be formed out of a territory lately annexed or to be annexed by any means to the united states let the democratic members of congress and whigs too if they like plant themselves quietly without bluster but fixedly and without compromise on the requirement that slavery be prohibited in them for ever we wish we could have a universal straightforward setting down of feet on this thing in the democratic party we must 
other papers throughout the north supported the proviso as did the state legislature in the lower house of congress but it was sent to the senate only on the day of adjournment and no final action was taken during the recess of congress the battle had to be fought out in the press whitman addressed his arguments to his own party and to the south no less than to the free workingmen and taxpayers of the north who he averred supplied four-fifths of the soldiers in the conquering armies in mexico he cited the words of washington and jefferson he undertook to expose the sophistries of calhoun he drew a vivid picture of new states in which the pioneer stock from the democratic and individualistic north would meet the degrading and hopeless competition of slave labor his most passionate plea naturally was addressed to the middle-class working man of the free states and this it is which must induce the working men of the north east and west to come up to a man in defence of their rights their honour and that heritage of getting bread by the sweat of the brow which we must leave to our children let them utter forth then in tones as massive as becomes their stupendous cause that their calling shall not be sunk to the miserable level of what is little above brutishness sunk to be like owned goods and driven cattle we call upon every mechanic of the north east and west upon the carpenter in his rolled-up sleeves the mason with his trowel the stone-cutter with his brawny chest the blacksmith with his sooty face the brown-fisted shipbuilder whose clinking strokes rattle so merrily in our dockyards upon shoemakers and cartmen and drivers and paviors and porters and millwrights and furriers and rope-makers and butchers and machinists and tinmen and tailors and hatters and coach and cabinet-makers upon the honest sawyer and mortar mixer too whose sinews are their own and every hard-working man to speak in a voice whose reverberations shall tell to all quarters that the working men of the free united states and their business are not willing to be put on the level of negro slaves in territory which if got at all must be got by taxes sifted eventually through upon them and by their hard work and blood but most of all we call upon the farmers the workers of the land that prolific brood of brown-faced fathers and sons who swarm over the free states and form the bulwark of our republic mightier than walls or armies the democratic state convention sidestepped the issue of free soil as congress was to do and the party went down to defeat when the magnitude of the debacle was known whitman laid the blame squarely on those reactionaries who had steered the convention in a cowardly course he had worked in harmony with this organization for two years a year before he had been the local secretary but now isaac van and in the present chairman and a hunker or slave soiled democrat was displeased with the tendency of his editor if not precisely to bolt at least to let the party bolt away from him and when whitman in january eighteen forty with a few lines exposed the fallacy in the now famous letter of senator cass who with his eye on the presidential nomination had deserted the wilmot proviso with the suggestion that in the new territory the principle of local self-government should apply whitman the barn burner was clearly out of place editing a newspaper owned by a hunker conservative no doubt the sudden termination of his growing usefulness came as a blow to the editor rumor had it that there was not only a row but some violence in which the boot that had trod so many pavements is in easy-going freedom was responsible for the precipitate descent of an unnamed politician down the editorial stairs in any case walt had to go he who had looked so far ahead of for his country had not looked ahead for himself and by the last of the month he was free to find another job his first impulse of course was to fight and the radical democrats were with him there was talk of a free soil paper to be started as their organ in brooklyn with whitman at the home but nothing came of it at the time however the destiny that had undertaken the training of this national poet was preparing to teach him other lessons than that it is sweet and noble to die for one's country whitman was not a man to mope over the loss of a position as to his loss of income he had preached that the desire for money was morbid and as for the loss of his public he had always found some new paper to edit so he continued to enjoy his walks and his visits to the theatre one night as he was walking in the lobby of the broadway he met a southern gentleman evidently a man of means this was a mr mcclure who was to start an independent paper in new orleans in three weeks and was then in the north buying material and looking for an additional writer for his staff he had doubtless read in the 
new york papers of whitman's sacrifice for his principles and rather liked the frank and self-reliant bearing of the young man so they took a drink together and in a few minutes had struck a bargain whitman was paid two hundred dollars for travelling expenses and was to receive good pay when he should begin work on the new orleans crescent the first of march at last he would be able to see for himself the west of his dreams and the south for which he had a natural affinity End of section three. Section four of Whitman and Interpretation in Narrative by Emery Holloway. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book two A City of Romance. Part one whitman lost no time in starting south on friday february eleven two days after his impromptu bargain with mr mcclure he was on his way by rail to baltimore with him went his brother jefferson who was just half his own age he and walt were better chums than any of the others jeff had some imagination played well on the violin and adored walt mrs whitman doubtless loved these two of her sons best and perhaps it was her wish that jeff should go with his brother if the latter must try his fortune in so foreign a clime as louisiana should anything untoward happen to one the other would then be present to look after him and to keep her advised early on saturday morning they changed at baltimore to a railroad which running west for a hundred and seventy miles would convey them to cumberland nestling on the eastern side of the allegheny mountains they followed the watercourses and marvelled at cliffs and alpine summits such as they had never seen before brooklyn with its gentle and well conned hills was far behind them already they were in the land of romance the west they stopped twenty minutes for lunch at quaint harper's ferry with its houses squatting one above another on the hillside its name as yet unlinked with the tragic career of john brown no sooner had the cars stopped than discordant bells sounded in the ears of the passengers as they were furiously assailed by runners for the rival hotels when whitman paid for the two dinners he was happily surprised that it cost him but four bits at cumberland railroad civilization ceased giving way to the picturesque pennsylvania wagons as whitman noted in his diary the town has a peculiar character from its being the great rendezvous and landing-place of the immense pennsylvania wagons and the drovers from hundreds of miles west you may see tartar-looking groups of these wagons and their drivers in the open grounds about the horses being loosed and the whole having not a little the appearance of a caravan of the steppes hundreds and hundreds of these enormous vehicles with their arched roofs of white canvas wend their way into cumberland from all quarters during a busy season with goods to send on eastward and to take goods brought by the railroad they are in shape not a little like the chinese junk willoom exhibited at new york being built high at each end and scooping down in the waist with their teams of four and six horses they carry an almost incalculable amount of freight and if one should accidentally get in the road ruts before their formidable wheels they would perform the work of a juggernaut upon him in most effectual order the drivers of these vehicles and the drovers of cattle hogs horses etc in this section of land form a large slice of society they had arrived at sunset and soon they with seven other passengers having had their baggage weighed packed themselves into one of the four horse stage coaches which with relays of horses every ten miles would transport them in a night and a day of bone-breaking travel to wheeling where they might take steamer for new orleans stage coach travel is conducive to the study of character and whitman made use of his first opportunity to compare the americans he had known in new york with those from the pioneer west 
a satirical person he naively said could no doubt find an ample field for his powers in many of the manners and the ways of the west and so can he indeed in the highest circles of fashion but i fully believe that in a comparison of actual manliness and what the yankees call gumption the well-to-do citizens for i am not speaking so much of the country particularly the young men of new york philadelphia boston brooklyn and so on with all the advantages of compact neighborhood schools etc are not up to the men of the west among the latter probably attention is more turned to the realities of life and a habit formed of thinking for one's self in the city's frippery and artificial fashion are too much the ruling powers he was glad whenever the stage stopped in the middle of the night at a mountain inn jumping out upon the snow he would enter the long one-story house beneath the bare armed trees how weird the scene as the flickering light from the mighty soft coal fire fell upon the men who crowded about it clad with such odd diversity of raiment this said whitman is good enough for a painter to work on but he would have to forget imitation and do something in the american spirit to catch it there were some ten or twelve great strapping drovers before the huge fire the beams overhead were low and smoke dried i stepped to the further end of the long porch the view from the door was grand though vague even in the moonlight we had just descended a large and very steep hill and just off on one side of us was a precipice so of apparently hundreds of feet the silence of the grave spread over the solemn scene the mountains were covered in their white shrouds of snow and the towering trees looked black and threatening only the largest stars were visible and they glittered with a tenfold brightness one's heart at such times is irresistibly lifted to him of whom these august appearances are but the least emanation faith if i had an infidel to convert i would take him on the mountains of a clear and beautiful night when the stars are shining with dawn came breakfast at union town beyond the alleghanies but another weary day of travel would have to be endured if the stage before its passengers might relax in the staterooms of the packet steamer st cloud moored to her wharf at wheeling the next morning whitman was roused from his slumber only by the clanging of the bell at half-past six in making his toilet he missed the clear water of the hudson to while away the half-hour before breakfast he strolled about the commodious steamer which would be his abode for almost two weeks he was distinctly disappointed when he looked for the first time by daylight on the ohio it was muddy there is no romance in a mass of yellowish-brown liquid he said in disgust he had evidently expected something idyllic like the engraving in godey's lady's book however he was in rome and meant to accommodate himself to the custom of the country soon he was washing in and drinking that same water already his body was having to take account of conditions strange to his dutch upbringing and he was rather surprised to discover that he could adjust himself with so little trouble what an india-rubber principle there is after all in humanity commented the puritan within him to walt long accustomed to the parsimony of new york boarding-houses the bountiful meals which have always been a tradition on the river seemed enormous in quantity and excellent in quality when he had a chance to mail a letter home to his mother jeff wrote for breakfast we have coffee tea ham and eggs beefsteaks sausages hot cakes with plenty of good bread sugar etc for dinner roast beef dough mutton dough veal boiled ham roast turkey dough goose with pie and puddings and for supper everything that is good to eat but walt was not a little annoyed that when he had eaten four or five minutes he found every one else had bolted his meal and departed it was the incessant activity of the american spirit that he had deplored on the brooklyn ferry-boats cropping out here and with no possible excuse for there was nothing to do but to read cheap novels or to wait for a rare newspaper to be passed around or to smoke and talk the ladies in particular had a dull time of it spending listless hours in silence before the whitmans everything was new and romantic the st cloud was never on schedule for it could not be predicted how much freight would be taken on at each landing-place that depended on the clever little captain's luck in bargaining but he took on enough to fill a new york liner walt knew that and a conglomeration it was hundreds of barrels of pork lard and flour bags of coffee rolls of leather groceries dry goods hardware 
coops filled with live geese turkeys and fowls which made the steamer sound like a barnyard live hogs too were driven aboard and even a horse most of the country was uninteresting not yet having felt the axe and plough but the human types at the stopping places were worth looking at the numerous idlers boys old farmers and especially the tall strapping comely young men of whitman's own age so much freight had to be taken on and discharged at cincinnati that whitman had time to stroll about the queen city a bustling commercial town fit to compare with new york philadelphia and new orleans as an emporium of trade but the landing was muddy and the streets uncleaned as they approached the falls just below louisville the captain had to decide whether to waste many miles by taking the canal around the boiling place on the kentucky side or to shoot the rapids where the river drops twenty feet in three miles with the characteristic hardihood of the pioneers he determined to take the risk the bottom was studded with immense rocks and near the middle of the narrow channel there was barely room to pass between scylla and charybdis and then only by a skilful turn of the wheel as they passed the pilot found that one wheel would not work so that the steamer actually did graze each rock and scrape the bottom the passengers were none too easy as they paced the floor looking as they were about to be hung swiftly however they found their way to peaceful waters and to less agitated thoughts and so they came to cairo after a week on the ohio which poured its stream of mud far down into the father of waters everywhere at villages boys came down to the wharves to watch them go by or look down from their areas on the bluffs flowing south for a thousand miles the great mississippi taking tribute from half a dozen states seemed to whitman the very heart of the democratic empire of his dreams its physical appearance like the life on board ship and at the stopping places was now familiar to him and his notebook jotting ceased but the inner eye had its work to do and for this there was no time like the night whitman would sit on deck long after all unimaginative souls had retired to their staterooms and gaze at the shadowy shoreline at the stars and murky clouds overhead he wrote a poem the last he should compose for some time for now he was entering a life which more congenial to art and enjoyment than brooklyn had been which satisfied body and soul with its luxurious lassitude how solemn sweeping this dense black tide no friendly lights in the heavens o'er us a murky darkness on either side and kindred darkness all before us now drawn nearer the shelving rim weird like shadows suddenly rise shapes of mist and phantoms dim baffle the gazer's straining eyes river fiends with malignant faces wild and wide their arms are thrown as if to clutch in fatal embraces him who sails their realms upon then by the trick of our own swift motion straight tall giants an army vast rank by rank like the waves of ocean on the shore march stilly past how solemn the river a trailing pall which takes but never again gives back and moonless and starless the heavens arched wall responding an equal black o oh, tireless waters like life's quick dream onward and onward ever hurrying like death in this midnight hour you seem life in your chill drops speedily burying in the stanzas just quoted from the manuscript as whitman wrote it on board the st cloud the symbolism of nature is hackneyed and indefinite it expresses a vague feeling vaguely but long after when the experiences of that year were little more than memories the poet revised the poem for publication among his juvenilia dropping one rhyme in each quatrain and adding several suggestive stanzas these are the lines added tide of youth thus thickly planted while in the eddies onward you swim thus on the shore stands a phantom army lining forever the channel's rim steady helmsman you guide the immortal many a wreck is beneath you piled many a brave yet unwary sailor over these waters has been beguiled nor is it the storm of the scowling midnight cold or sickness or fire's dismay nor is it the reef or treacherous quicksand will peril you most on your twisted way but when there comes a voluptuous languor soft the sunshine silent the air bewitching your craft with safety and sweetness then young pilot of life beware as he approached new orleans whitman scarcely realized the strength of certain forces that were warring for the mastery within him 
even his patriotism though it had been put to more than one test had sometimes betrayed him as in the case of the mexican war to strenuous advocacy of a cause unworthy of the country he loved this was because he had allowed his desire to love and defend something outside himself to take counsel of conventional ideas on which he had been brought up rather than of independent convictions he was not critical of congenial ideas preferring to spend his energy in expressing them as individually as he might but it does not occur to a man particularly a young man to stress a cause whose rightness he takes for granted he is most militant when he fights a hidden foe an inarticulate protest within his own nature every poet must make terms with sex since so much poetry is an expression crude or sublimated of the sex instinct but what did this young poet know of sex when at twenty-one he had first made up his mind some day to do a significant book on human nature and government that which seemed to him most important was the tyranny of material things the american mania for acquiring money such an ambition allowed too little time for loafing and enjoying one's soul but of women he had declared that he would say nothing for the very sufficient reason that neither by experience nor observation had he learned anything about them as he sailed down the mississippi he was it would seem as innocent of sex as he was naive in thought not that he was indifferent to women writing his editorials in the eagle office he had often paused to admire the brooklyn bells on their way to the ferry they have those lithe graceful shapes such as the american women only have the delicately cut features and the intellectual cast of head ah woman the very sight of you is a mute prayer of peace without your refining presence the late sulky weather wouldn't be a beginning to the darkness that would spread over the earth but what if he should meet the rich womanhood of warmer climes with features sensuous rather than delicate emotional rather than intellectual would he then be able to keep his distance and the integrity of his complacent puritan soul the editor of the eagle had advised all young men to marry but it was to do the state some service not to appease a hunger which he himself understood but in new orleans as truly as in paris the fact of sex was taken as a matter of course and provided for and new orleans would be his teacher swinging around the big bend in the river on the northern bank of which the old historical and respectable sections of the city lie the st cloud brilliantly lighted found her way among a multitude of similar steamers to a mooring of the cobblestone wharf it was ten o'clock on friday and the whitmans had opportunity only to find a bed for the night the next morning walt set out in the rain to make arrangements for board a room was found at poydras at st charles streets but it proved to be so unclean that they had to seek more comfortable quarters these they found at the fremont next door to the st charles theatre and just across the street from the st charles hotel both in their day rated by travellers among the best in the world walt was to know both of them intimately the former presented on its boards the favourites he had applauded at the park in the bowery macready booth and edwin forrest the last just now retiring from the stage there was also dr collier's model artist a review of whose pet tableau performances led whitman into his first defence of the nude in art in the hotel whitman had perhaps his best opportunity to see a cross-section of the population of all but the vieux carre or old french and spanish creole city for the st charles was in the municipality where american enterprise had taken the lead in commerce politics and civic improvement he loved to loiter there especially on those hot days when as he phrased it one could get the full good of sherry cobblers umbrella shady sides of the street and equanimity of temper he long remembered the handsome bar its cobblers topped with strawberries and snow its mild french brandy and exquisite wines which the author of franklin evans did not scruple to enjoy he was most interested in observing the strange mixture of men in this cosmopolitan city the tryst treaty with mexico had just been signed but had not yet been ratified and the city was still full of uniforms to its customary brilliancy gaiety and freedom were added the abnormal excitement and irresponsibility of war time the american armies had debarked from new orleans and were now returning thither general taylor himself was in town and general pillow 
whitman talked with both and later saw them at a theatre where they were given an ovation but there were many types drinking their countless toddies and mint juleps at the st charles who had been attracted to the queen city of the south for other than patriotic reasons adventurers gamblers from saratoga dandies fugitives from justice in the states or in south america planters steamboat captains bon vivants the life of the workers was no less strange and picturesque as he observed on his early morning or noonday strolls about the town and the levee got up early he records from my bed in my little room near lafayette the sun had scarcely risen and every object seemed lazy and idle on some german ship moored to the levee i saw about a dozen stalwart sailors with bare legs scouring the decks they seem to be as happy as lords although their wages are sometimes not more than six dollars a month saw a negro throw a large stone at the head of his mule because it would not pull an empty dray wished i owned the negro wouldn't treat him as he treated the mule but make him a present of cowskin and make him whip himself saw a poor longshoreman lying down on a bench had on a red shirt and blue cottonade pantaloons coarse brogans but no stockings he had spent all his money in a tippler's shop the night previous for a grog and when his last picayune was discovered to be gone he was kicked out of the house thought that there were some landlords who deserved to be bastinadoed saw a shipping master riding at full speed upon a small pony he would have been willing to have freighted every ship in port if he could have been elected so him go on board a vessel and come off again with in all probability a flea in his ear he kicked the pony in his sides and after dismounting went into the nearest grog shop how he kept his spirits up by pouring spirits down he didn't get the freight of that ship the sun had just showed his golden face above the gray clouds of the horizon and bathed with lustre the distant scenery now come the bustle and business of the day shopkeepers are opening their stores stevedores are hurrying aboard their respective ships though stevedores they are for the most part honest men and physically speaking work much harder than any other class of the community many of them have little tin kettles on their arms which contain their simple dinner repast when their work is over they get their bones and then separate for their different homes to woo tired nature's sweet restorer sleep or may have to spend their day's earnings in a grog shop there's a big red-faced man walking hastily up the levee he's a custom-house officer and is hurrying on board his vessel for fear that if not there by sunrise the captain may report him to the collector went into st mary's market saw a man a good old man in a blue jacket and cottonade pantaloons with a long stick of sugar-cane in his hand wondered who he was and much surprised to find out that he was a lawyer of some repute at the lower end of the market there was a woman with a basket of live crabs at her feet although she loved money she had no particular affection for a press from the claws of the ungainly creatures that she handled with a pair of iron tongs saw the catfish man who declared that his fish were just caught and were as tender as a piece of lamb went up the market and saw rounds of beef haunches of venison and legs of mutton that would make a disciple of graham forswear his hermit-like appetite came down town shops all open and heard the newsboys calling out the names of the different papers that they had for sale these boys are cute as foxes and as industrious as sands some of them who now cry out here's your here's the here's the may in time be sent to congress when down town further always business and activity the clerks placing boxes upon the pavements the persons employed in fancy stores were bedecking their windows with their gaudiest goods and the savoury smell of fried ham boiled beefsteaks with onions etc stole forth from the half unshut doors of every restaurant passed down conti street and looked at the steamboat wharf it was almost lined with steamboats some were puffing up off steam and throwing up to the sky huge columns of blackened smoke some were lying idle and others discharging sugar molasses cotton and everything else that is produced in the great valley of the mississippi came to the conclusion that new orleans was a great place and no mistake went still further down visited the markets and saw that every luxury given to sinful man by sea and land from a shrimp to a small potato were there to be purchased came home again and took breakfast tea a radish piece of dry toast and an egg read one of the morning papers and then went about my business 
but he did not always dine so frugally until he learned that overeating interfered with his work he was fond of frequenting the justly famous oyster houses of the city as a change from the less appetizing fare of the fremont such was the city doubtless the most romantic the most european the most picturesquely quaint in the united states one whose social order though not her business life was the product of latin traditions the city was politically three cities or municipalities but though the american section was in many ways in the lead even the americans had lost some of their stiffness their avarice their cautious reserve and their pioneering earnestness in a desire to imitate those graces of life which grow only in a civilization rooted in the past on a sunday morning whitman must have heard the soft music of the guitar played in the street and reflected that this would have landed a man in jail in new york or boston but why should it what a man or a city does in his leisure hours is often more indicative of his true character than his efforts to make a livelihood and new orleans did everything to quote a writer in the crescent probably whitman himself if there be any individual in the community who has santa anna's favorite passion on the apex of his heart which remark meaneth a furious desire to be present when the gallic emblem of nationality spurs himself for the fight he can at all times be accommodated in the lower municipalities in certain locations he will be permitted to cry crow chapman chapman crow to the fullest extent of his lungs does the gentleman desire to see the atacapas bull just imported from havana speared by an artiste of celebrity if so his wish can be fulfilled by visiting algiers the most lawless section of the city on the southern bank of the river and the third municipality in the pleasant season of our southern summer as for masquerade balls we can only be beaten by gay gallant chivalrous paris and in the way of operas we can't be beaten at all there's the french opera at the orleans theatre and occasionally we have those addicted to music from the fatherland who sing to our uneducated ears strains of the most mysterious sweetness again once or twice in the course of the theatrical season we have gems of genius from the sunny skies of fair classic italy who sing as if their very blood had been intermixed with the red currents of that flow from the hearts of nightingales therefore as bombastus says since music is the food of love play michael wiggins once again if a person wishes to perforate his intimate friend or insolent enemy he has only to go to some one of the numerous shooting galleries in new orleans and by the joint aid of a few dimes and three days practice he can be taught to split a bullet against the edge of a penknife at the distance of ten paces those two who are fond of playing with edge tools will by applying to some of our fencing masters be taught how to pink a gentleman in a manner that chevalier bayard would have wept at more than this could not be desired now as far as our national drama we have all the materials necessary stars from europe from britain and i sometimes from our own wild western states appear week after week at the different theatres which temples of the drama are we suppose better patronized than any others in the land of the free and the home of the brave those who come to visit us albeit for a season must never think that the queen city of the south is deficient in amusements for they can enjoy themselves at anything in the way of drinking from a glass of the waters of the muddy mississippi up to a golden goblet filled with roman punch in the way of eating from a mold sea biscuit with a slice of rusty bacon up to a boiled pompano with terrapin gags and asparagus and in the way of music from the tooting of a penny whistle up to a soul entrancing strain of a silver bugle in the still solemn hours of night the fact is that in this goodly city we can go through the whole alphabet of enjoyment and as they say in the west not miss a letter from a to izzard and enjoy it whitman did physically he had never felt better and if there had ever been any social timidity born of his own humble origin to keep him from the parlors of the elite in brooklyn and new york though he had sometimes attended functions as a reporter his appearance in a hospitable easy-going city where he was quite unknown would do much to give him courage if not discretion one evening in may he accompanied some friends to a ball in the suburb known as lafayette he wore unaccustomed and uncomfortable evening clothes perhaps for the first time in his life and as he drew the white kid gloves on his large hands he burst them so that they looked as he said like cracked dumplings but he added with characteristic nonchalance i didn't care so i put my hands behind my back and made my first debut amidst the chivalry beauty loveliness and exquisite grace congregated in that social hall 
had whitman gone merely as a reporter he need not care greatly whether he were noticed or not but already he had been in the social capital of the south long enough to begin to think that of his personal relation to it he had seen the creole beauties and all those varying shades of feminine loveliness which made the city famous on the streets in the parks and at the theatre at the opera he had doubtless noted the elegance of the san dominican beauties free women of colour whose tincture of a more passionate race could hardly be detected under the gas-light which fell upon their jewels as they sat in the second tier reserved for them and seeing so many lovely women intelligent but certainly not with the intellectual cast of head he had admired in brooklyn the poet in him responded before he knew it so on this night he was wondering if he might not at the ball find the woman nature intended for his mate the room was overflowing with the beauty of lafayette with a sprinkling from new orleans and carrollton a promenade was in order when i entered and i watched each graceful form and lovely face as they approached like sylphs of some fairy tale in plain fancy and mask dresses each one methought was more lovely than the other but know the object of my heart she who has caused me so many sleepless nights and restless days she whom i have seen so often in my dreams and imaginings was not among the unmasked i rose from my seat with a heavy heart walked into the bar and took a drink of lemonade without any brandy in it i looked upon it with stoic indifference she was not there and not being there the place or persons had no charms for me while musing to myself that i would emigrate to europe or china get wrecked perhaps find her on some barren isle etc i caught a glimpse of what i conceived the very pink of perfection in form grace and movement in fancy dress dr collier would give the world for such a figure my eyes were riveted to the spot my head began to swim i saw none but her a mist surrounded all the others while she moved about in bold relief she turned i saw her face radiant with smiles ecstasy delight tis she i ejaculated as if tossed by a pitchfork and caught the arm of a manager to introduce me he did know her it was her first appearance in the ballroom i imagined it was an auspicious coincidence it was also my first appearance seeing a gentleman conversing with her i watched my opportunity and seeing him alone i requested him to introduce me never saw him before in my life but what cared i my case was getting desperate he willingly consented and off we started toward her to describe my feelings while approaching her is impossible i was blind to all but her the agony was over she spoke and the deed was done i found that she was everything that i imagined accomplished pleasing in her manners agreeable in conversation well versed in the authors from dryden down to james including all the intermediate landings passionately fond of music she said and by her musical voice i knew she could sing i was happy in every sense of the word delighted beyond measure she kindly consented to promenade would carry me through a cotillion if i'd go but knowing nothing about the poetry of motion i had to decline and she noble generous creature as she was preferred rather to talk and walked and dance i admired her nay i will confess for the first time in my life i felt the tender passion creeping all over me i was in love i could not restrain myself candour compelled me to speak openly i told her i had been looking for her since i was eighteen years of age looking for me she exclaimed was astonishment if not you i answered some one very much like you she guessed my object saw and understood all and invited me to call and see her i was in my own opinion as good as a married man at length my toils and troubles were to cease i was about to be repaid for my constancy by having the one for my wife that nature intended just at this moment where in any other place i would have been on my knees the gentleman who had introduced me came up and said wife ain't it time to go home yes my dear she responded so taking his arm casting a peculiar kind of look at me and bidding me good night they left me like a motionless statue on the floor and there we will leave the youth sadder and wiser to laugh at his rashness as best he can who was she she may have been any fashionable woman who bored with a husband thought to amuse herself with the novelty of coquetting with the foreign young man from new york or she may have been one of those beautiful and accomplished vampires which infested the new orleans of the day who finding that her intended victim was financially unpromising gave the wink to her wedded accomplice and so shook him without more ado 
he would get over it in a week though his writings for the crescent the next day bore traces of a sentimentally distraught mind yet the whitman who awoke knew more about himself and his needs there were other women in new orleans and this dazzling experience impressed him with the fact that he was a man no i am a man attracting at any time her i but look upon or touch with the tips of my fingers or that touches my face or leans against me End of section four section five of whitman an interpretation in narrative by emory holloway this librivox recording is in the public domain book two part two a city of romance so stevenson was to boast of his power over the correlative sex whitman's friends doubtless took him also to the quadroon balls the amusement par excellence to be shown to all visiting gentlemen but with jeff or alone he found his way to the many other points of interest the city afforded there were the sabbath throngs who carried flowers to the strange ovens in the cemeteries the dueling oaks the maitrerie race-course the spanish fort the cabildo the primitive negro dances in congo square the old st louis hotel with its slave block in the basement the battlefield at chalmette like the battlefield of brooklyn this last stirred his imagination he had once as a boy of fourteen seen andrew jackson when as president the gray-haired hero and sage had been welcomed in brooklyn whitman wandered also in the place d'armes and thought of its eventful history doubtless he had pointed out to him the blacksmith's shop of jean lafitte pirate and patriot quaker though he was he was fond of the old cathedral where religion was beautiful without falling into the ostentation he had deplored in the rich and gaudy churches of new york his brother jeff was less impressed by such old-world beauty on sunday morning he wrote home we took a walk down to the old french church and an old-looking thing it is too every one would go up and dip their fingers in the holy water and then go home and whip their slaves one old black took a bottle full home to wash the sins out of the family but walt was more catholic more comprehending the tall grey cathedral reared its ancient spire to heaven but the towers wherein were the bells that have tolled the death knell and rung the merry marriage music of thousands were silent it was a day dedicated to the king of kings it was the holy thursday of passion week it commemorated the occasion of the last supper of our saviour who when surrounded by his disciples gave them his last earthly blessings there were over two thousand communicants kneeling at the altars at various periods of the day and all seemed fully sensible of the solemnity of the occasion grand mass was celebrated after which many persons came in to adore or communicate in spirit with the son of man our dark-eyed creole beauties with their gilt-edged prayer-books in their hands would walk with an air that seemed to say that beauty was a part of religion dipping their taper fingers into the holy water and crossing their foreheads they would then walk up the aisle and kneel down to prayer we saw many women there whose garments betokened that some dear friend had not been long laid in the grave they knelt before the picture of christ carrying his cross and prayed no doubt that they might have strength to carry theirs persons of all classes went down before the shrine of religion there was the broken-hearted man of the world the gray-haired man whose feet were on the brink of the grave the blooming girl whose charms were budding into womanhood and the wrinkled careworn widow to whom love was but a memory there again were the servants of ancient families and then ragged pale-faced creatures who looked as though they did not dare to approach too near the altar the whole scene was beautiful and solemn and calculated to impress the heart with the purity of virtue and endow the soul with full reliance in the power of him who rules above 
a religion which could even for the moment bring all classes of a city to think so humbly of god that they were equal in their penitence and their adoration and do this with perfect naturalness and peace could not fail to impress a democratic quaker poet to whom religion was always much less a creed intellectually apprehended a code sustained by the self-sacrificing will than it was a mode of living a spirit of brotherhood toward men and filial piety toward the creator such a romantic city should be blessed of nature as a matter of fact it was flat and so poorly drained that epidemics of cholera and yellow fever were almost annual scourges whitman missed the hills of his native north but nature lavished her grace on tree and shrub i see where the live oak is growing i see the yellow pine the scented bay tree the lemon and orange the cypress the graceful palmetto the cactus guarded with thorns the laurel tree with large white flowers the range afar the richness and barrenness the old woods charged with mistletoe and trailing moss the piney odour and the gloom the awful natural stillness here in these dense swamps the freebooter carries his gun and the fugitive has his concealed hut oh the strange fascination of these half-known half impassable swarms infested with reptiles resounding with the bellow of the alligator the sad noises of the night owl and the wild cat and the whirr of the rattlesnake the mocking-bird the american mimic singing all the forenoon singing through the moonlit night and as in paris flowers everywhere gladdened the drab of city street corners sold by bewitching young grisettes one of these whitman selected to stand for the type studying her as she stood nightly under his window and perhaps making her acquaintance in her home or in the french market where he loved to take the morning cup of black coffee which in new orleans is considered almost an obligation miss dusky grisette is the young lady who takes her stand of evenings upon the pavement opposite the st charles hotel for the praiseworthy purpose of selling a few flowers by retail showing off her own charms meanwhile in a wholesale manner she drives a thriving trade when the evenings are pleasant her neat basket of choice bouquet sits by her side and she is a smile and a wink for every one of the passers-by who have a smile and a wink for her mademoiselle grisette was raised in the city and is pretty well known as a very pretty marchand des fleurs she can recommend a tasteful bunch of posies with all the grace in the world and her by a broom style of addressing her acquaintance has certainly something very taking about it she possesses pretty eyes a pretty chin and a mouth that many an heiress grown oldish and faded would give thousands for the homme bon point of her form is full of attraction and she dresses with simple neatness and taste she keeps her eyes open and her mouth shut except to be to show her beautiful teeth ah hers are teeth that are teeth she has sense enough to keep her tongue quiet and discourses more by silence than speaks and eloquence of eyes than any other method herein she is prudent grisette is not a blue by any means rather a brune or more prettily a brunette but that's not much the vermilion of her cheeks shows through the veil and her long glossy hair is nearly straight there are many who affect the brune rather than the blonde at least when they wish to purchase a bouquet and as night shows stars and women in a better light they have a pleasant smile and a bewitching glance thrown into the bargain whilst purchasing a bunch of posies what becomes of the flower-girl in the daytime would be hard to tell perhaps it would be in bad taste to attempt to find out she is only interesting in character at association standing at or reclining against the door cheeks of a store with the brilliancy of the gaslight falling favourably and perhaps deceptively upon her features and upon her person with her basket of tasteful bouquet at her feet and some of the choicest buds setting off her own headdress as such she looks in character as a jolie grisette as she is and will excite the notice of those who beneath the light of the sun and in the noontide gaze of men would spurn and loathe such familiarities the little witch was evidently a member of that class whose existence gave new orleans a social code that would be strange if not immoral in any other american city the octoroon woman beautiful and passionate victim of racial amalgamation 
all testimony agrees that she was a marvel of physical charm sometimes her complexion was clear and her hair flaxen without a single condemning wave sometimes her hair and eye were dark her skin shot through the with only an italian hint of a duskier hue or her voluptuous lips alone betraying her standing in the society that had made her what she was so lovely was she and often so rich and cultivated that she was allowed to wear her mask at the quadroon balls to which none but gallants of the superior race might come and to which they often did come leaving their own ladies to make tapestry at more exclusive soirees but she could escape neither her origin nor her destiny both of which had reference to the lust of man nor was she altogether to be blamed if she sought to mate above rather than beneath her even though the law forbade a regular marriage thus only might her children climb another step towards social recognition and culture until ultimately should be erased all traces of the shadows on her past whitman never forgot these women and in old age feelingly described them to a young friend to whom he tried to tell the greatest personal secret of his life i have been in new orleans known seen all its peculiar phases of life of course my report would be forty years old or so the octoroon was not a whore a prostitute as we call a certain class of women here and yet she was too a hard class to comprehend women with splendid bodies no bustles no corsets no enormities of any sort large luminous bright eyes face a rich olive habits indolent yet not lazy as we defined laziness north fascinating magnetic sexual ignorant illiterate always more than pretty pretty is too weak a word to apply to them a picture which strikingly fits this description was found pasted in one of whitman's personal note-books whitman's situation in the crescent office for a time was congenial and promising mr hayes and mr mcclure the proprietors of this enterprising and independent newspaper were both kind to him and paid him well he saved his money and when he had been away from brooklyn a month in his homesickness at hearing that his mother who had not written him was ill he even contemplated going back but he wanted first save a thousand dollars now that he had the chance so that they could buy a quiet little farm of their own and live together in family affection jeff also worked on the paper giving the five dollars he received each week to walt to save and adding to it the proceeds from the exchange papers his brother gave him to sell one of walt's duties on the crescent was to read the exchanges excerpting articles of interest and writing editorials about them though most of the leaders were written by a mr larue while a mr reader was city editor and a certain depute translated the mexican items these exchanges were interesting to whitman they told of the enthusiasm in new york over the establishment of france's second republic and of greeley and bryant and others of his friends drawing up resolutions of salutation to the new democracy even in the place d'armes he could hear a hundred guns saluting the freedom of a land which was more truly a mother to the city than any other could ever be he knew too that the free soilers were busy and that though he had been defeated in his fight with the eagle the fight was being carried on by others aside from writing some whimsical post addisonian sketches of the motley new orleans life as it appeared to a pair of strange but observant eyes whitman showed little qualification for covering the news of the city in any broad way but he was sent almost daily to the recorder's courts to get the stories of those who fell under the displeasure of the law this sort of reporting was largely new to him and opened his eyes to yet another stratum of humanity which needed to be taken into account by one who would celebrate the average life of america promptly at ten o'clock each morning when the local radamanthus recorder baldwin or ramos sat down on the bench beneath its dingy canopy the court would awake to life and a semblance of order before him swarmed the second-rate lawyers who thrive on humanity's more inglorious woes and beyond them the tiers of greasy benches occupied by witnesses and visitors from behind the bars to the left peered out the anxious or sullen faces of men women and even children who had spent a night in the calaboose opposite these culprits sat those unofficial judges the reporters who would publish abroad with ridicule or sympathy the stories of the night before when the recorder came in the reporters would take out their pencils and make ready to write their chairs tipped against the greasy wall one common class of culprits was the negro slaves sometimes they had run away to the swamps and had been caught 
sometimes they had found a grog shop that would break the law by selling liquor to them and had created a disturbance often they were up for thieving but often too they were present to complain of cruelties suffered at the hands of the ruling race whitman hated slavery but he knew that slaves also could do wrong and he tried to be just to accused and accuser alike his nature revolted at the sight of women in the chain-gang yet he was able to see also the other side of slavery one day the crescent printed the story of a slave woman who running away from her master's plantation near the city had voluntarily returned from ohio preferring slavery to such liberty as she had known in her two years in the north no women could never write an uncle tom's cabin out of one-sided sympathy for the slave however he might deplore the evils of the system for he knew like emerson that there are and will always be slaves wherever man has not attained the mastery over himself those who were cruel to animals and most of the negro teamsters were he excoriated as he did the drivers of omnibuses who endangered the lives of pedestrians drunkards for the most part he laughed at the various grades of prostitution to be found in new orleans were not then segregated or regulated as they are to-day but the more notorious types were somewhat localized in the region of magazine perdido and philippa streets the section was of course often represented in the police court once whitman limited his article to this type of vice and misfortune isle of cyprus recorder baldwin's dock was yesterday metamorphosed into the isle of cyprus upon a very small scale the police were unusually active on wednesday night last and by way of experiment arrested no less than twenty-three of the frail cyprians who reside in magazine perdido and philippa streets let's sketch the picture in one side of the dark sits a woman with a brazen face and a don't care pennyish air she has on a splendid black silk dress and wears a large gold chain about her neck her fine muslin collar is fastened by an enormous brooch and her fingers glitter with jewels made of glass colored to suit her fancy she evidently belongs to the upper ten thousand of those of her caste and purses up her mouth at her humbler companions by the side of this cleopatra of perdido street is a woman with red hair no shoes a pug nose and a very dirty calico gown all the time she pats her foot upon the floor and when sent down ogles the police as she goes out then again seated in one corner is a creature who owes much of the beauty of her form to one of the staples of the south cotton she has on the smallest bonnet that possibly could be obtained and a green veil long enough for the drop curtain of a small theatre shades her features ever and anon she makes mathematical problems with the end of her parasol on the floor and seems to be in a great anxiety to leave her companion in the red muslin dress seems utterly a stranger to shame and with her white bare arms crossed over her breast patiently awaits her fate she tasted vice's poison chalice early see there is a woman rocking herself to and fro apparently unconscious of what is going on when called on by the recorder she starts to her feet and looks vacantly around she is laboring under the influence of mania a potu and her bed will soon be her grave how unlike her frail sister who sits beside her she has ruddy cheeks sparkling eyes coral lips and a bust like that of venus little cares she whether the recorder sends her down or not she has plenty of friends to help her out of the scrape ever and anon she takes out her gold watch not exactly to see what time it is but merely to let the police know that a female who has a gold watch could not possibly belong to the society which she was in when the recorder tells her that she must find a voucher she perks up her nasal organ and sails out of the dock with the air of a queen poor old jane that friendless creature who sits in one corner with her hands clasped over her eyes she is barefooted and like lazarus of old is clothed in rags yet that wretched magdalen was once innocent and perhaps the pride of doting parents now she is a drunken toter and would not turn up her heel to save her life close by her side there is a masculine-looking woman who is all the while giggling and smiling at every one who looks at her when asked what her occupation is she states in a tragic voice i'm an actress the recorder orders her to make an exit to the workhouse in yonder group are those who have passed through almost every stage of vice and misery to whom life is but a curse and death a blessing shunned by their own sex they seek companions among the lowest of the low and day by day like loathsome worms creep and crawl nearer and nearer to their graves 
well might we exclaim with the poet there is no sight on earth so piteous as woman lost to honour and to shame the poor wretches for the most part were sent to the workhouse upon the ground that they followed no honest occupation on another day the reporter's sympathy was evoked by another girl who though a member of the demi monde was not lost to shame in another corner there was a pale thin-visaged woman who sat shivering as it were and hiding her head from the audience by covering it with her apron her face bore the impress of beauty and her soft white taper fingers told that once she had been a lady and better than that a woman how changed the scene this creature once perhaps the idol of a lordly household had become dishonoured dismayed and lonely even as one step is above or below another so we sink down a rise in the estimation of the public life has its steps its days are but the rounds upon the ladder like that scene by jacob which must carry the true and just to happiness in heaven and again there was the woman who in her dishevelled hair and hectic cheek cursed in her inmost heart the wretch who destroyed her and then again one who had just fallen from the brink of ruin with the last tinge of the spring bloom of life upon her careworn cheeks the scene was a sermon to the preacher and a lesson of the changes of life to all each of these poor magdalens might have known a mother's love but never had they knelt at a saviour's feet even by a humble police report the noblest precepts may be inculcated and virtue made to wave her sceptre over the dark abode of vice for once the preacher in him asserts itself against what his tendency so apparent in some of his police reporting to describe misfortunes cynically even jestingly how different that from the whitman of the eagle editorials but the sympathy he felt for women whose misfortunes had debarred them from motherhood his ideal for all good women that was sincere when whitman had been writing these easy-going whimsical sometimes puerile sketches for the crescent for three months his connection with the paper came to a sudden end he probably was unable to see himself just how it happened and certainly he was not prepared for it one day he sent down to the counting-room a request for a small sum of money to his chagrin mr mcclure sent back a statement of what money he had drawn and declined to make any further advances it is true that a certain coldness had been observed in both mr hayes and mr mcclure for some time past they had ceased to consult whitman about the policies of the paper this had provoked in him an equal reserve and now his pride being touched he returned a memorandum showing that he was not their debtor and suggested that the connection be dissolved this was agreed to and in two days the whitmans began their return journey what had caused the coldness of his proprietors possibly they had seen that his slovenly writing often below the tone of that he had done for the eagle would add distinction to no paper perhaps he was as hard to get along with in new orleans as newspaper proprietors in new york and brooklyn had found him to be or perhaps the owners of the crescent had heard the gossip going around among the newspaper men that whitman had taken up with a woman one of the class at once most fascinating and most accessible and octoroon this in itself would probably not be sufficient to declass a man especially a journalist in a city like the new orleans of eighteen forty eight but if it affected his work or the regularity of his hours as it would be certain to do then that was another matter he had been reading byron and was fond of quoting the line a change came over the young man's dream and it is clear that a change did come over whitman's dream of life about this time that whitman was no stranger to woman is evident to any reader of his verse that he was never married he himself has declared all the evidence points to new orleans as the place where he learned what can be taught by romantic passion though we perhaps shall never know a great deal concerning the circumstances attending the progress of his entanglement it is essential to the story of walt whitman to fit that episode into his history as truthfully as we can the portrait which aikens painted of him he thought the best though as he said it included too much of rabelais instead of just enough that touch was more essential than the curls in the parlour portrait by gilchrist the plan of our story does not permit us here to sift all the evidence concerning whitman's affaire de coeur but though in the nature of the case whitman himself having been very reticent about it dates and names cannot be supplied i am convinced by many years of study and investigation that the gossip which linked the young journalist with the peculiar demi of new orleans was substantially true 
a dozen years later in preparing an edition of his poems he wrote once i passed through a populous city imprinting my brain for future use with its shows architecture customs traditions yet now of all that city i remember only a woman i casually met there who detained me for love of me day by day and night by night we were together all else has long been forgotten by me i remember i say only that woman who passionately clung to me again we wander we love we separate again again she holds me by the hand i must not go i see her close beside me with silent lips sad and tremulous but he was careful to hide the key to his poem though publishing it elsewhere at the same time and after a few years he threw it away altogether it was this singing what to the soul entirely redeemed her the faithful one the prostitute who detained me when i went to the city singing the song of prostitutes but we must hasten to make a distinction even as whitman did in describing the octoroon though a prostitute she is not necessarily to be associated with the class of on whom whitman had bestowed his pity and his scorn as a police reporter even were there no direct evidence it is more probable as it is more charitable to suppose that she was a creole octoroon in that case she may have been respectable in everything except her opportunity to marry into the ruling race and she may have been too self-respecting to marry elsewhere but apparently whitman's justification for her lay in the fact that she was faithful in her love for him even as anne of oxford street was faithful to de quincey and clear to stevenson a self-reliant young man without experience with women would have been strong to have hesitated in that exotic atmosphere to return a love so offered to him if only out of pity for the woman had not melville yielded to the charms of his fair away whitman knew enough about literary biography to understand that boldness in sex matters had been the rule rather than the exception with great poets and for once with a beautiful woman to love him in his large manliness he could be bold it is true that he was something of a sluggish dutchman but in this woman with the warmth of summer in her veins he found what could stir him and once stirred his imagination quickly released her from her past and made her a woman redeemed by her love as hester prynne thought herself pure because her love being single had a consecration in itself biography cannot should not be too minute in recording the details of a poet's first love that belongs forever to him but the impress it left upon him and threw his mind upon his verse is a part of his legacy to his kind when we turn to that verse we see records of other loves no less unhappy perhaps but less unconventional but this first love wrote itself into lines of such abandon that the poet himself later wished them unwritten perhaps they were an easing of the secret a kind of self-torture whereby the puritan in him on his return to a more typical american environment sought to expose the caresser of life in the market-place of public print as hester prynne was exposed in salem village even when his lesson learned he began to pass for a saint among the pure he sometimes could with difficulty endure their praises o oh, admirers praise not me compliment not me you make me wince i see what you do not i know what you do not the dogmatic prude was gone for ever whitman had found himself akin through the flesh with all mankind in two spheres men meet and really comprehend each other in their loftiest ideals and in their most animal desires whitman seeks the ideal community being a poet and an idealist but such communion as possible only among the few who have imagination so whitman also emphasizes the common origin in us of the many passions wherewith we individualize our lives but at first whitman was engrossed with the fact so recent and so powerful with him that man was an animal like rousseau he chafed under the limitations of society oh the puzzle the thrice tied knot the deep and dark pool all untied and illumined oh to speed where there is space enough and air enough at last to be absolved from previous follies and degradations i from mine and you from yours to find a new unthought of nonchalance with the best of nature to have a gag removed from one's mouth to have the feeling to-day or any day that i am sufficient as i am 
oh something improved something in a trance to escape utterly from others anchors and holds to drive free to love free to dash reckless and dangerous to court destruction with taunts with invitations to ascend to leap to the heavens of the love indicated to me to rise thither with my inebriate soul to be lost if it must be so to feed the remainder of life with one hour of fullness and freedom with one brief hour of madness and joy the floodgates of a highly sexed nature the pent-up rivers of himself gave way and whitman returned to nature for the time he lost his sense of proportion his reverence for the wisdom of the race sensation opened to him the gates of novel joys and that conscience might be kept at bay he quickly found in the purity of his passion reasons why his love was pure he took out his notebook when the passion had a little spent itself but was still vivid in his memory and wrote down in lines as free of poetic convention as his life has been free from social convention the story of the tyranny of passion the revelation of sex one touch of a tug of me has unhaltered my senses but feeling that pleases the rest so they have given themselves up in submission they are all emulous to swap themselves off for what it can do to them every one must be a touch or else she will abdicate and nibble only at the edges of feeling they move caressingly up and down my body they leave themselves and come with bribes to whatever part of me touches to my lips to the palms of my hands and whatever my hands hold each brings the best she has for each is in love with touch i do not wonder that one feeling now does so much for me he is free of all the rest and swiftly begets offspring of them better than the dams a touch now reads me a library of knowledge in an instant it smells for me the fragrance of wine and lemon blows it tastes for me the ripe strawberries and melons it talks for me with a tongue of its own it finds an ear wherever it rests or taps it brings the rest around it and they all stand on a headland and mock me they have left me to touch and taken their place on a headland the sentries have deserted every part of me they have left me helpless to the torrent of touch they have all come to the headland to witness and assist against me i roam about drunk and stagger i am given up by traitors i talk wildly i am surely out of my head i am myself the greatest traitor i went myself first to the headland pass as you will take drops of my life if that is what you are after only pass to someone else for i can contain you no longer i held more than i thought i did not think i was big enough for so much ecstasy or that a touch could take it all out of me the descent to nature is simple and swift the atavism of sex in itself relieves the tension of civilized man's ill-fitting inhibitions meanwhile stimulating through physical beauty that imagination which is able to create beauty of more enduring form but man cannot become an animal by simply disregarding others anchors and holds he cannot divest himself of his past nor of his dreams for his future for that reason cultivated men who wearied with the limitations of society have sought to become children of adam in some far south sea isle or other have generally returned to seek the freedom which is under law the law of regarding others as well as themselves the author of compensation might have taught whitman that one cannot have his cake and eat it that when one seems to be doing so it is time to examine the quality of the cake this the sensitive young whitman was quick to do he realized what he was losing but he also was conscious of the new powers liberated in him powers of sympathy as well as a new confidence in his own personal identity he had broken the law perhaps but he was not yet damned indeed the fruit of the tree of knowledge had made him wiser as well as sadder his struggle with the weakness within would last many years but his very first reaction taught him the indestructibility of his soul he knew he was made neither selfish nor callous by his experience but rather had learned to feel that all men are more strangely akin than he had thought ah poverties wincings and sulky retreats are you foes that in conflict have overcome me for what is my life or any man's life but a conflict with foes the old incessant war you degradations you tussle with passions and appetites you smarts from dissatisfied friendships ah wounds the sharpest of all 
you toil of painful and choked articulations you meannesses you shallow tongue talks at tables my tongue the shallowest of any you broken resolutions you racking angers you smothered ennui ah think not you finally triumph my real self as yet to come forth it shall yet march forth o'er mastering till all lies beneath me it shall yet stand up the soldier of ultimate victory if whitman soon found in such an entanglement that which threatened his independence and his future career so that on losing his position on the crescent he was willing at once to depart from the south and the woman who loved him he at least never forgot her she is the dark lady of his sonnets of all the unfortunates for whom our civilization is responsible he singles out the class which she represented for special compassion in his verse poems of abandon he might set down in order to record his own emotional experiences with her but other whole poems were written and still others planned to express his tenderness for such outcasts poems which he would not leave out though the very life of his book was at stake End of section 5section six of whitman an interpretation in narrative by emory holloway this librivox recording is in the public domain book three part one the spirit speaks taking two days to pack his few belongings and to make his adieus whitman with jeff went aboard the pride of the west at dusk on may twenty six the steamer was a fast one and put them in st louis almost as quickly as the st cloud had borne them downstream yet the passage was monotonous especially to one who had recently made it and whitman stimulated by no new excitement had time to reflect on the experiences of the past three months they had been very different from anything he could have expected of himself they had released the bohemian in him had taught him how sensitive he was to beauty and to sex and had made it clear that henceforth romance was to be a part of his life perhaps he was glad to be leaving behind him a city wherein no great opportunity for his ambition and where a yielding to the senses might even prove his undoing in any case his strong puritan training having now an opportunity to reassert itself doubtless threw into uncomfortable relief his recent caressing of life his sense of family responsibility made him realize too that jeff's lot in new orleans had been far from ideal he had had to work harder than walt thought he should the water did not agree with him and he was terribly homesick there would be relief and safety in getting back to the accustomed standards and influences of brooklyn landing in st louis the following saturday whitman reserved passage on an illinois river steamer for la salle and while waiting for it to start rambled over most of the town the night trip up the illinois was unpleasant the steamer was overloaded with freight and the passenger list was so large that whitman had to sleep on the floor to add to his discomforts a storm blew up making it necessary to tie the vessel to the shore the next day whitman inspected peoria as he did other cities on the route inquiring the price of land and the demand for labor wonderful farmland he found could be had for four or five dollars an acre from la salle the brothers made their slow way to chicago in a canal boat the next morning on board the griffith they started up lake michigan the young poet admiring its bright lively color so beautiful and rare he inspected the wisconsin towns with interest remembering that this state had the most advanced constitution in the union a constitution which safeguarded the rights of women as well as those of men it seems to me he wrote in his diary that if we should ever remove from long island wisconsin would be the proper place to come to crossing lake huron was uneventful on lake erie they passed over the scene of perry's battle a generation before on the evening of june eleventh they arrived at the attractive little town of cleveland about which the whitmans rambled in the dark 
erie was rough and whitman was all but seasick but he cheered himself with anticipation of the stop at buffalo and a visit to the show-place of the new world niagara falls but when he saw the giant cataract he was unprepared for its grandeur great god what a sight was all he could exclaim a day and a night of further travel brought them to albany there a democratic convention was in session but finding it to be one of hunkers whitman passed it by with the old party that had committed itself not only to slavery as a temporary and local institution in the south but to the morally unjustifiable extension of the virus into the free soil of the union whitman would have no more to do his residence in the south having taught him that slavery was not the unmixed evil for the negro at his present state of development his attitude was not one of mere sentimental humanitarianism like that of the abolitionists but he knew that slavery was inimical to the development of the west by self-reliant free pioneers for their opportunity he meant to fight after all he was a fighter and felt that personal enjoyment could never satisfy him as an end in itself the life that he knew the power that he felt the dreams that he enjoyed must somehow be made available for his fellow-men for this he was willing for the time to work through politics as the most available method of reform but he was never a reformer engrossed in one idea when he saw anything to enjoy he enjoyed it without asking why such a sight was the varied and imposing scenery of his own lordly hudson river down which he sailed in the alida he was immensely relieved to find that his mother from whom he had heard but infrequently was well as were the other members of the family at the time when whitman broke with the eagle in january the liberals in the party as we have seen finding their communications excluded from the only drum mcreddick paper in the city talked of starting a journal of their own with whitman as editor both bryant and greeley heard the rumors and encouraged them in their own papers but for some reason perhaps because financial backing could not at the time be had the matter was dropped at least so far as whitman was concerned but the ending of the war during his absence in the south gave new urgency to the problem of excluding slavery from the immense domains acquired by conquest whitman had not been back in brooklyn more than a week when henry lee's english editor of the advertiser announced the return of mr barnburner whitman lee's had been the eagle's chief political foe and there had been many sharp passages of editorial arms between them not always avoiding vulgar personalities but whitman as an ally in fighting the locally successful bosses of the eagle was a different person entirely the free soilers might not ultimately be absorbed by the whigs but on the dominant issue before the country they were fighting side by side after recounting the history of whitman's break with the eagle lees says but lo whom should we meet on the sidewalk in fulton street yesterday afternoon with his brown face smiling like a wicker vessel filled with wooden particles cleft from timber but our barn burner friend himself rienzi hath returned dame rumour tells some tales of a forthcoming gazette in which old hunkerism is to be handled without gloves put that and that together and see what it works out as for us we say nothing to nobody in the way of positive information but we like at least by hints to keep our readers well informed of what is going on in the blessed city of churches and if we may speak of them in the same sentence such democrats as have hitherto pulled the wires of their party one thing we will predict is a dead certainty if our barn burning friend does put forth a daily here in brooklyn there'll be fun no bulldog ever clutched determinedly on cattle's nasal membrane that tender spot no grimalkin ever worried horror-stricken mice more than our amiable loco foco friend the ex-editor of the eagle will be likely to clutch and worry old hunkerism in king's county and the prediction was more than a guess judge samuel e johnson an ardent free soiler nigger catcher as he was called by his enemies so zealous was he in underground railroading put up the money and early in september whitman brought out the first number of a weekly campaign sheet the free man the intention was to change it into a daily should the results of the election ensure its wider support whitman was the nominal proprietor and threw himself heart and soul into this his last political reform as an outlet for the new sense of power he had found through his recent emotional awakening 
he took part in local politics and went to buffalo as delegate to the free soil convention of which judge johnson was vice-president this convention nominated van buren for the presidency on a platform which affirmed the power and duty of congress to exclude slavery from the territories the brooklyn mass meeting which ratified this platform elected whitman one of its vice-presidents his old friend alden spooner being one of the secretaries lucky as he was in always finding some new and congenial task of journalism he sometimes drew a, a bad hand the freeman had modestly established itself in a basement at one ten orange street in the same building with the star just off fulton on saturday morning september nine the first number had come from his press to be complimented on its appearance by most of the newspapers of brooklyn and new york but that night a fire broke out in an upholstery establishment at one twenty two fulton street and spread with such rapidity that the volunteer firemen operating hand pumps could not gain control of it till many blocks in the heart of brooklyn had been destroyed including the freeman plant in orange street nor was there any insurance whitman's strongest characteristic however was dogged perseverance a characteristic shared with the other enemies of slavery so that in two months the freeman now published at ninety six myrtle avenue again jumped into the pre-election fight this time declared the energetic young editor we are determined to go ahead smiles or frowns thick or thin we shall establish a radical newspaper in king's county will it remain to be said that the friends of liberal principles here give it a meagre and lukewarm aid the freeman has apparently been quite lost to history but it was supported for a time so well that whitman was hopeful of getting the city advertising indeed he soon boasted that he sold two and three times more papers than the eagle or the star he employed a number of the lively newsboys just coming into use and the price of the paper was only a penny of course the election went against him not only because that is the all too common fate of third party protests but because both the old and well-organized parties had sidestepped the issue of free soil long before kansas should again make acute the issue or even before the fugitive slave law should arouse the free spirit of the north whitman would again have lost his job the freeman went so well indeed that notwithstanding the defeat of the party it was possible to make of it a daily paper similar to what the eagle had been under whitman's management this was in the spring of eighteen forty nine it looked as if whitman the wanderer was going to settle down he built a two-story house on the corner of myrtle and bridge using the ground floor for a printing office and bookstore and the upper rooms for the family residence but there were forces working against him perhaps behind his back the eagle had cause to wish to draw the teeth of the freeman and this it seems to have done in any case this would be a natural result of the action taken by the free soil convention at utica in september consolidating its ticket with that of the regular wing of the party and led in doing so by van buren himself at any rate just a year after his first unlucky issue the editor of the freeman found himself stranded again his successor pretended to be equally independent until just before the fall election when he endorsed the same ticket that the eagle was supporting but whitman went out with colors flying as the new editor said in accounting for the change of policy he took his flag with him and he did it with a cry of defiance and scorn intended perhaps not only for his immediate enemies but for the whole tribe of petty politicians to whom personal interest was more than the interests of the people they pretended to serve on september eleventh he announced after the present date i withdraw entirely from the brooklyn daily freeman to those who have been my friends i take occasion to proffer the warmest thanks of a grateful heart my enemies and old hunkers generally i disdain and defy the same as ever walter whitman he was through in time he would join the republican party and support fremont and lincoln and he would edit one more ruckland newspaper but henceforth if he could not hitch his wagon to a star he would not hitch it to a snail at least he would have such a wagon as he could hitch to himself he might do odd jobs in newspaper offices as a means of making enough to supply his simple needs but his life ambition would be connected with something which he could control even as it controlled him what was wrong with the country was simply the people in it especially the people who had not his courage to vote and speak as conscience might direct now he would attempt to disseminate culture among the masses as emerson had long counselled the young reformers to do 
but what was he to do a year and a half before when he was in a similar position he was glad enough to get away from the scene of his defeat and to indulge the romance in his nature by a visit to the country of his dreams he had now more than the wanderlust the need of change to impel him to the open road again he had memories of the women of his dreams as a man of affairs he belonged in the north where his work lay but as a lover his heart was in the south would not that woman who had so loved him now understand if not his problems yet his moods his hunger for appreciation as even his own adored mother could never do surely then if ever he felt the longings for home longings which he would later write poetry about disguising it with general terms o oh, magnet south o oh, glistening perfumed south myself o oh, quick metal rich blood impulse and love good and evil all all dear to me o oh, longings irrepressible oh i will go back to old tennessee and never wander more certainly he went back at some time and what time more likely than this if out of his love a child had been born and he confided to a friend late in life that such was the case it would now be six months old perhaps when he grew old enough to understand or to remember it would have to be kept away from him in the interest of its own social standing and peace of mind perhaps it would have to be given to the church to raise as loved children of the demi monde in new orleans are to this day but whitman the lover of children the prophet of a grand paternity would have to see it once of this or any later trip to the south he left but little record but it would seem clear that he loitered on the way at the mammoth cave in virginia he stopped to gratify his curiosity exploring its mysterious steps and talking with proctor his host at the cave hotel at blennerhassett island in the ohio he was entertained by a farmer named johnson brooding on the scene of natural loveliness and perhaps finding in it as he found in all nature now that he was becoming more and more subjective in his writing a symbol of his own experiences he wrote a poem and gave it to his appreciative but uncomprehending host it had little inspiration emotional freedom or elan but it was far different from the verse he had written on the mississippi the preceding year he now discards rhyme and regular metre relies more on the bold suggestiveness of his imagery more on the poetic value of the object described than on conventional tricks of expression he grows surer of himself and more daring bride of the sward ohio nude yet fair to look upon clothed only with the leaf as with innocent eve of eden the son of grim old allegheny and white-breasted mongahela is wedded to thee and it is well his tawny thighs cover thee in the vernal time of spring and lo in the autumn is the fruitage virgin of nature the holy spirit of the waters enshrouds thee and thou art pregnant with the fruits of the field and the vine but like the sabine maid of old the lust of man hath ravished thee and compelled thee to pay tribute to the carnal wants of earth truth and romance make up thy strange eventful history from the cycle of the red man who bowed at thy shrine and worshipped thee to the dark days of that traitor who linked thy innocent name to infamy farewell queen of the waters i have slept upon thy breast in the innocence of a babe but now i leave thee to the embraces of thine acknowledged lord perhaps on this journey to the south whitman visited the other states than louisiana in which he declared himself to have travelled either to satisfy his boundless curiosity concerning america or possibly to follow dim traces of a happiness which untreasured at the time had already slipped from his view whether he found her we do not know but in any case he was to discover that only by opening vistas to more and more spiritual loveliness can the beauty of the senses make terms with its own mortality at any rate by eighteen fifty he was a different man his hair was now well streaked with grey and his manner of life was altered so strangely that the older picture of the conventionally even daintily dressed young editor has been blotted from the memory of those who knew him but whitman had other mistresses one of them was his country and no one ever loved her more devotedly in the spring of eighteen fifty she seemed to his partial eyes in sore distress the plague spot of slavery appeared sure to spread to the west for even the most temperate men in the nation webster and clay were counselling compromise to whitman this was on webster's part not the moderation of a broad-minded statesman but betrayal by a coward or a mercenary 
and not only webster but all the whig and free soil democrats of the north were unworthy of his ideal for libertad he would scourge the time-serving misrepresenters of the people from this temple of democracy the south had her extenuations if not her excuses but he could see no excuse in the north for compromise on a moral question he cried out as an orator cries in lines of lyric passion scorning the conventional tricks of poetic rhetoric virginia mother of greatness blushed not for being the mother of slaves you might have borne deeper slaves doe faces crawlers lice of humanity terrific screamers of freedom who roar and bawl and get hot in the face but were they not incapable of august crime would quench the hopes of ages for a drink muck worms creeping flat to the ground a dollar dearer to them than christ's blessing all loves all hopes less than the thought of gain in life walking in that as in a shroud men men whom the throes of heroes great deeds at which the gods might stand appalled the shriek of a drowned world the appeal of women the exulting laugh of untried empires would touch them never in the heart but only in the pocket but the hope of the future lies in its youth and to them the poetic cavalier sounds his battle cry arise young north our elder blood flows in the veins of cowards the gray-haired sneak the blanched poltroon the feigned or real shiverer at tongues the nursing babes need hardly cry the less for are they to be our tokens always and when webster advocated that legalistic abomination of abominations in the north the fugitive slave law whitman went to greeley with a poem blood money charging that statesman with being guilty of the body and the blood of christ it was not very good poetry sudden outbursts of scorn seldom are even whittier's ichabod written on the same occasion but it was better than a newspaper editorial and it suggested to whitman a new way to address the conscience of the nation yet whitman could not have loved his country so much loved he not liberty more when by the summer of this year it became apparent that the revolutions in europe had for the most part failed in establishing the rights of the average man or even the independence of little nations his spirit though saddened lost none of its intrepidity it was something at least for them to have asserted their manhood god twas delicious that brief tight glorious grip upon the throats of kings the failure of the revolutions abroad and the apparent failure of the spirit of freedom at home resulting in the compromises of eighteen fifty and the extinction of the free soil party robbed whitman for the time of a cause and gave him leave to meditate how he might work in more enduring materials than the surface movements of massed mankind having made his peace with lees he wrote a little for the advertiser anonymously out of pride and political sagacity he corresponded a little for bryant's evening post but he was practically footloose he still had his printing shop and did what printing he could sometimes for the king's county board of supervisors later he helped his father in house building but all these occupations were flexible ones and he enjoyed having at the same time a sense of enlarged personal power and more leisure to cultivate it he became a bohemian not to affect a fad but because it was congenial to his spirit and habits he did not mind if people noticed a certain eccentricity in him they would then leave him the more alone with his inner communings moreover he was cultivating the society of artists one day in eighteen fifty one he went to the exhibition of paintings given by the young artists of the brooklyn art union he was struck both by the artists and the work they were doing he was pleased to see that others were working for the expression of native themes as he had urged singers and dramatists to do and novelists and painters instead of making portraits of the nobility or the landscapes of palace grounds william mount and walter libby were picturing simple country boys black or white the stamp of class is in this way upon all the fine scenes of the european painters where the subjects are of a proper kind while in this boy of libby's there is nothing to prevent his becoming a president or he added with a sarcastic smile at the current incumbent of that office even an editor of a leading newspaper 
the artists the young bohemians should be encouraged he told the readers of the evening post there are at the present moment ten thousand so-called artists young and old in this country many of whom are working in the dark as it were and without aim they want a strong hand over them here is a case for the imperial sceptre even in america what a glorious result it would give to form of these thousands a close phalanx ardent radical and progressive now they are like the bundle of sticks in the fable and as one by one they have no strength then would not the advancing years foster the growth of a grand and true art here fresh and youthful worthy of this republic and this greatest of the ages the children in the schools he now sees should not be taught merely the arithmetic of the counting-house but something of the quest for beauty nearly all intelligent boys and girls have much of the artist in them and it were beautiful to give them an opportunity of developing it in one of the fine arts but first of all comes the artist he may be bohemian but he is the finest specimen of the race for all that with warm impulsive souls instinctively generous and genial but mean and sneaking never such are these rapidly increasing ones unlike the orthodox sons and daughters of the world in many things yet it is a picturesque unlikeness for it need not argue an absolute miracle if a man differ from the present dead uniformity of society in appearance and opinion and still retain his grace and morals a sunny blessing then say i on the young artist race for the thrift and shrewdness that makes dollars are not everything that we should bow to or yearn for or put before our children as the be-all and the end-all of all human ambition california was still luring thousands away with its elusive gold and mammon in less romantic but more respectable disguise was trying to tempt our young artist at home brooklyn was on a building boom wages were high sales were ready for want of an easier way to make what money he needed whitman for a time turned to his father's trade for the old man was nearing his grave and his hand was losing its cunning jeff was working on the city waterworks and advancing rapidly in his profession as a surveyor george and the other able sons were at work with mr whitman so walt took up the tools of a carpenter building house after house the whitmans would build a residence live in it from one moving day to the next and then sell it as population in the rapidly growing city increased the demand and the price thus they shifted from myrtle avenue to cumberland from cumberland to skillman and then to ryerson and classen the expansion halting they came back near the centre of town to live in eighteen fifty nine and there they remained till the war scattered their family forever but no pressure from the family could induce whitman to put his carpentering above the things that concerned his inner growth in his country's future his big opportunity missed they sighed little understanding the nature of the stake that he was playing for had he amassed a competence at this time in the manner approved by the average american his life would no doubt have been far easier in many ways even his philosophy of life might have incorporated some of the shrewd worldly wisdom of franklin who respected riches as a safeguard of virtue he might have been less inclined to make a virtue of poverty but on the other hand only by convincing himself that he was better off without the respectable responsibilities of wealth could he devote all his energies to that which would lift him by sheer excellence above the plebeian class in which he was born for in spirit he was a noble greek associating with the masters as with friends and equals whenever possible he went to lectures on greek and roman civilization the classical tradition was at this time more congenial to him than the english because it was more distinct though not dead to him it was something to be joyfully apprehended in all its clarity rather than to be absorbed through a multitude of emotional contacts as well as a life about him and this was the more delightful as a precipitant of his own inner purposes since a change was coming over him which above his mere will was to remove him in a sense from the milieu about him remove him into the future rather than into the past his family noticed it but were powerless to effect it or even to get his ear for their criticism of his increasing strangeness 
he would pick up his big soft hat just as a meal was being laid on the table by his mother and sisters and go off on some impulse of his own without explanation or apology returning if need be to eat in solitude night after night he was out at the opera or the theatre atop the stage coaches or studying the life of the city in less conspicuous retreats but the young artists understood him or at least they comprehended that he understood them which was sufficient so they invited him to deliver an address on a march evening in eighteen fifty one he prepared himself carefully rounding out his periods till they were almost poetic playing on just the right emotions to sway the young radical the scorn of conformity and style the reverence for the truly heroic the sublimity of the enduring beauty in the a life or in a picture of life now that he had a select and appreciative audience he could afford to drop the platitudes of the stump speech and the condescending colloquialism whereby he had sought to widen the circle of his newspaper readers among such a people as the americans he began viewing most things with an eye uh, to pecuniary profit more for acquiring than for enjoying or well developing what they acquire ambitious of the physical rather than the intellectual a race to whom matter of fact is everything and the ideal nothing a nation of whom the steam engine is no bad symbol he does a good work who pausing in the way calls to the feverish crowd that in the life we live upon this beautiful earth there may after all be something vaster and better than dress and the table and business and politics that would be his function henceforth to pause in the way and to point as persuasively as he could as defiantly as he must to the beauty of that truth which the orientals had for centuries made the end of their existence having himself tasted of power and of love and found them both more easy to lose than to gain he was making no great sacrifice if with asiatic complacency and artistic subjectiveness he should render himself immune to the cruder slings of outrageous fortune the music was more closely related to his own artistic needs than drama or painting there was one tenor singing in new york at this period whom whitman adored as much as he did the contralto alboni this was bettini whose singing of la favorita he remembered with gratitude to his dying day the time was midsummer a hot evening in august finishing an early supper whitman struck off on foot for the ferry passing the aristocratic heights section on his way there the breeze from the bay met him on the hill so bearing his head and crushing his great soft hat behind him he watched the gorgeous sunset behind the new jersey marshes he might be late but his eye was as hungry as his ear and ere a divine musician was playing a nocturne on the colour organ of the heavens sails of sloops bellied gracefully upon the river with mellower light and deepened shadows and the dark and glistening water formed an undertone to the play of vehement colour above rapidly an insatiable greediness grew within me for brighter and stronger hues oh brighter and stronger still it seemed as if all that the eye could bear were unequal to the fierce ferocity of my soul for intense glowing colour and yet there were the most choice and fervid fires of the sunset in their brilliancy and richness almost terrible have you not too at such a time known the thirst of the eye have you not in like manner while listening to the well-played music of some band like Marinsek's? felt an overwhelming desire for measureless sound a sublime orchestra of myriad orchestras a colossal volume of harmony in which the thunder might roll in its proper place and above it the vast pure tenor the identity of the creative power itself rising through the universe until the boundless and unspeakable capacities of that mystery the human soul should be filled to the uttermost and the problem of human cravingness be satisfied and destroyed a romantic nature is this and conscious now of its romantic needs but music could solace him the music of donizetti and the music that would soon be his own this very hunger for the sweet august voice of creation would in time be somewhat appeased by a poem he was to compose partly in memory of this evening one of the grandest nature poems to flow through the soul of man proud music of the storm now the great organ sounds tremulous while underneath as the hid footholds of the earth on which arising rest and leaping forth depend all shapes of beauty grace and strength all hues we know green blades of grass and warbling birds children that gamble and play the clouds of heaven above the strong bass stands and its pulsations intermit not 
bathing supporting merging all the rest maternity of all the rest and with it every instrument in multitudes the players playing all the world's musicians the solemn hymns and masses rousing adoration all passionate heart chants sorrowful appeals the measureless sweet vocalists of ages and for their solvent setting earth's own diapason of winds and woods and mighty ocean waves a new composite orchestra binder of years and climes tenfold renewer as of the far-back days the poets tell the paradiso the straying thence the separation long but now the wandering done and man and art with nature fused again the sun sank the colours faded and whitman coming back to reality reminded himself that the opera was yet before him walt ascended to the balcony in such a setting he was to write many a poem to the inspiration of not to the tune of the opera just as he was to compose many another at home while jeff played his violin in an adjoining room below him chattered the society of the metropolis but he was not conscious of any envy of that society to his reader he said come i will not talk to you as one of the superficial saunter here because it is the fashion who take opera glasses with them and make you sick with shallow words upon the sublimest and most spiritual of the arts i will trust you with confidence i will divulge secrets the delicious music of the favourite is upon us gradually we see not this huge amphitheatre nor the cropped heads and shaven faces of the men nor cold scuttle bonnets nor hear the rattle of fans nor even the ill-bred chatter we see the groves of a spanish convent and the procession of monks we hear the chant now dim and faint then swelling loudly and then again dying away among the trees the aged superior and the young fernando we see in answer to the old man's rebukes and questions we hear the story of love then whitman recounted the old familiar story of the young fernando a novice whose heart was given to the things of the spirit but whose young body coloured his visions with dreams of woman's delicious loveliness he went out into a strange world to seek her he found her at the court and she loved him in return serving well the state in war he claimed her hand in marriage as a guerdon from his sovereign too late he discovered that she was the favoured mistress of that sovereign deposed only by a recent order from the pope broken-hearted and disillusioned he returned to his mission when his love finds him and explains that she had told all in a letter he had never received he forgives her and she dies now we approach the close of the legend we see again the dark groves of the convent up through the venerable trees peal the strains of the chanting voices o oh, sweet music of donizetti how can men hesitate what rank to give you with his pale face at the foot of the cross kneels the returned novice his breast filled with devouring anguish his eyes showing the death that had fallen upon his soul the strains of death too come plaintively from his lips never before did you hear such gushing sorrow poured forth like the ebbing flood from a murdered heart is it for peace he prays with that appealing passion is it the story of his own sad wreck he utters listen pure and vast that voice now rises as on clouds to the heaven where it claims audience now firm and unbroken it spreads like an ocean around us a welcome that i know not the mere language of the mere words in which the melody is embodied as all words are mean before the language of true music the artist and the poet answered the artist on the castle garden stage and knew himself to belong to the same race as souls only understand souls composers mighty maestros and you sweet singers of old lands soprani tenori bassi to you a new bard carolling in the west obeisance sends his love he sang a score of years later but through the post he sent his appreciation at the time thanks great artist for one at least it is no extravagance to say you have justified his ideal of the loftiest of the arts thanks limner of the spirit of life and hope and peace of the red fire of passion the cavernous vacancy of despair and the black pall of the grave i write as i feel and i feel that there are not a few who will pronounce a yes to my own confession never had whitman written so enthusiastically of the drama or of any other music was it indeed the power of bettini even so how could the young music critic judge of that performance unless he had passed through the storms of passion and the fires of painful loss himself had he already lost by death or eternal separation his own favourite and now first comprehended how much solace there might be for him if like heine he might make a song out of his great pain 
the stranger casually meeting the large rough figure of whitman dressed in workman's clothes the neck of his red flannel shirt wide open his pace slow rather than elastic would not have suspected that his body was probably the most sensitive organism in the city his sense of hearing and smell exceptionally acute and his touch so highly developed that personal force went out of him to each contact of the hand with properly sensitive hands mine is no callous shell i've instant conductors all over me whether i pass or stop they seize every object and lead it harmlessly through me the observer would still less have imagined what a delicate mental and emotional organism was within responsive to suggestions of childhood's trailing clouds of glory as likely as jeanne d'arc to commune with spirits and to believe them and into this organism emerging from the protracted discord of adolescence so common in men of genius there was soon to come a harmony which if it did not eliminate the fundamental paradoxes which composed this temperament would reduce them to a state of balanced peace but this could never have happened without a certain enervation a certain result in weakness or failure elsewhere and had there not been a compensating objectivity an animal delight in sense experiences a child's unreflecting wonder at outward shows before telling the story of that inner change we must take a glimpse of whitman in the presence of his fellow-man and of nature whitman had a peculiar genius for friendship which grew in proportion as he abandoned the ordinary strife for the ordinary prizes it was akin to the friendship man has for nature impartial receptive kindly and critical like bryant he loved to watch humanity pass by on his petty personal missions himself remaining inert the while it was not diogenes in his tub seeking to reduce experience to the formulae of philosophy but rather the open-eyed child who has forgotten to grow up he was never tired by repetition of the same sight provided it were natural or human and nowhere could a man of this type find sights more to his taste than on broadway the grand processions of presidents and generals distinguished foreign visitors ambassadors and artists all passed there yet common humanity was sufficient on any fine day to warrant a two-hour ride on an omnibus before the day of horse-cars these omnibuses were relatively as numerous as taxicabs are to-day it would almost have been possible to walk on their tops from the astor house to wall street and handsome stages they were too drawn by two or four horses and ornamented by the brushes of the best decorators passengers entered by a side door a door at the rear passing their fare up to the driver through a hole in the roof and those drivers were a race of originals strange natural quick-eyed and wondrous race a study and a delight for rabelais cervantes shakespeare or whitman powerful uneducated persons they were eating drinking loving women telling vivid stories with the mimicry of born raconteur quick to know a man from a nincompoop their stage lines like their own nicknames were individual and picturesque as no mode of transportation will ever be again the yellow birds the red birds the knickerbocker not to mention the lines named for broadway fifth avenue fourth avenue and so forth one day whitman who knew them all set down in his notebook the names of as many drivers as he could recall shortly dead body let loose gray ball christmas johnny doughnuts poggy codmouth black jack broadway jack dressmaker harlem charlie pochuck dry doc john raggedy jack smith's monkey emigrant buffalo wild man of borneo elephant baltimore charlie blind sam santa anna long boston pretty ike mountaineer rosie what a great overgrown boy's world it was at first they were a little suspicious of whitman he knew so much about books but when one winter a driver lay ill and whitman quietly took his place on that driver's box to support his family they knew he was of the right breed then the whole race of drivers with the clannishness of boys admitted him to their fellowship he would stand at the curb and a driver would draw up casting at him a friendly and inquiring glance of invitation without a word if he were so minded at the moment whitman would seize the handle and swing up with a springing and elastic motion to light on the off side of the box as quietly he put it as a hawk swoops to its nest no wheel on broadway was rubber tired and the street was paved with cobblestones so that the din was a continuous rumble over which no voice could carry far sometimes feeling exuberant he would shout passages from richard the second or homer over the heads of the pedestrians or he would listen to the stories of or the life history of his host 
at other times he would brood upon the panorama his dull eyes fixed in a kind of half-dream interrupted only by the frequent salutes he must give boy-like with raised arm and upright hand drew four out of every five of the drivers who passed him it was an ideal vantage point for a poet who wished not only to observe but without breaking his solitude to be personally in contact with the living stream his soul was fishing in in return for their uniform courtesy there was little whitman could give these drivers save his friendship for they could receive little but when one of them died he could at least write a fitting requiem and place it in his portfolio doubtless the only poem ever written on the theme a reminiscence of the vulgar fate a frequent sample of the life and death of workmen each after his kind gold dash of waves at the ferry wharf posh and ice in the river half frozen mud in the streets a grey discouraged sky overhead the short last daylight of december a hearse and stages the funeral of an old broadway stage driver the cortege mostly driver steady to the trot to the cemetery dull rattles duly rattles the death bell the gate is past the new dug grave is halted at the living alight the hearse uncloses the coffin is passed out lowered and settled the whip is laid on the coffin the earth is swiftly shovelled in the mound above is flattered with the spade silence a minute no one moves or speaks it is done he is decently put away is there anything more he was a good fellow free-mouthed quick-tempered or not bad-looking ready with life or death for a friend fond of women gambled ate hearty drank hearty had known what it was to be flushed grew low-spirited toward the last sickened was helped by contribution died aged forty-one years and that was his funeral thumb extended finger uplifted apron cape gloves strap wept feather clothes whip carefully chosen boss spotter starter hostler somebody loafing on you you loafing on somebody headway man before and man behind good day's work bad day's work pet stock mean stock first out last out turning in at night to think that these are so much and so not to other drivers and he there takes no interest in them and still as always walt frequented the ferry boats the stages of the river he wanted to know everything about the boat there was no plan no conscious selection in his acquisition of information and there would be as little rejection when he sat down to write tell me all about it boys he would say for these are the real things i cannot get out of books and when they told him he remembered never missing the technical phrases of the many occupations he studied tiring of long reading in the libraries or of composition at home he would seek his fairy friends and tell them stories repeat what he had read or make sharp criticisms of the events of the day when there were few passengers sometimes he would sing snatches from the operas or recite from shakespeare in his best manner when he had awakened an interest in some writer homer or shakespeare or epictetus he would say to his young friend and willing pupil my boy you must read more of this for yourself cramming his own volume into the pocket of the sailor's monkey jacket whitman was always fascinated by expositions indeed the plan of his first book was to make an exhibition not only of an individual as such but as a repository of all the heterogeneous displays his age and land had afforded him when on july fourteenth eighteen fifty three the crystal palace fair was opened in new york whitman began his visits which were to be kept up through a whole year so curious and persistent was he in his study of whatever especially interested him that he excited the attention of the police who exercised particular surveillance over him it was beyond the intelligence of a simple policeman to comprehend how a roughly dressed visitor could stand for hours before thorwaldin's marbles unless he were premeditating a theft when some time later walt made the acquaintance of these same policemen they confided to him to his amusement their former fears and precautions but women did not belong altogether in the city his birthplace was in the country and there he spent a part of almost every summer if he were editing a newspaper he would like bryant leave it to shift without him sending back correspondence while he was away this getting back to nature was quite as important as an element in keeping him sane and wholesome as was his getting close to the humanity he was now living to serve and enjoy it is one o'clock on a fine day in the summer or early fall leisurely pushing his way into the throng gathered about the platforms at the foot of atlantic avenue at the hour for the long island railroad train to start on his slow daily trip to greenport whitman carpet-bag in hand makes his way into one of the primitive high-wheeled coaches 
raucous newsboys friends shouting farewells as if for a hazardous journey or an indefinite separation irish women vending peaches and oranges the crude locomotive filling the air with smoke and giving forth ominous rattles a symbol of america indeed the bell rings the train starts and ambitious youngsters seeking final sales run along the, to poke their wares through the windows but soon the scene is lost as the train plunges into the darkness of a tunnel cold and damp fifth avenue is past the hills of greenwood cemetery and the site of gowanus are left behind the residential section of bedford with its ample shade trees is passed and the train pulls into east new york it is or was a boom town battening its hopes on the speculations bred of the united states bank to which jackson's veto put such a summary in whitman was himself asked years before to go there and start a village newspaper but he seems to have had an instinct for the future the next stop is jamaica whitman can remember when it was nothing but a long street lined with stores and taverns a stopping-place for the market wagons making their way from the island to the metropolis at twenty he lived there himself teaching school a few miles down the road and helping james brenton familiarly call dr franklin get out the long island democrat he lived with the brentons but his fondness for loafing on his back under the apple trees looking up at the sun was to be longer remembered in the household than anything he ever wrote for the paper yet he contributed a good deal puerile melancholy rhymes on death and human vanity or ambitious philosophizing about the nature of man and the duty of brotherly love he was already given to moods not unlike a trance and he cultivated the mystical outlook on life yet at jamaica he was ready on occasion to cast all care aside and make one of a party to go sailing or clamming to the great south bay or in winter spearing eels through holes in the ice those were happy carefree days filled with healthful body-building exercise far from the city with its woes and responsibilities at Mineola, the train stops and detaches a car to be drawn by horses two miles south to hampstead there too whitman once taught school for a few months and wrote for a local paper sweeping southeast the turnpike threads the south side towns he knew and loved so well in his youth babylon pak jog and the hamptons there at the hamptons when a boy he all but saw a steamer wrecked its terror so horrified his impressionable soul that he ran away for miles directly to the north lies the village of jericho birthplace of elias hicks a quaker community and nearby is cold spring the homestead of his dutch ancestry the van velsors in that neighbourhood was another of his many schools the farm which was once his father's lies a little farther to the east near the high ground at west hills a stronghold of democracy in a fertile and well-wooded region east of jamaica along the railroad which runs through the centre of the island extends a great plain sterile covered with skill calf and huckleberry bushes and pasturing hundreds of milch cows as the train puffs along in the late evening whitman can make out the clanking of copper cowbells as the kind file slowly homeward land monopoly keeps it from cultivation whereas with the fish fertilizer being used by the farmers along the south shore it might otherwise give homesteads to thousands as a democrat whitman naturally protests against such a parceling out of the gifts of nature the farther east he rides the worse the country looks the more deserted scrub oak and pine everywhere and now and then as darkness comes on he can make out the fires of the charcoal burners but the stations are merely a few ragged houses often unoccupied a few lazily tended gardens a few nondescript barefooted children now and then he catches sight of roads which lead to places he knows roads he has traversed as a lad hunting adventure in a wilderness all his own some of these roads lead to the schools he has taught and remind him of youthful friends and of evenings in the homes of sturdy self-reliant farmer folk up there at huntington he started his first newspaper and delivered its weekly issues through the whole region on saturdays riding his own pony the scrub oak wilderness is devoid of interest however save that supplied by memories of his youth and now he has an ex excellent opportunity to take stock of his life he is in his early thirties full of ambition full of the love of life and yet is he not a failure he has had many opportunities but where are they now he has fought in many causes but which of them has he won was he not in fact merely fighting some contrary tendency in himself in each case has he won the fight for self-mastery he does not cannot know but he is sure of one thing by so much as he has been growing through all these experiences he is the more indifferent to the outward fates of his life moreover he is becoming conscious that he is different from other men in his ambitions his affections his powers he cannot tell what he will do but in one way or another it shall be to learn the art of living more largely than the rest more largely because he will live less for himself 
these simple folk with their unconstrained mentality give him courage they represent the things which endure simple personal qualities and like them are the hardy fishermen with whom he will consort when he reaches the terminus of the road at greenport having come to the country to escape the city he is displeased to find the boarding-houses there trying to make city tourists feel at home with pianos mahogany chairs fashionable carpets and flummery in general what he desires is simplicity cleanliness and plenty of wholesome country fair nor can he understand the value of coming to the country as most of his fellow new yorkers do to keep out of the sun and air they evidently preserve all the ceremoniousness of the city dress regularly for dinner fear to brown their faces with the sun or wet their shoes with the dew or let the wind derange the sleek precision of their hair such people unable to stand up with dignity or ease when stripped of the corseting of convention interest whitman before a background of wild nature even less than when they appeared in evening costume at castle garden he determines to go out among real persons however humble seeking what they may teach him about the mystery the fascinating heterogeneity of life it was the farmer folk like the mechanics and stage drivers of new york with independence enough to make their lives fit their personalities that whitman counted on as the bulwark of the republic he had had enough experience in politics to cause him to doubt that the voice of the people taken numerically is the voice of god but he believed that the people properly addressed would recognize that voice with the communistic experiments of fourier of brook farm of fruitlands he would have nothing to do for he knew that he could not endure to live in any standardized society or even to work in a factory or with an organization wherein division of labor and responsibility would ultimately divide the man as well he dreamed of the industrial exploitation of the country but in those dreams was no room for the factory system wherein the rapidly increasing use of steam was already creating a new set of problems for government a new barrier between the north and the south end of section six section seven of whitman and interpretation in narrative by emery holloway this librivox recording is in the public domain book three part two the spirit speaks though there were few books in the whitman home and though he was not now receiving review copies as a newspaper editor we are not to suppose that he was reading no more he was especially fond of magazines english or american caring little if they were second-hand and a bit old what he wanted was information about the parts of the world his eye had never explored knowledge of how the rest of mankind lived or had lived long ago what religions what art and architecture what ideas of immortality they had he was interested to in those newer subjects just beginning to be taught in the schools chemistry astronomy physiology he would tear out the magazine article stuff it into his big pocket and take it with him to the seashore or to the shade of some hillside to ponder over and annotate it at his leisure always feeling free to gloss what he read with comments of his own he frequented old bookstores too for there he could always find cheap copies of the classics his masters the enchiridion of epictetus filled him with a sense of personal sufficiency thrilled him with the conception of a sage giving moral lessons to his fellows in words fitly chosen homer sophocles shakespeare the bible and a little later dante all kept him company on the deserted but far from lonely shores of coney island or in some sequestered wood thither he would go alone for the weekend taking with him a book to read and paper on which to jot down such inspirations as came to him for by this time he knew certainly that he was himself about to bring forth a book of some sort even when carpentering he would slip into his lunch basket a book to read at the noon hour one fortunate day the book selected was the essays of emerson it proved to be the needed precipitant as it has been to many a young man and woman since the mind and soul of whitman the american lay fallow and ready for the seed sown by the germinative mind of emerson 
for the latter was no dry pedantic formulator of a philosophic system he was a concrete american interpretation of the abstractions of german transcendentalists and eastern mystics he sold the idea of the inner life of man to certain classes of the american people but this he did more by poetizing it than by rationalizing it from such persuasiveness one may turn away but against it argument is futile emerson spoke of things that he knew and there is no way to deny his testimony as such on testimony by word or life every religious or spiritual movement advances or recedes creeds and institutions but mark its progress and consolidate its gains now when a man has observed the world attentively a long while if he be not a mere child lost in unreflective wonder its diversity and apparent contradiction transferred to his inner consciousness begin to embarrass him lo soul selects some simple material end in life such as amassing a fortune or adding pleasure to pleasure seeking thus a simple solution of their existence by denying all else but more heroic minds crave a unity which will reconcile this diversity making a beautiful cosmos of what to the senses is but chaos if the intellect predominate over the imagination the man becomes a philosopher achieving peace of mind in proportion to the universality of his analysis of the world he has known he discards what cannot by his scientific method be reduced to a semblance of form but if he be a man of imagination sensitive to much that can never pass through the conscious mind to be dissected by the blunt scalpels of the reason he becomes a poet then he seeks in some form of mysticism a solvent and a setting for it all and this is what emerson and all the transcendentalists were doing and had been doing for twenty years nor were they pioneers in this attitude toward life even in america though they were the first to unite the artist with the priest the lover of beauty with the lover of a beautiful life mysticism has always flourished as a protest when formalism legalism unimaginative creed worship have too long repressed the aspiring loving soul of man and when in the eighteenth century the great awakening came producing methodism the religion of personal experience to be preached eloquently and with popular success in england by the wesleys and in america by whitefield jonathan edwards and the circuit writers of the frontier it had a very definite doctrine of mystical union with god the phrase by which it was known to-day seems as obsolete as the doctrine itself it was suggestively called by john wesley the witness of the spirit religious experience was considered not fully consummated until the believer knew for himself that he had been transfigured by a glimpse of the unseen spirit of life but in methodism unlike the nihilism of gautama or the feudalism of brahma and unlike some of the daintier forms of transcendentalism this inner ecstasy was not to be enjoyed in monastic asceticism but was definitely related to a life of humanitarian service in this respect it had much in common with the practice of the quakers it is not difficult to understand then how well prepared was whitman in his early thirties for such an experience he had been brought up to believe in the inner light he had that repose that receptivity that sluggishness of the motor and muscular organism that is conducive to quietism and to visions it was as if our world were throbbing with radio waves bearing hints of another and diviner world capable of being caught only by the most sensitive receiving set and whitman the silent man was always listening for signals from this far country when a friend of his unable to comprehend the mystery of mysticism finally experienced a sort of illumination during a period of convalescence his spirit filtered by the sickness of his body and for the time ceasing to struggle with life he remarked the fact to walt who replied i suppose a poet is always convalescent he too had ceased to sweat through fog with linguists and contenders moreover he had known love which when pure more perfectly than any other human experience symbolizes the transports of the exalté 
for as in love man achieves at least a momentary release from the prison of the body through the meeting and merging of two souls so with the mystic the individual soul seems to itself to be swallowed up in the absolute soul of the universe our story of walt whitman could not go on without such a digression as this for the reader would otherwise be sure at this point to lose his man in a cloud and ever after doubt that whitman was a normal person unlike such mystics as swedenborg st francis and st paul however whitman was unwilling to surrender his grasp on reality entirely to the control of these experiences he thought that a mysticism which cannot transfigure man's human lot is if not fanatical at least useless and cowardly but it should not be difficult to believe that mysticism itself is under law as truly as is poetic inspiration or musical genius let us now go away from familiar sights and sounds with only the constant symbolism of nature about us and look over the young poet's shoulder as he turns the pages of his emerson he had already known emerson's writings he perhaps had heard him lecture in brooklyn in eighteen fifty and read his representative men in that year but there is a time to read emerson and whitman's time came in eighteen fifty three or eighteen fifty four it was then that emerson brought the simmering pot to a boil the superiority of emerson's writings he said is in their character they mean something he may be obscure but he is certain any other of the best american writers has in general a clearer style has more of the received grace and ease is less questioned and forbidden than he makes a handsomer appearance in the society of the books sells better passes his time more apparently in the popular understanding yet there is something in the solitary specimen of new england that outvies them all he has what none else has he does what none else does he pierces the crusts that envelop the secrets of life he joins on equal terms the few great sages and original seers he represents the free man america the individual he represents the gentleman no teacher or poet of old times or modern times has made a better report of manly and womanly qualities heroism chastity temperance his words shed light to the best souls they do not admit of argument as a sprig from the pine tree or a glimpse anywhere into the daylight belittles all artificial flower-work and all the painted scenery of theatres so are live words in a book compared to cunningly composed words a few among men soon perhaps to become many will enter easily into emerson's meanings by those he will be well beloved the flippant writer the orthodox critic the numbers of good or indifferent imitators will not comprehend him to them he will indeed be a transcendentalist a writer of sunbeams and moonbeams a strange and unapproachable person what were the written words that could affect the well-read whitman like that as he lounges on the grass turning the pages slowly pondering the passages here and there and compounding them with his own experience we note a few enough to suggest the tenor of them all man is a stream whose source is hidden we live in succession in division in parts in particles meantime within man is the soul of the whole the wise silence the universal beauty of which every part and particle is equally related the eternal one the soul in man is not an organ but animates and exercises all the organs it is not a function like the power of memory of calculation of comparison but uses them as hands and feet it is not a faculty but a light it is not the intellect or the will but the master of the intellect and the will it is the background of our being in which they live an immensity not possessed and that cannot be possessed when it breathes through his intellect it is genius when it breathes through his will it is virtue when it flows through his affection it is love the soul circumscribes all things as i have said it contradicts all experience in like manner it abolishes time and space the soul looks steadily forwards creating a world before her leaving worlds behind her the soul knows only the soul the web of events is the flowing robe in which she is clothed in youth we are mad for persons childhood and youth see all the world in them but the larger experiences of man discovers the identical nature appearing in them all there is a certain wisdom in humanity which is common to the greatest men with the lowest and which our ordinary education often labours to silence and obstruct we are wise in that we know if we will not interfere with our thought but will act entirely or see how the thing stands in god we know the particular thing in everything and every man 
a certain tendency to insanity has always attended the opening of the religious sense in men as if they had been blasted with excess of light much of the wisdom of the world is not wisdom and the most illuminated class of men are no doubt superior to literary fame and are not writers among the multitude of scholars and authors we feel no hallowing presence we are sensible of a knack and skill rather than of inspiration they have a light and know not whence it comes and call it their own their talent is some exaggerated faculty some overgrown member so that their strength is a disease but genius is religious it is a larger imbibing of the common heart the great poet makes us feel our own wealth and then we think less of his compositions this energy does not descend into individual life on any other condition than entire possession it comes to the lowly and simple it comes to whomsoever will put off what is foreign and proud it comes as insight it comes as serenity and grandeur those words were written as with authority and not as mere scribes might mumble a tradition whitman could not doubt them when their proof lay in the strange sense of peace and power which flowed over him he had been thinking along this line for many years but now it was the hour for thinking properly speaking to cease something ineffable happened to him description here is of necessity but suggestion since the language in which he must speak to other men was not fashioned for such uses but he recalled it thus i believe in you my soul the other i am must not abase itself to you and you must not be abased to the other loaf with me on the grass loose the stop from your throat nor words nor music or rhyme i want nor custom or lecture not even the best only the lull i like the hum of your valved voice i mind how once we lay such a transparent summer morning how you settled your head athwart my hips and gently turned over upon me and parted the shirt from my bosom bone and plunged your tongue to my bare stripped heart and reached till you felt my beard and reached till you held my feet swiftly arose and spread around me the peace and knowledge that pass all the argument of the earth and i know that the hand of god is the promise of my own and i know that the spirit of god is the brother of my own and that all the men ever born are also my brothers and the women my sisters and lovers and that a kelson of the creation is love and limitless are leaves stiff were drooping in the fields and brown ants in the little wells beneath them and mossy scabs of the worm fence heaps stones elder mullein and pokeweed the sexual imagery in this description a form of symbolism very common in religious writings reminds us that the mystic is in love in love with the universe and that without the insincerity we associate with the charlatan in love with an illusion if one will yet illusions are the creators of reality in the cooler light of reason it may come to no more than this the mystic's god is a sudden crystallization of his hitherto nebulous subconscious mind he sees everything transfigured because he is not really looking at the so-called outer universe at all but at its reflection or refractions in his own glorified soul yet since all religious mystics see the same order in the world an order in which love is law for all men thus to hypnotize themselves would make far simpler the outward adjustment of their ideas and interests by supplying each with a motive for adjustment in the interest of all but could a man particularly a man with no more ascetic nature than whitman had inherited live half a lifetime in that key no man can make tents in which to dwell for long on the mounts of his own rare transfiguration few have such disciplined wills as long to hold even a living memory of life's highest moments but at least it is something to have definitely appeared to have made terms with one's deeper self with whitman the trance was to return more than once but perhaps never would he again see it in this first glory of mid manhood but one glimpse of heaven is after all as good as eternity and increasing art in the remembered light of that high noon might gradually perfect the expression of what he had seen twenty years later through the lips of columbus whose faith also had been rewarded by the discovery of a new world the poet offers a prayer to his muse his god i am too full of woe haply i may not live another day i cannot rest o god i cannot eat or drink or sleep till i put forth myself my prayer once more to thee breathe bathe myself 
once more in thee commune with thee report myself once more to thee thou knowest my years entire my life my long and crowded life of active work not adoration merely thou knowest the prayers and vigils of my youth thou knowest my manhood's solemn and visionary meditations thou knowest how i before i commenced i devoted all to come to thee thou knowest i have in age ratified all those vows and strictly kept them thou knowest i have not once lost nor faith nor ecstasy in thee in shackles prisoned in disgrace repining not accepting all from thee as duly come from thee oh i am sure they really came from thee the urge the ardour the unconquerable will the potent felt interior command stronger than words a message from the heavens whispering to me even in sleep these sped me on when isaiah the son of amos greatest of hebrew mystics before jesus had a similar overpowering vision of the pure god he worshipped in which the whole earth was full of his glory his reaction was one of personal unworthiness woe is me he cried for i am undone because i am a man of unclean lips and i dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for mine eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts but when his lips had been purged and made eloquently by a live coal from off the mystical altar he was ready for the commission implicit in every such vision also i heard the voice of the lord saying whom shall i send and who will go for us then said i here i am send me whitman had been reading isaiah on the barren shores of coney island and his quaker education created in his mind no prejudice against the doctrine of continued revelation he doubtless now saw perhaps in bewilderment that he too was among the prophets but might he not argue that he lacked isaiah's commanding style speech is the twin of my vision it is unequal to measure itself it provokes me prefer ever it says sarcastically walt you contain enough why don't you let it out then if he should caution himself that the irregularities of his personal life unfitted him to bear such a message yet there stood st augustine and st paul and many another saint to answer him moreover it was not a mere repetition of older prophecies that he thought to be the need of his day and land the modern man was to be neither a monk nor a sentimental philanthropist he would live his message rather than preach it and to live it he must be complete as god made him were such a germinant vision as this that came to whitman planted in the arid soil of a pious asceticism as so often it had been only impotent and visionary results could grow from it but if sown in a well-developed intellectual and emotional nature while it might put forth some ugly weeds unfamiliar to transcendental herbariums it would certainly in time make glad the soil with leaves of wholesome democratic grass that were better than growing lilies in a hothouse whitman's own experience had taught him that evil is only the shadow of good the coarse soil from which good may spring but if as we shall see he was a caresser of life wherever flowing and no ascetic he nevertheless addressed himself to his task in heroic manner what he says to the young poet aspiring to sing worthily of america he had done or was to do himself love the earth and sun and the animals despise riches give alms to every one that asks stand up for the stupid and crazy devote your income and labour to others hate tyrants argue not concerning god have patience and indulgence toward people take off your hat to nothing known or unknown or to any man or number of men go freely with powerful uneducated persons and with the young men and with the mothers of families read those leaves in the open air every season of the year of your life re-examine all you have been told at school or church or any book dismiss whatever insult your own soul and your very flesh shall be a great poem and have the richest fluency not only in its words but in the silent lines of its lips and face and between the lashes of your eyes and in every motion and joint of your body but is the illumination of genius a cause a new creation or an effect of hidden causes just now rising like a volcanic mountain above the level of the conscious sea there can be no doubt that the genius himself particularly if his imagination be great and his caution small at first looks upon it as a personal incarnation of something supernatural his first impulse is to fall down and worship this great i am but if so we are dealing with religion with facts above scientific scrutiny with an example not to be emulated we are dealing with mythology and are in need of a priest not a biographer after whitman for all his faith in the spirit world he did not believe any less in the dominance of law even there 
every one has sought rest in slumber after a day of earnest but fruitless mental struggle only to waken in the morning with the clarifying point of view uppermost in his mind some fairy has been labouring for him while he slept but though we do not know the method of that magic we now know that the fairy burrows into the subconscious brain waiting only for the abandonment of vain surface tension in order to put forth in his service his own larger powers of perception and memory but the poet less distrustful of his intuitions than others is served by them even when he is awake and what he speaks he speaks with conviction because the whole man communicates with the reader it may even be to the surprise of that fragment of his own mind which is under conscious control this is what emerson meant when calling for a new race of american thinkers scholars to transfigure her life and to objectify her deeper self he declared that such a leader must be not a thinking man merely but man thinking it is doubtful if the muse in her visitations ever adds anything in the way of language or special knowledge or artistic talent kubla khan might indeed be composed word by word in an opium dream but it is significant that nothing like it ever was composed by a man who had not cultivated a sense of verbal harmony and who had not been reading books of oriental mystery and charm emerson was right in declaring that the soul is not a faculty but a light to reveal our faculties the divine fire may indicate the pleasure of heaven in consuming the goods upon the altar but it is the man's task not the god's to heap the sacrifice there and it would indeed make the life of genius more immoral to expect any great world lighting fire upon an altar that could boast but a few soggy and malodorous sticks upon it in this respect as whitman says all that a person does or thinks is of consequence to comprehend the literary offspring of whitman's rare experience then we must go back a little in order to examine not only the efforts he had been making to produce the book which from the age of twenty had been the secret dream of his life but to discover also if we can the half-conscious motives which supplied the energy behind his work aside from his normal human ambition for literary political and personal honors the adolescent manifestations of a great ambition whitman had developed two cardinal desires one was for himself one for his country they were so fundamentally interrelated that they must be satisfied together or not at all had he been a sensualist he might with his rare capacity for sense enjoyment have withdrawn into the arcanum of some private lust or taking nature for his mistress might have learned to dwell as a hermit in some simple walden untouched by the fate of his book or the fortunes of his country but the price he had to pay for drawing so heavily as he did upon the life of his age for his personal growth and joy as well as for the epic significance of his poetry was that he should be tied to that larger life by the umbilical cord of his genius never to be severed in a sense this meant that whatever he might learn or learn to think in the ordinary method of self-taught men he must always remain as he said a child very old the dominant note in his personal ambition once he had passed the fluctuating melancholy moods of a prolonged adolescence was to be himself a simple separate person developing his emotions his tastes his sense of expression his unbounded curiosity his hunger for love and friendship to the utmost whatever this might cost in worldly success in time or in the comfort which attends conformity for his country as we have seen in his editorials he craved the same experience she must be independent not merely politically and materially but in her spirit her drama her music her literature her genius and with all her diversity she must at whatever hazard be a union capable of preserving the opportunity of each section and individual and ultimately passing these blessings to the less favoured nations of the earth he would be at peace with himself only when these two ambitions should coalesce into one and a way be open for their accomplishment through some task suited to his powers undeterred by the failure or apparent failure of the particular reforms he had fought for and advised he attacked the problem at its root he quietly set about a modern image-making creation which like a pillar of fire in the wilderness would give purpose and direction to the aimless blinded wasting spiritual efforts of his people when this could have its perfect work through a new race of writers ploughing up in earnest the interminable average fallows of humanity not good government merely in the common sense then at last the state would be the people democracy would be a spiritual reality as well as a political dream and by controlling the ballads of the nation the men of vision might easily control its laws 
the conception of such a life-work was worthy of a genius the motive behind its worthy of a saint lurking back after thirty years of effort in this direction he calmly described it as a feeling or ambition to articulate and faithfully express in literary or poetic form and uncompromisingly my own physical emotional moral intellectual and aesthetic personality in the midst of and telling the momentous spirit and facts of its immediate days and of current america and to exploit that personality identified with place and date in a far more candid and comprehensive sense than in any hitherto poem or book but a man must be possessed by a spirit which raises him above timidity and personal pride to dare a thing like that and here lies the significance of whitman's mystical experience fusing his deep desires perhaps likewise the unrealized desires of the race of which he was a part in a subconscious manner which relieved him of the doubts that properly attached to the results of our fallible conscious cerebration i fulfilled in that an imperious conviction he declared and the commands of my nature as total and irresistible as those which make the sea flow or the globe revolve no wonder that he should take nature as the standard and the judge of his message and his art and seek to catch in his dithyrams the rhythmic surge of the sea at about the age of thirty whitman had begun to jot down in little notebooks some of which have been preserved incoherent ideas figures of speech that had struck his fancy descriptions of his ideal man his ideal country and yet he had no plan no special inspiration though with an instinct common to all artists he felt that something would come of these experiments his first rule for composition was be simple and clear be not occult his language was always to be more or less racy and concrete but he was to find that he had things to report which could only be suggested so that when the work was finally done he could declare i have not been afraid of the charge of obscurity because human thought poetry or melody must leave dim escapes and outlets must possess a certain fluid aerial character akin to space itself obscure to those of little or no imagination but indispensable to the highest purposes poetic style when addressed to the soul is less definite form outline sculpture and becomes vista music half tints and even less than half tints so far had he gone beyond his patronizing review of carlyle describing the superiority of the true noble expanded american character over the gentlemanly products of european and oriental feudalism he obviously was looking in a mirror as he wrote it is to be illimitably proud independent self-possessed generous and gentle it is to accept nothing except what is equally free and eligible to anybody else it is to be poor rather than rich but to prefer death sooner than any mean dependence he took very literally the jeffersonian doctrine that in a democracy the individual citizen is the ultimate governor should carry himself with the finished and haughty bearing of the greatest ruler and proprietor adding i never yet knew how it felt to think i stood in the presence of my superior so the quaker was trained to compensate himself for his humility before god by standing hatted and high-headed before kings unaware it may be that such an affection only confessed an inferiority complex his long brooding on the surface phantasmagory of life and nature had taught him the secret of the sympathetic imagination that a man is only interested in anything when he identifies himself with it and that by such identification the universal and fluid soul impounds within itself not only all good characters and heroes but the distorted characters murderers thieves and even the inanimate creation this oriental straying out of himself to dwell comprehendingly in the lives of others caused him to be always conscious of myself as to my soul and i and thus a glorious sense of wealth came over him known only to imaginative lovers for the wisest soul knows that no object can really be owned by one man or woman any more than another it was something worth teaching something he had for many years wished to teach but how such perception cannot be communicated by teaching i will not be a great philosopher and found any school and build it with iron pillars and gather the young men around me and make them my disciples as his greek masters had done that new superior churches and politics should come but i will take each man and woman of you to the window and open the shutters and the sash and my left arm shall hook you around the waist and my right shall point you to the endless and beginningless road along whose sides are crowded the rich cities of all living philosophy 
and oval gates that pass you into fields of clover and landscapes clumped with sassafras and orchards of good apples and every breath through your mouth shall be of a new perfumed and elastic air which is love not i not god can travel this road for you there was doubtless much self-will and stubbornness and whitman in all he did but there was at this period little conscious selfishness he looked longingly for a messiah whose coming into the world of democracy might be comparable to the advent of the religious teachers of antiquity but he was not conscious of seeking such a role as a means of personal aggrandizement yet the moment he could clearly envision the role he began to feel like earnest in the legend of the great stone face that he must himself be the deliverer why he cried can we not see beings who by the manliness and transparency of their natures disarm the entire world and bring one and all to his side their side as friends and believers can no father beget or mother conceive a man-child so entire and elastic that whatever action he do or whatever syllable he speak it shall be melodious to all creatures and none shall be an exception to the universal and affectionate yes of the earth he waited for some modern orpheus whose lyre taught of nature might make even the trees to dance when he played then in the notebook comes his first strumming of the instrument so mysteriously slipped into his own hands i am the poet of slaves and of the masters of slaves i am the poet of the body and i am the poet of the soul i go with the slaves of the earth equally with the masters and i will stand between the masters and the slaves entering into both so that both shall understand me alike this is the rare democratic man averaging high and low by reducing all to the level of their common spiritual heritage pride and sympathy equally necessary in a democracy so unite in the genuine poet that he may celebrate his own experiences and those of others together as though there were actually a community of life in the world in the subconscious of the religious artist all life blends in god well it was begun he had set his hand to the plough and it was not made of the stuff that turns back he might never write another line might never even perfect what he had written but in his heart he had established contact with the muse he was a poet in his own right lowell himself more a critic than a poet had put it well in creating the only hard things to begin a grass blade's no easier to make than an oak if you've once found the way you've achieved the grand stroke for about two years after his chief illumination whitman laboured on the book believing that in any art or craft he is greatest forever and forever who contributes the greatest original practical example whitman wrote a motto in his bold uncompromising script and placed it above his desk make the works do not go into criticisms or arguments at all make full-blooded rich flush natural works insert natural things indestructibles idioms characteristics rivers states persons etc be full of strong central germs his task completed whitman published his book in july eighteen fifty five at the age of thirty six he had no publisher nor did he now have a printing office of his own but he had friends who liked him and believed in him tom and james rome had a little shop at the corner of fulton and cranberry and there he set up leaves of grass as the thin large page volume was to be christened everywhere within it were evidences of the personal touch and taste even the idiosyncrasy of the author the very lettering on the back was symbolical little roots in gold foil reaching down from the words in the title there was no author's name only his photograph as signature but for all that it was a pleasing book to read a fascinating book to look at almost no copies were sold but returns were had from some of the review copies a few of these found their way to england and in time brought forth a crop of defenders in the author's hour of distress one historic copy sent to emerson elicited a letter of thanks which made up for all unsold copies not only because it meant the well done of his master but because the book was a call for friends and it made emerson his lifelong friend one can imagine the look of exultation perhaps the joyful years of success that transformed whitman's face as breaking the seal of this letter he read its unqualified sentences for no first author is ever quite at his ease till the critic he most admires and fears has spoken much less that author of a book the like of which had never before appeared in america
when emerson's letter came he was set up says brother george in his uncomprehending way i took no account of it very well walt's family of friends would grow as his book slowly made its way till a little neglect on the part of the unprepared even in his own household could not matter much but let us see emerson's opinion of the pot that had now come to a boil concord massachusetts july twenty first eighteen fifty five dear sir i am not blind to the worth of the wonderful gift of leaves of grass i find it the most extraordinary piece of wit and wisdom that america has contributed i am very happy in reading it as great power makes us happy it meets the demand i am always making of what seems the sterile and stinging nature as if too much handiwork or too much lymph in the temperament were making our western wits fat and mean i give you joy of your free and brave thought i have great joy in it i find incomparable things said incomparably well as they must be i find the courage of treatment which so delights us and which large perception only can inspire i greet you at the beginning of a great career which yet must have had a long foreground somewhere for such a start i rub my eyes a little to see if this sunbeam were no illusion but the solid sense of the book it is a sober certainty it has the best merits namely of fortifying and encouraging i did not know until i last night saw the book advertised in a newspaper that i could trust the name as real and available for a post-office i wished to see my benefactor and it felt much like striking my task and visiting new york to pay you my respects r w emerson the letter was obviously written somewhat on the impulse and the pride it expressed was with equal obviousness a little the pride of paternity yet no ordinary book had ever stirred that impulse in emerson and he never wrote a second letter like this it was not given as a mature judgment it is true but it was as simple as manly and sincere as the book which called it forth whatever emerson might later do about it he could never retract the feeling of that moment and whitman was overjoyed at the testimony it gave to his personal and literary power but however authentic and compelling the com command to create whitman soon found that it was almost like ordering him to make bricks without straw the dream might be clear but the artist must have a medium parian marble fit models a language that would convey his meaning lacking this he would have to coin it out of himself and wait for his recognition until readers should have learned the idiom in which he spoke that is what whitman had to do and it is significant that readers who like him at all enjoy him more as they grow familiar with his language and form how he envied shakespeare to an interviewer he once said shakespeare had his boundless rich material all his characters waiting to be woven in the feudal world had been and grown had richly flourished for centuries gave him the perfect king the lord and the finished gentleman all that is heroic and gallant and graceful and proud and beautiful and refined gave him the exquisite and seductive transfiguration of caste sifted the and selected out the huge masses as if for him choice specimens of noble gentlemen and gave them to him gave him all the varied and romantic incidents of the military civil political and ecclesiastical history of a thousand years all stood up ready as it were to fall into the ranks for him then the time comes for the sunset of feudalism a new power has appeared and the flush the pomp the accumulated materials of those ages have all the gorgeousness of sunset at this time shakespeare appears by amazing opportuneness his faculty his power his personal circumstances come and he is their poet but i for my poems what have i i have all to make the feudal poet as i say was the finder and user of materials characters all ready for him but i have really to make all except my own inspiration and intentions have to map out fashion form and knit and sing the ideal american shakespeare and all sang the past i project the future depend on the future for my audience but writing as he did in his first volume largely out of his subconscious inspiration much of this planning was done for him the ideal man he sang was had he to be himself he accepted this necessity though he seems never to have fully realized its limitations i know perfectly well my road is different most of the great poets are impersonal i am personal they portray characters events passions but never mention themselves in my poems all revolves round concentrates in radiates from myself i have but one central figure of the general human personality typified in myself but my book compels absolutely necessitates every reader to transpose himself or herself into the central position and become the living fountain actor experiencer himself or herself of every page every aspiration every line 
thus one novel thing about this book in its general conception was that while it had an epic purpose it used the lyric point of view yet without becoming dramatic in form this was due in part to the technical limitations of the author who confessed himself deficient in dramatic ability and pictorial talent but it was more profoundly due to the requirements of that twin ambition which was to celebrate himself while celebrating his country the hartford wits dwight barlow and trumbull filled with a shallower patriotism had sought to put the new country on the literary map by composing columbiads and such epics but they failed through imitation blind to the fact that no man can rise to the proportions of an epic hero in this country except he be the reflection of the spirit of the average masses of his day this whitman truly felt and accepted a fifth of the book was a prose preface stating in terms of youthful conviction what the author was about this pronunciamento despite a certain oracular incoherence shared with emerson and other mystics was full of beautiful suggestiveness many a well-turned phrase betraying the fact that the author had polished it with care moreover it like the book emanated buoyancy and gladness the jocund spirit of the morning the preface announces as a personal fact what in the american scholar address emerson had twenty years before voiced as an aspiration that america should realize herself through her writers no longer betraying her provincial inferiority either by rejecting or by imitating the past the author then describes the sort of character which has resulted from the conditions of our colonization our pioneering and our crude experiments in democracy and finds in it a poetry that awaits the gigantic and generous treatment worthy of it this leads him to describe the poet who is to do justice to such a subject he is to be no mere mellifluous historian here the theme is creative and has vista of all this life he is not only the observer but himself a magna pars in war he is the most deadly force of the war he can make every word he speaks draw blood the time straying toward infidelity and confections and persiflage he withholds with his steady faith he sees eternity less like a play with a prologue and a denouement he sees eternity in men and women he is a seer he is individual he is complete in himself his function is to indicate the path between reality and their souls the soul is beautiful in itself and to convey that beauty an art suggestive of even the sublimest of man's creations becomes an obscuring curtain a perfume less wholesome than the sunshot air looking as he does toward the future such a poet naturally makes friends with the scientific spirit which works by slower if not sure methods to the same end and like the scientist he is the champion of liberty without which there cannot long be life having made his peace with the universe he is conscious of the encompassing laws of life justly compensating for all effort that is worthy punishing without the aid of man the knave and the fool the poet thus becomes the priest of mankind a priest who does not mediate but only inspires whitman concludes with a high tribute to the english language as a vehicle for such an epic a language which living after the institutions of feudalism were dead still breathed the spirit which was dominant in america the powerful language of resistance the dialect of common sense the speech of the proud and melancholy races and of all who aspire whether the nation follows the path of greatness indicated by the poetic prophet or not he has saved his own soul an individual is as superb as a nation when he has the qualities which make a superb nation in this assurance he is willing to wait for appreciation at the hands of his people when his country absorbs him as affectionately as he has absorbed it i exist as i am that is enough if no other in the world be aware i sit content and if each and all be aware i sit content one world is aware and by far the largest to me and that is myself and whether i come to my own to-day or in ten thousand or ten million years i can cheerfully take it now or with equal cheerfulness i can wait my foothold is tenoned and mortised in granite i laugh at what you call dissolution and i know the amplitude of time this was his programme the performance in the first experimental edition was not always up to it one poem written in eighteen fifty four when boston was he thought disgraced by her failure to resist the operation of fugitive slave law was included though strangely out of keeping with the others it was a satirical poem called a boston ballad but it was no ballad in theme narrative manner point of view or verse form it appeared to attempt satire by means of ridicule but this was the very error which he had warned himself against 
against indeed humour seems always to be an encumbrance to a prophet why this is true will appear when we look at another of the poems i do not refer to the first the principal poem one often approaches whitman most successfully by some of his own indirection but to a poem called originally sleep chasings the superficial critic finds in this poem only an attempt to describe realistically the phantasmagorical effect of actual dream activity the strange but never incongruous succession of images in the mind of the sleeper but it does more it gives us a clue to the whole poetic mentality of whitman indeed had he known as much about psychology as we do to-day he might not have had the temerity to publish such a book and yet until some other writer has emptied the contents from all the pockets of his mind even more completely than sherwood anderson or theodore dreiser has done and a balance has been struck between what is noble and what mean it is too soon to declare that while whitman's method may have been good he was not the man to make such public use of it besides there is in dreaming a moratorium on morality not only does the dreamer realize the ideal state in which as madame de stal phrased it to know all is to forgive all but his critical faculty always more or less under the control of the moral will is on vacation hence the universal absence of humour in a dream the material out of which dream images are fashioned is of course all supplied by experience personal or imaginative in his poem whitman refers to the events of his dream as past readings or records of what he had seen whether in the body or out of the body some passages we can recognize as his actual experience such for instance as the terror inspired by a shipwreck and some were doubtless consciously fashioned rather than remembered from sleep but the significant point is that the psychology is accurate everything might have happened in an actively dreaming mind and it would stream along in just that formless ever-changing way such a method was typical of all his early poems without beginning or end i do not mean there was no architectonic that he had a plan is apparent enough but the art is an attempt to catch the flux of nature just as it appears in sleep later when the novelty of such inspiration began to wear off and when with increasing study of poetic art whitman began to finish specimens there is form aplenty even metrical form but now he has merely made rhythmical the incoherent ejaculation and gnomic sayings of mystical inspiration another fact of importance to us if not of revelation to him is that in these images and aspirations experiences desires tossed up into consciousness by the fatal waves of sleep there is a certain law the personal equation science has discovered that in daydreaming eighty per cent of the experiences are egocentric a protective mechanism against the assaults of the active world in which one has proved himself less heroic than he could wish by necessity all the images in a dream of the night are egocentric so that we have in his method of composition the explanation of whitman's apparent egotism awake he recognizes a certain element of brag in his verses which does less than justice to his moral nature his cultivated generosity and fairness so he sings for the other man as well as for himself even though he knows or should know that in the mind of the average man no such songs are being smothered i know perfectly well my own egotism know my omnivorous lines and must not write any less and would fetch you whoever you are flush with myself much less can he speak for those strata of american life which he not only did not know but which he deeply envied the aristocracy of the brahmin the culture of the cavalier the learning of the schools he protested rather too much that they were un-american unfitted for the future for he was by his own very program seeking to create a race of great individuals when through literary success through the purifying of his personal motive in wartime service he had conquered the sense of inadequacy which prompted his declaration that he had no superior he would write poems truly democratic he would rely less upon his uncensored dreams for these early radical utterances out of the abysms of the soul following only its own impulses were already beginning to reveal the strange fact that a man may be religious in the mystical sense and yet not be moral according to the code of his day the inner light exposes what is there and in the sleepers the predominance of sexual images 
the imaginary promiscuity the hints of childish exhibitionism and even of a more savage past all betray the fact that our poetic medium is no saint teresa and that if he is to be the prophet of a new religion it would perforce be one in which evil is included as well as good thus projecting into philosophy and theology his own anthropomorphic limitations as now he was doing in his conception of the average man of the future enchanting the square deific this final sublimation of the paradox of evil later actually took place that this is the true interpretation of this poem and a key to the first edition appears from its close a parable in which the night represents his mind when engaged in mystic dreaming the day standing for the mind of normal common sense i too pass from the night i stay a while away o night but i return to you again and love you why should i be afraid to trust myself to you i'm not afraid i've been well brought forward by you i love the rich running day but i do not desert her in whom i lay so long i know not how i came out of you and i know not where i go with you but i know i came well and shall go well i shall stop only a time with the night and rise betimes i will duly pass the day o oh my mother and duly return to you that the subconscious mind forgets nothing may well be believed when one turns the pages of this book with its interminable lists of things thrown up under rhapsodical inspiration in this passive mystical state or fished up by memory hooks to complete the author's rough plan the little poem there was a child went forth explains how the poet became what he was by the impress of innumerable experiences and the first object he looked upon that object he became the early lilacs the democratic symbolical grass the sights of the farm the fish in the sea the people he met on the street or in the country road his own parents he that had fathered him and she that had conceived him in her womb and birthed him they gave this child more of themselves than that they gave him afterward every day they became part of him the mother at home quietly placing the dishes on the supper table the mother with mild words clean her cap and gown wholesome odor falling off her person and clothes as she walks by the father strong self-sufficient manly mean angered unjust the blow the quick loud word the tight bargain the crafty lure the family usages the language the company the furniture the yearning and swelling heart affection that will not be gainsaid the sense of what is real the thought if after all it prove unreal the doubts of daytime and the doubts of night-time the curious whether and how whether that which appears so is so or is it all flashes and specks the first poem longer than all the others together only carries this catalogue further with the author's interpolated comments of course such a method involved contradictions not only in matter but in mood life is paradoxical nowhere more so than in the united states and no poet who does not in his nature and training embrace more than a single tradition a single racial strain can hope to speak for the country at large a national poetry could come out of new england no more than out of scotland even whitman needed the experiences of the civil war fusing north and south east and west in a common ideal before he could really be an epic as well as a lyric poet however his mixed ancestry of english dutch and welsh stock his residence in a cosmopolitan city his travels and his journalistic experiences were all preparing him to embrace and in a measure resolve the paradox which was america do i contradict myself very well then i contradict myself i am large i contain multitudes the same diversity is embraced in the consciousness of every man though not always with the same childlike complacency only in our outward lives regulated by conscious prudent selection of word and impulse is there consistency yet for whitman it was enough to know that there was something he called it identity beneath all these experiences and persisting through them apparently it did not occur to him to ask why the identity of one person responded to one set of stimuli of interests of ambitions while another identity no less vital responded only to a different set the answer to that question might have forced him to select more carefully from among his companions his sense satisfactions he preferred to loaf and invite his soul passively observing a spear of summer grass or humanity magnificently moving in vast masses whitman's point of view sometimes limits itself to pictures of a single kind as when he takes an imaginary promenade up the street and paints in words the various faces he meets seeing in every countenance the man's own faithful epitaph or he lets his mind roam over all the occupations he knows celebrating not so much the feelings that actual workingmen experience as the poet's youthful joy in watching the world at work 
so too in the poem great are the myths a series of oracular approvals endorsing the concepts whereby man has released his growing energies similarly the poet elsewhere makes a blanket confession of all the faiths that man has ever known feeling like the darwinian soon to be reading the origin of species that he was an acme of things accomplished encloser of things to be but in some respects the most harmonious poem in the book is the one which most closely follows the prose of the preface now list to my morning's romanza a description of the great poet who makes answer to the riddle of the sphinx at any rate in the story of walt whitman we are more interested in it him all wait for him all yield up his word is decisive and final him they accept in him lave in him perceive themselves as amid lights him they immerse and he immerses them he puts things in their attitudes he puts to-day out of himself with plasticity and love he places his own city times reminiscences his parents brothers and sisters associations employment politics so that the rest never shame them afterward nor assume to command them a man is a summons and challenge it is vain to skulk do you hear that mocking and laughter do you hear the ironical echoes books friendships philosophers priests action pleasure pride beat up and down seeking to give satisfaction he indicates the satisfaction and indicates them that beat up and down also whichever the sex whatever the season or place he may go freshly and gently and safely by day or by night he has the passkey of hearts to him the response of the prying of hands on the knobs his welcome is universal the flow of beauty is not more welcome or universal than he is every existence has its idiom everything has an idiom and tongue he resolves all tongues in his own and bestows it upon men and my man translates and any man translates himself also one part does not contradict another part he is the joiner he sees how they join he says indifferently and alike how are you friend to the president at his levy and he says good day my brother to cudge the hose and the sugar filled and both understand him and know that his speech is right he walks with perfect ease in the capital he walks among the congress and one representative says to another here is our equal appearing and new then the mechanics take him for a mechanic and the soldiers suppose him to be a soldier and the sailors that he has followed the sea the authors take him for an author and the artist for an artist and the laborers perceive that he could labor with them and love them no matter what the work is that he is the one to follow it or has followed it no matter what the nation that he might find his brothers and sisters there the gentleman of perfect blood acknowledges his perfect blood the insulter the prostitute the angry person the beggar see themselves in the ways of him he strangely transmutes them they are not vile any more they hardly know themselves they are so grown as we have seen and shall see this is autobiographical in the fullest sense the author himself was the original poem of which the book was but a transcript and in his person as in his poems there was an effect of physical health and overflowing spirits he had a right if any one did to be a poet of the body as well as as a poet of the soul and in his first edition he indulged a single poem of a sort later to be given more prominence celebrating man the animal as a suitable pedestal for man the dreamer or it was as if one might see man as he is in himself stripped of the clothes which hide both his body and his mind sartar resartus had done this for satirical purposes in whitman's view nothing in the creation was impure save when the impure mind of man had made it so he longed for a return to the graceful athleticism of the greeks their flowing garments placing a premium on bodily health and poise such exquisite realization of health gave him joy not only as an artist but also as one who thought much about the generations of americans who follow his own in man or woman a clean strong firm fibred body is beautiful as the most beautiful face how necessary such a preachment was in eighteen fifty five may be seen by examining the styles of dress then worn or by noting how modern form revealing clothes and athletic exercises have improved the pride of men and women in their bodies in new orleans whitman had seen slaves auctioned in the basement of the old st louis hotel a custom graphically described by frederica bremer and though he knew how bestial and savage the slave sometimes was he could not bear to see a human body sold as merchandise even a slave's body had a relation to the soul trace it back far enough he said and every life will be found to emerge from some form of slavery the slave of to-day must therefore be looked upon as not only herself she is the teeming mother of mothers she is the bearer of them that shall grow and be mates to the mothers End of section seven.
section eight of whitman and interpretation in narrative by emery holloway this librivox recording is in the public domain book four part one on the open road publishing leaves of grass was not unlike addressing an open letter to the country intended for personal and private reading and such a letter has accomplished its purpose only when proper replies are evoked so after fondling his first-born book doubtless with more affection than most authors feel in proportion as his personality was more identified with it whitman began to be anxious as to whether he had hit the mark emerson's prompt letter was reassuring yet the book had not been addressed to the emersons they were of the household and their approval was not unmixed with loyalty he had sent a copy to whittier also that poet because of his own pioneering songs of labor and his interest in abolition might have found in the new bard a brother but for the fact that whitman substituted for the orthodox quaker humility a certain arrogant pride of man in himself and especially because he was too frankly masculine for the chaste and sentimental bachelor accustomed to sing in borrowed tunes so this other poet of the people adopting the attitude of the people themselves threw the book into the fire the public bought hardly a copy but whitman had sent review copies to the press and the press was heard from the eagle now that whitman was no longer a potential political foe was willing to notice his book at length admitting that the extraordinary deliverance staggers him with the strangest compound of transcendentalism bombast philosophy wit and dullness which it ever entered into the heart of man to conceive the reviewer is yet open-minded enough to realize that it defies criticism and so refrains from pronouncing judgment upon it it is a work that will satisfy few upon a first perusal it must be read again and again and then it will be to many unaccountable all who read it will agree that it is an extraordinary book full of beauties and blemishes such as nature is to those who have only a half-formed acquaintance with her the reviewer had himself been puzzling with the book before attempting to give it a stamp for his review did not appear for two months after he had received the book the london leader was likewise cautiously complimentary to this rough devil-may-care yankee who writes with a kind of bacchanal fury in the force and fervour of his own sensations it pointed out that much remains of which we confess we can make nothing much that seems to us purely fantastical and preposterous much that appears to our muddy vision gratuitously prosaic needlessly plain-speaking disgusting without purpose and singular without result but he adds that there are so many evidences of a noble soul in whitman's pages that we regret these aberrations which only have the effect of discrediting what is genuine by the show of something false and especially do we deplore the unnecessary openness with which walt reveals to us matters which ought rather to remain in sacred silence it is good not to be ashamed of nature it is good to have all-inclusive charity but it is also good sometimes to leave the veil across the temple similarly the london critic was willing to grant freely enough that he has a strong relish for nature and freedom just as an animal has nay further that his crude mind is capable of appreciating some of nature's beauties but it by no means follows that because nature is excellent therefore art is contemptible walt whitman is as unacquainted with art as a hog is with mathematics he who said all things can be forgiven him who has perfect candor ought not to have found fault with this criticism for its plain speaking rather he might well have pondered its attack on his fundamental conception of art except to make his verse free it is doubtful if whitman had as yet given a great deal of attention to art in writing with a certain tendency to make a virtue of whatever was congenial to his disposition he was after all in his first book presenting not the mountain and the sea so much as rough blocks of experience chiselled a bit here and there perhaps but not yet arranged with painstaking art but when neglect and attack alike 
made him alive to the fact that it is of no use to sing unless one has the art of catching the ear of a listener he eventually learned to carve his stone till it could speak for itself many of the reviews were wholly unfavourable but in fairness to the reviewers we must remember that artistically whitman's first book was his worst though the freshness of its mystical inspiration and the vigour of his robust optimism might compensate for this in the minds of those who were not balked by a form at that time novel in america these critics did not have the benefit of the later work or the poet or the judgment of history to assist them and yet sometimes they found vulnerable points in whitman's armour the pity is that he was temperamentally incapable of profiting by their advice without being crushed by their scorn this was in part due to his o'erleaping ambition not only to create a new literature in america but to do it by a sudden explosion had he included a single poem in conventional form appropriate to some of his own conventional sentiments but in original and picturesque language as with pains he was quite capable of doing it would have disarmed his critics at the start and forced them to estimate the thing he was trying to do on its own merits he was condemned to suffer from the defects of his qualities for instance the new york crayon struck home when it said to all women all things are good nothing is better than another and hence there is no ideal no aspiration no progress to things better for precisely that reason the socialist of a more recent day found that whitman rightly understood was too complacent to be the poet of reform whitman's rejoinder would have been of course that he made everything ideal but the result on the evolutionary urge in man is the same the crayon goes on to say with a wonderful vigour of thought and intensity of perception a power indeed not often found leaves of grass has no ideality no concentration no purpose it is barbarous undisciplined like the poetry of a half-civilised people and as a whole useless save to those miners of thought who prefer the metal in its unworked state this of course is hardly accurate and yet in that first volume so wholly spun out of the author's personal life of aimless observation so undisciplined subsisting so little on the language of form there were autobiographical revelations which the author naturally did not too carefully examine putnam's monthly called the book a compound of new england transcendentalism and new york rowdy not that the rowdy had absorbed the transcendental teachings and now gave forth a version in the vulgate for in that case he would have ceased to be a rowdy and would have felt the need of language more delicately suggestive but it was as though the searchlight wherewith concord had been accustomed to scan the heavens for some new planet of an idea had by whitman been turned upon the streets of new york in the hope that divinity might be found in human clay of course the public did not know of emerson's endorsement but emerson himself had difficulty in getting others to see what he had found in the book this made him hesitate to send it to that acrid satirist of democracy his friend carlyle though the latter as well as himself might have recognized something of his sort of resortus in more than the style of the book at last he did send it timidly the book he wrote carlyle throws so badly with the few to whom i showed it and wanted good morals so much that i never did send it after you have looked into it if you think as you may that it is only an auctioneer's inventory of a warehouse you can light your pipe with it had emerson then seen the second instalment of the leaves to appear the next year he would have suggested that it looked like the inventory of the earth of the sea and all that in them is there can be no doubt that the tendency to catalogue damned the book with critics almost as much as did its occasional conflict with the customary prudish reticence as i have said whitman himself came to see this and to realise that size even in a poem is only development that a truly reverent faith leaves the best untold for a poet consciously appealing to the future even in a rough and youthful country it was fortunate that he abandoned a childish formlessness for his nation following an immutable law was to become more complex rather than more simple and form is the language of the complex races however there was a form as rodin has shown and as whitman was to guess which might at once have unity and suggest the larger cruder creation of which it was a part 
in his letter to whitman emerson had expressed an impulse to visit the brooklyn bard before he did this however he recommended moncure conway to do so americans abroad may now come home he said with pride in his discovery for unto us a man is born the eager-minded and talented young virginian needed no second hint from such an oracle on the boat trip to new york he read leaves of grass and was struck by its points of similarity to the oriental books he had been perusing in emerson's library his visit fell on one of the hottest days of september a sunday when the mercury was climbing toward the century mark any one who has been in brooklyn when that happens can realize that young conway's enthusiasm was not easily deterred for on the last moving day four months before the whitmans had gone to the very edge of town on ryerson street there just before his book came off the press whitman had seen his father end the struggle and pain which were his life the preceding year his parent had felt the incoming and at his request walt had conducted him out to the island to say farewell with his eyes to the old home place conway did not find whitman at home that is not at home in the house he was equally at ease however where the young visitor did find him this was not until his caller had searched carefully the sunburnt grass of a treeless meadow near the house to which he had been directed by the poet's mother it really looked like a case of protective coloration if whitman's working man's costume of grey his blue-grey shirt iron-grey hair and his sunburned face and open neck as he moved into a room or down broadway with an elephantine roll threw into him into picturesque relief against the more conventional people of his day they only served to blend him in with the landscape here a modern antaeus not only touching foot to his mother earth but lying at full length upon her breast and gazing like an eagle out of his pale blue eyes at the midday sun that was how he composed much of his poetry and it is no wonder that his poems should have lacked the perspective the crayon reviewer had found wanting don't you find this sun rather hot mr whitman asked conway by way of opening conversation not at all too hot said the child of nature for all that he had a sunstroke about this time and was sensitive to the heat for twenty years but courteously remembering that in any event his visitor was uncomfortable in the heat he led the way back to his room its appointments were marked with simplicity if not poverty there was no bed but only a small cot no bureau but a little washstand over which a small mirror was hung against the wall a pine table with pen ink and paper handy completed the furniture on the wall hung an old line drawing of silenus and another of bacchus which were to hang in whitman's room to the end the original god bacchus not a frenzied bacchant but the proud and perfectly formed caresser of life there was but a single window and it gave upon nothing but the barren plain the average labourer could boast as much it was hardly the place to cultivate the acquaintance of this young gentleman so they packed themselves off to staten island where they might have plenty of shade miles of secluded beach in which to open their souls to each other when they undressed and took sun baths and sea baths it appeared to the younger man that whitman himself might in another age have given rise to the myth of bacchus so perfectly formed was his body so graceful his slow movements so fervent his embrace of the sea it was the gesture of a child animated by the full-blown passions of a man but as they talked fervour of a more inward sort gave a subtler finer impression the poet's gentle clear voice was slow his eyelids drooped and his words his look communicated kindness and sincerity they liked each other so well that they agreed to meet again a few days later for a stroll through new york whitman's other world a strange magnetism had attracted conway when he left whitman and though no fool he felt a tendency to leave all and follow this happy powerful natural individual even imitating his unconventional attire a strange magnetism but strange perhaps only because most of us are so perfectly insulated by custom and reserve as to neutralize it for what can be the proof of man's worth to man if he have no power of personally attracting his kind the place of appointment was a printing office doubtless that in which whitman had set up the leaves 
already whitman was thinking of a second edition in which he meant to include a sheaf of reviews of his first both favourable and unfavourable indeed some copies of the first edition bound late he had included a number of these criticisms on this morning he was at the case setting up in type for this purpose an article from the democratic review probably conway did not linger to read the copy for had he done so he would have been troubled by a vague suspicion an american bard at last it began one of the roughs large proud affectionate eating drinking and breeding his costume manly and free his face sunburnt and bearded his posture strong and erect his voice bringing hope and prophecy to the generous races of young and old we shall cease shamming and be what we really are we shall start an athletic and defiant literature for all our intellectual people followed by their books poems novels essays editorials lectures tuitions and criticisms dressed by london and paris models receive what is received there obey the authorities settle disputes by the old tests keep out of rain in the sun retreat to the shelter of houses and schools trim their hair shave touch not the earth barefoot and enter not the sea except in a complete bathing dress where are the gristle and beards and broad breasts and space and ruggedness and nonchalance that the souls of the people love at this remembering the style of the book he had read and the manner of man he had seen conway would have turned to find a familiar signature which was not there self-restraint with haughty eyes assuming to himself all the attributes of his country steps walt whitman into literature talking like a man unaware that there was ever hitherto such a production as a book or such a being as a writer he must recreate poetry with the elements always at hand he must imbue it with himself as he is disorderly fleshy and sensual a lover of things yet a lover of men and women above the whole of the other objects of the universe his work is to be achieved by unusual methods neither classic nor romantic is he nor a materialist any more than a spiritualist undecked also is this poet with sentimentalism or jingle or nice conceits or flowery similes here comes one among the well-beloved stone-cutters and announces himself and plans with decision and science and sees the solid and beautiful forms of the future where there are now no solid forms his rhythm and uniformity he will conceal in the roots of his verses not to be seen of themselves but to break forth loosely as lilacs on a bush or take shapes compact as the shapes of melons or chestnuts or pears he drops disguises and ceremony and walks forth with the confidence and gaiety of a child the first glance out of his eyes electrifies him with love and delight he will have the earth receive and return his affection he will stay with it as the bridegroom stays with the bride the cool breathed ground the slumbering and liquid trees the just gone sunset the vitreous pour of the full moon the tender and growing night he salutes and touches and they touch him the sea supports him and hurries him off with its power and crooked fingers dash me with amorous wet then he says i can repay you nature he proclaims inherently clean sex will not be put aside it is a great ordination of the universe he works the muscle of the male and the teeming fibre of the female throughout his writings as dulcome realities impure only by deliberate intention and effort especially in the leaves of grass are the facts of eternity and immortality largely treated happiness is no dream and perfection is no dream amelioration is my lesson he says with calm voice and progress is my lesson and the lesson of all things if health were not his distinguishing attribute this poet would be the very harlot of persons right and left he flings his arms drawing men and women with undeniable love to his close embrace loving the clasp of their hands the touch of their necks and breasts and the sound of their voices all else seems to burn up under his fierce affection for persons a cooler and a more impartial observer might have questioned whether such overweening affection however ideal were the token of absolute health possibly the big body and the smooth functioning which kept the doctor forever away misled him as to the normality of the large soul within possibly too he was unknown to himself striving to sublimate in an unnatural way what could not be wholly satisfied in a natural way as to his poetic mission did he really have perfect faith cheerfully waiting for his recognition instead of writing an anonymous review to counteract what he considered the misapprehension of other reviewers to be great emerson had said is to be misunderstood but he did not add that great art needs to explain itself 
the deception implicit in anonymous self-buffing had aroused walt's ire as an editor but now his own ox was gored an ox that was too valuable to die his nervousness about the success of his ambitious undertaking betrayed itself also in other reviews of the sort and in ways which shall be recounted presently but doubtless all this was lost on his young visitor eager to inspect new york with whitman as cicerone so many workmen greeted walt with a warm hand-clasp that conway with the instinct of a reporter interviewed them to see how the democratic poet really impressed the demos what sort of man is he he put to one a first-rate man is walt nobody knows walt but likes him nearly everybody knows him and and loves him but they knew nothing of his writing what power he showed there was but the overflow of his personal contacts some biographers are inclined to tell the story of walt whitman as though the book he wrote were essentially greater than the man thereby betraying their lack of comprehension of either how could it be in a visit conway and whitman paid to the tombs it became evident that the latter had been there before the inmates crowded around him as to a father confessor unburdening their various complaints one man held on some petty charge had been confined in a foul and unhealthy cell whitman went to the warden and stated the complaint forgetting to explain who he was or perhaps preferring to speak without introduction on his personal authority he ended his complaint with quiet emphasis in my opinion it is a damned shame unaccustomed to such a command from any one so coarsely clad the warden hesitated as if considering whether his interlocutor should not himself be in jail but the serene look of offended justice in whitman's eyes marked by no trace of fear caused him rather to order a subordinate to make the transfer requested a few days later whitman returned conway's visit calling on him and his sister at the metropolitan hotel he wore a baize coat and inexpensive checkered shirt but it was immaculate and the southerners found his manner pleasing with a curious mixture of pride and dependence in these days when the prophet felt himself to be without adequate honor in his own country he carried about with him the precious letter from emerson he showed it to his friend richard henry dana jr managing editor of greeley's tribune but when dana who was likewise a friend of emerson asked permission to publish the letter as an offset to so much hostile and uncomprehending talk in the press whitman hesitated on the score of propriety he was himself writing reviews to which he considered it impolitic to attach his own name but he paid emerson the compliment of supposing that the latter never wrote anything he was unwilling to see over his name in print particularly when it was so well written and when as whitman was all too willing to believe in those days of confused emotion what emerson said was profoundly true indeed with some effort he convinced himself that emerson must have meant it for use so when dana persisted whitman gave in and the letter came out in the tribune emerson did not see it there but if whitman could have seen him when he heard of it from bellows he would have been sorry he had published it i wrote at once said emerson to bellows a letter to the author congratulating him yes i replied i read it how when have you been to new york no i read it in the new york tribune in the new york tribune no no impossible he cannot have published it he exclaimed with much surprise being assured that such nevertheless was the case he muttered dear dear that was very wrong very wrong indeed that was merely a private letter of congratulation had i intended for it for publication i should have enlarged the bear i should have enlarged the but very much enlarged by the but biting the word off with his lips and looking thoughtfully out of the window as he meditated upon the lack of taste in the people's poet whom he had taken for a protege but emerson's thought of the book was not conditioned by his opinion of the man and though he was annoyed by the position in which the publication of the letter placed him as the unqualified sponsor of the book he did not retract what he had written and when he came to see the author he realized that the error was more of the judgment than of the heart and he forgave him as one would a child but as we shall see whitman having once conquered his scruple went still farther in his questionable exploitation of emerson's friendship once he had committed himself to a course of action he was likely to persist in it even if he knew he was wrong it was clear by this time that to complete his plan of the leaves by publishing additional sections along the lines he had sketched in the first edition whitman would undertake a thankless job 
was it worth while had a man even a man of genius the right to trust himself so completely disregarding what revelation of truth might have been committed to other men the transcendentalists had dodged this problem by frankly disclaiming the right of the reason to demand a philosophy of life and with characteristic self-sufficiency drank only that water which was drawn from their private wells was not all water alike if pure for his part whitman needed time to think it over for he was still conscious of his limitations and his whole training taught him to be wary of those who were committed to a single point of view so he struck out for the region about peconic bay and spent the fall there away from men far from the city with its suggestions of selfish and temporary ambitions he made the great decision of his life he would go on with his plan and do the best he could with it for after all he was not pretending to be perfect but only to put a genuine man for once into a book if the book revealed the imperfections of the man it might at least provoke a better man to do a better book but in any case he would have made the most of his talent and he would frankly admit the evil in himself as well as the good indeed he would almost brag of it if only to insist that an emasculated literature can never be a virile force in life i have called this a decision that is perhaps not quite the word as he once said to his reverend biographer dr buck i have hardly done anything in my life of set purpose he wrote the book because he wanted to because it gave him a certain pleasure to assert himself through such an experiment in making the world better and happier it was religious to him in the sense that it satisfied an imperative demand of his subconscious affection but it was also pleasing to him personally inasmuch as it gave him a picturesque role such as he could never hope to attain by competing with poets orators statesmen on their own ground if thus his twin ambition had in it a little pose it had also as history has now shown the significance of a national service the new volume was ready the following july it was printed by fowler and wells a prosperous firm which had made much of the fad for phrenology but it did not bear their imprint like other publishers they feared the terrible power of puritanism in the united states and this volume was sure to provoke more caustic comment than the first it dropped the prose preface of the earlier edition but without greatly altering the lines incorporated much of it in various new poems both poems and preface being essentially declamatory this was not difficult to do the new poems though more numerous than those in the first edition added only as many more pages a man who has published a book out of his soul is never quite so subjective afterwards for part of him is now on the outside of his consciousness a picture for himself as well as for others to look at and criticize perhaps this was less true in whitman's case than in most inasmuch as he had strangely caught in his book not only his ideas and feelings but deeper meanings which he could not understand and hence could not criticize nevertheless his next book showed her clear evidences that he was beginning to think more of the laws which governed the artistic impression of others as well as of the spontaneous expression of himself although the first dazzling effect of his interior illumination was now beginning to take its place in whitman's mind as a dominant phase of his thought it was not the only phase he had been led to it in part as we have seen but the rapidity whereby his dreams for an ideal civilization had to outrun the power of the reformer to make over a nation in the likeness of those youthful dreams he had never celebrated the past or even the present concerning them he being a journalist had few illusions and when the light of his mystical vision revealed things in the future he could but contrast them with the actuality about him the actuality which would put him down not only as a dreamer but a dreamer with a nightmare such a situation is the test of the idealist he may react in one of two ways if his patience his ability and his faith be limited he will turn satirist seeking to prod a sluggish world with ridicule or with scorn but if he be really great he will patiently set about creating the beauty of which he has dreamed in the case of whitman's second volume as in the first we have a very human mixture of the two in one poem afterwards dropped whitman sends over the roofs of the world a barbaric yawp a scornful irony repondez repondez he cries to the people in the french he had imperfectly picked up in new orleans 
let the crest of hell be neared and trod on let the days be darker than the nights let slumber bring less slumber than waking time brings let the world never appear to him or her for whom it was all made let the heart of the young man still exile itself from the heart of the old man and let the heart of the old man be exiled from the heart of the young man let the sun and moon go let scenery take the applause of the audience let there be apathy under the stars let the eminence of meanness treachery sarcasm hate greed and impotence lust be taken for granted above all let writers judges governments households religions philosophies take such for granted and above all let the worst men beget children of the worst women let priests still play at immortality let death be inaugurated let nothing remain upon the earth except the ashes of teachers artists moralists lawyers and learned and polite persons then dropping the irony for a single line he explodes his real feeling let him who is without my poems be assassinated then he continues let marriage slip down among fools and be for none but fools let men among themselves talk and think obscenely of women and let women among themselves talk and think obscenely of men let every man doubt every woman and let every woman trick every man let the earth desert god nor let there be ever henceforth be mentioned the name of god let there be no god let there be no unfashionable wisdom let such be scorned and derided off the earth let there be wealthy and immense cities but through any of them not a single poet saviour knower or lover let the infidels of these states laugh all faith away if one be found who has faith let the rest set upon him let them affright faith let them destroy the power of breeding faith let the she harless and the he harless be prudent let them dance on while seeming lasts o seeming 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 this is the addition that emerson should have sent to carla with this outburst marked of course for all its indictment of an age not only frank with itself such a jeremiad could accomplish no good and was not really characteristic of whitman but it reveals the strength of his devotion to his cause and it betrays the agony of his disappointment yet except perhaps as involuntary autobiography it had no proper place in his book for by his own cardinal evolutionary theory one age deserves to be blamed no more than another there will never be any more perfection than there is now nor any more heaven or hell than there is now the same satire besprinkles some of the other poems even the most cheerful of them but on the whole the book is not only full of creative inspiration but was slowly evolving a form in the first poem salute o monde this form is artificially superimposed the lines are mechanically not to say unmusically wrought each section of the poem begins with the question what do you see walt whitman what do you hear walt whitman etc numerous parallel lines then answer each question often it is true with the bare names of pictures rather than with the pictures themselves but even though these lines may not evoke emotional images in the mind of the reader it does not follow that they had no such value to the author for whitman had begun a rigorous course of self-education for his poetic career reading widely and making countless notes so that when he says i see the electric telegraphs of the earth he is thinking though the reader is not of the filaments of the news of the wars deaths gains passions of my race it is true that he sometimes made the fundamental poetic mistake of supposing that he could write emotional poetry concerning what had not deeply stirred his own emotions but it is interesting to note that basing his democracy on the essential equality of mankind he should so soon have lifted his horizon to include the whole world my spirit is passed in compassion and determination around the whole earth i have looked for equals and lovers and found them ready for me in all lands i think some divine rapport has equalized me with them a very similar poem is the song of the broad axe in which though his mind roams over history very freely he has limited his imagination to those events occupations institutions that have had some connection with the axe the symbol of man's domination of the earth the overture is rhymed trochees and the interminable catalogues of salu omand are here broken up by passages of poetry or rhythmical epigrams embedded in one section is a beautiful description of the great city the ultimate handiwork of the pioneer's axe then foreshadowing the method of his greatest poetry the real gives way to eidolons dim shapes the ideal which alone endures in as i sat alone by blue 
ontario's shore is further evidence that the mystic is working toward form and beauty the theme is that of the prose preface to the first edition but the form has now an added prologue and epilogue while all the exposition appears as personal experience and avowal no longer is he merely writing a preface to express the hope for a literature new in america he definitely assumes the task of creating that literature fall behind me states a man before all myself typical before all the poem is the story of his original commission from the muse when by ontario's shore while the winds fanned me and the waves came tripping toward me i thrilled with the power's pulsations and the charm of my theme was upon me till the tissues that held me parted their ties upon me and i saw the free soul of poets the loftiest bards of past ages strode before me strange large men long unwaked undisclosed were disclosed to me likewise in this compost we have a unifying subject and a compressed well-balanced poem with a theme not unlike that of thanatopsis and in to you whitman achieves unity and a fitting form by making the poem a versified letter to the reader asking friendship and inviting him to start out with the poet on the open road of individual liberty and joy the long poem on this theme poem of the road later song of the open road is one of the most buoyant courageous stimulating challenges in the whole english language i will scatter myself among men and women as i go i will toss a new gladness and roughness among them whoever denies me it shall not trouble me whoever accepts me he or she shall be blessed and shall bless me the very symbolism confesses the poet's inability to deal with so broad and elusive a theme except by suggestion i swear to you there are divine things more beautiful than words can tell and the divinest is the society of the great companions the swift and majestic men the greatest women he concludes like some modern david grayson or sherwood anderson or some classic emerson allons be not detained let the paper remain on the desk unwritten and the book on the shelf unopened let the tools remain in the workshop let the money remain unearned let the school stand mind not the cry of the teacher let the preacher preach in his pulpit let the lawyer plead in the court and the judge expound the law but doubtless the most beautiful and at the same time most powerful poem in the edition was the one which thoreau lingered over the sundown poem now crossing brooklyn ferry here is the very assurance of eternity and the equal tone of art yet there is no monotony in the rising and falling cadences nature is beautiful and accurately portrayed an actual scene and yet she is caught up into higher poetry than that she becomes the messenger of one generation to another not so much to be loved in herself as to be associated with the unending stream of life bryant in his flood of years was to brood upon the procession of man as an epic panorama whitman makes friends with every man in the procession who has shared or will share his experiences for has he to not step from that crowd for a brief moment to pin his message on a faithful tree where all may read and to make sure that none will feel unworthy of his friendship he avows the evil within him as well as the good nor is it you alone who know what it is to be evil i am he who knew what it was to be evil i too knitted the old knot of contrariety blebbed blushed resented lied stole grudged had guile anger lust hot wishes i dared not speak was wayward vain greedy shallow sly cowardly malignant the wolf the snake the hog not wanting in me the cheating look the frivolous word the adulterous wish not wanting refusals hates postponements meanness laziness none of these wanting was one with the rest the days and haps of the rest but i was a manhattanese free friendly and proud making careful use of repetition marvellously blending homely terms and sights in the most harmonious tone he has written a poem with lasting and human charm in such a poem one sense is not merely the feeling of immortality which has attributed to youthful inexperience but a feeling of immortality which has no reference to youth or age a feeling which deals a blow to the tyranny of time no wonder he complained of the preacher's lack of imagination they who profess to hold sacred the miracles but who could not see the all-inclusive miracle of creation whitman seldom wrote a poem more perfectly suited to what he had to say than miracles to appreciate its real faith we shall have to think of it not in connection with emerson's essays but in connection with churches who considered beecher and phillips radicals and who would have been comfortable in the religious atmosphere of modern daytons 
the only new poems in this edition to enlarge upon the, his treatment of sex are poem of procreation now a woman waits for me and spontaneous me in a few lines of these there was in comparison with the first edition less poetic masking of sexual experience but we shall mention them again in connection with an entire group of which they formed a part in the third edition and afterwards in the last poem in the new edition whitman sought to assure the reader that despite his best effort the poet had been unable fully to communicate himself through written words the truths of the earth continually wait they are not so concealed either they are calm subtle untransmissible by print they are imbued through all things conveying themselves willingly conveying a sentiment and invitation of the earth i utter and utter i speak not yet if you hear me not of what avail am i to you the best of the earth cannot be told anyhow for to whitman borrowing nothing language is but an understood hint of experience and men must live fully before they can comprehend the language of a full life i swear the earth remains jagged and broken only to him or her who remains jagged and broken likewise the words a poet must utter are those cast up by the experience of his race his time any word in its place is good if only it do justice to the life for which it stands borrowed words are lying echoes yet for all the evidences which the book offered that its author was saner than his age there was something in it which betrayed also that he was not quite master of himself on the back strip of the book his publisher had printed in gold a sentence from Man emerson's letter i greet you at the beginning of a great career over emerson's signature of course this was done with whitman's consent if not at his suggestion whatever may have been his conception of the purpose of the letter it is hard to see how he could excuse himself for thus making emerson seem to endorse the new poems which he had never read it was more than bad taste it was not plain fair the letter had never been answered in writing but it was printed in full in the appendix together with the press notices and in reply to it appeared a long and fulsome letter from whitman a new volume of poems he said was the only adequate reply to such a missive there was an element of affectation in this which could have given emerson no satisfaction for emerson had called on whitman in the meantime and had of course received a personal reply to his letter the author's lack of perfect self-poise appears further in a passage in which with what he thought was generosity he addressed emerson as master and declared that the concord sage had first discovered america as a literary realm in his enthusiasm he went on to declare that his first edition of a thousand copies had readily sold a statement which was about as far from the facts as it could be whatever may have been the twist of mind which permitted whitman to make it unless he was merely bluffing the open road of his literary career was smooth before him i keep on till i make a hundred poems and then several hundred perhaps a thousand the way is clear to me a few years and the average annual call for my poems is ten or twenty thousand copies more quite likely why should i hurry or compromise in poems or speeches i say the word or two that has got to be said adhere to the body step with the countless common footsteps and remind every man or woman of something master i am a man who has perfect faith in poems or speeches he had said both before and after his poetic experiment whitman thought of indulging in the lecturing so popular in the eighteen fifties emerson thackeray curtis phillips and beecher were doing it with success why could not he in some respects it would be more satisfying to quell america with a great tongue hearing the cry of an applauding multitude swayed by some loud-voiced orator who wields the living mass as if he were its soul than to cram himself into print and paper and silent little words so seldom fashioned to his purpose on the platform he might not only display the persuasiveness of his musical voice the dignity of his impressive if not majestic frame but might also find inspiration in the personal presence of those to whom he spoke he had in the early fifties written many of these lectures borrows of them mrs whitman had said and now when fear of prosecution for issuing an obscene book caused his publishers to stop selling the second edition he revived his plan of making himself not only the poet of the nation but also its greatest orator speaking by word of mouth as did all the ancient prophets this would have the additional purpose of advertising both himself and his book it would be a personal introduction to the masses of what had seemed too esoteric for them in print but it would not be done for personal gain at most he would charge fifteen cents admission or ten dollars a lecture some lectures would be on religion some on democracy others on art and psychology but he would take care not to allow any fame he might win thereby to entangle him in politics he would not run for office as famous orators have commonly done 
end of section eight section nine of whitman an interpretation in narrative by emory holloway this librivox recording is in the public domain book four part two on the open road it was characteristic of him to plan his announcement before he was ready to begin lecturing here is a rough draft of it evidently meant for posting or publication notice random intentions two branches henceforth two co-expressions they expand amicable from common sources but each with individual stamp by itself first poems leaves of grass as of institutions the soul the body a man a woman descending below laws social routine creeds literature to celebrate a human being the inherent the red blood one male in himself or one female in herself songs of thoughts and wants hitherto repressed by writers or it may as well be avowed to give the personality of walt whitman out and out evil and good whatever he is or thinks that sharply set down in a book the spirit commanding it if certain outsiders stop puzzled or dispute or laugh very well second lectures as of reasoning reminiscences comparison the intellectual the aesthetic the desire for knowledge the sense of richness refinement and beauty in the mind as in art a sensation from an american point of view also in lectures the meaning of religion as a statement of the above two both would increase themselves not at any time finished any more than any live operation of nature is but unfolding urging onward and outward by degrees to fashion for these states two athletic volumes the first to speak for the permanent soul which speaks for all materials too but can be understood only by the like of itself the same being the reason that what is wisdom to one is gibberish to another but the second temporary shall be the speech of the attempt at argumentation art both to illustrate america illustrate the whole not merely sections members throbbing from the heart inland the west around the great lakes or along the flowing ohio or missouri or mississippi curious much advertising his own appearance and views it cannot be helped offensive to many too free too savage and natural candidly owning that he has neither virtue or knowledge such an account of walt whitman going his own way to his own work because that with the rest is needed because in less terms how can he get what he is resolved to have to himself and to america it is not recorded that whitman made an attempt to give a single lecture at this period though some of the manuscript notes are extant possibly his courage failed him for after all while a man like emerson could hold an audience by calmly reading a manuscript it was because of the art in his carefully chosen words and also because of the fact that he was personally not an average man but the representative of the popular ideal a brahmin the art of lecturing as beecher could lecture or later robert ingersoll was in some ways more exacting than writing poetry it demanded the same inspiration the same flaming words but it also required that this inspiration be under perfect control and obedient to time the orator needs not only a perfect body but an expressive and acting body and act whitman could not as for controlling the mass he thought he loved he should have been merely wounded in his affection had the mass proved cold to his overtures of friendship his offers of leadership furthermore in oratory the whole man actually speaks and if readers as sympathetic as emerson and thoreau found in whitman's book here and there repellent traits would not a miscellaneous audience find still more to dislike in the person himself as mr h b binns puts it he was too loose in the knees to be a commanding platform figure in any case whitman soon abandoned the idea as impracticable and began looking around for a way to make a living now that his dream of royalties had dissolved 
an offer being made he took charge of bennett's williamsburg newspaper the times inglorious no doubt but sensible he remained in charge for some two years or till it was time to set about publishing his third edition altogether his instinct was more literary than he knew yet literary only in proportion as he thought of it as religious in a private memorandum such as men set down when they seek to lay down the law to their wayward wills he wrote in june eighteen fifty seven the great construction of the new bible not to be diverted from the principal object the main life the three hundred and sixty-five it ought to be ready in eighteen fifty nine and in eighteen fifty nine it was but to give a true insight into these years we must remember what that bible was and whence its inspiration came whitman was never a recluse except when he refreshed himself with nature and in this period he was giving free rein to his impulses for mixing with all classes of people that could understand him emerson had sent to brooklyn other visitors thoreau and alcott beecher and bryant whitman's neighbors came to see him and lord houghton from overseas whither his book had reached a friendly hand in thoreau he found what he found in carlyle a distrust not of the individual but of the average man and they made little progress in conversation thoreau's query as to whether whitman had read the oriental writers however gave a new interest to his reading when long after whitman's death tagore visited america he declared that no american had caught the oriental spirit of mysticism so well as he thoreau was repelled by the book rather than by the man it is as if the beast spake he said in an, an infelicitous phrase for it was rather as if a man discovering that he was an animal determined for the moment to be nothing else only to find that civilization cannot be laid aside as can one's garments when one disports like a fish in the surf nevertheless the robe was magnetized by the man and asked him a little patronizingly whitman do you have any idea that you are rather bigger and outside the average may perhaps have immense significance whitman did not answer he knew the dignity and power that lie in simplicity when lord houghton called he was not taken to a hotel but invited to share the whitman's simple meal of potatoes as to the egotism of his leaves thoreau was relieved when he had seen the man thoreau who might have been expected to feel the egotist's jealousy of other self-centered men he may turn out the least braggart of all he wrote a friend having a better right to be confident whitman himself appealed for judgment to the future where there could be no jealousy and the future was rendered a verdict that though he may have lacked taste in his selection of reflectors it would have been false modesty for such a man to have hidden his light under a bushel distinguished visitors were of course the exception whitman's daily companions were his cronies on bus or boat and a group of bohemians who were beginning to frequent a beer cellar on broadway just above bleecker pfaff's was the greenwich village of the day the best new york could do for a quarter a latin the german food was good the beer and champagne excellent and the stout host silent but jovial an ideal place for women when indisposed to ride a bus or to tramp the trottoirs as he called the streets here he might sit and watch the world go by in the evenings when he had finished his day's work on the times and perhaps had gone to a ball game or a prayer meeting afterwards he would here find william winter the brilliant fitz james o'brien henry clapp and george arnold of the saturday press a new weekly which was quick to print whitman's poems and to champion his cause and ada clare queen of bohemia a queen with a sad life but a brilliant mind who strongly appealed to whitman both personally and as an example of the new woman as in all such places there were plentiful arguments over the beer and much wit not infrequently this was at the expense of that hub of the universe where dr holmes was so much at ease and longfellow the last word in poets sometimes whitman would go to pfaff's with the young doctors in bellevue after having visited some sick friend of his and often he would make new acquaintances one of these william dean howells remembered him for his jovian largeness and ease his personal purity and friendliness howells too was to try to do a picture of life in america a realistic picture and like whitman would sometimes put himself into a character of his story 
but perhaps too well howells would know how to avoid arousing the ire of his readers he would select only life's more cheerful aspects and depend more on art than on inspiration in presenting them whitman had learned even in new orleans that it was impossible for him to long to lose himself in mere sensation or good fellowship and high spirits ever and anon, ever and anon came his brooding spirit with the terrible doubt of appearances the hint of the elusive but eternal realities one evening after receiving the welcome with which he was commonly greeted epiphaphs he grew melancholy and set down the following lines the vault of Pfaffs, where the drinkers and laughers meet to eat and drink and carouse while on the walk immediately overhead past the myriad feet of broadway as the dead in their graves are underfoot hidden and the living pass over them recking not of them laugh on laughers drink on drinkers bandy the jest toss the theme from one to another beam up brighten up bright eyes of beautiful young men eat what you having ordered our pleas to see place before you after the work of the day now with appetite eat drink wine drink beer raise your voice behold your friend as he arrives welcome him when from the upper step he looks down upon you with a cheerful look overhead rolls broadway the myriad rushing broadway the lamps are lit the shops blaze the fabrics vividly are seen through the plate-glass window the strong lights from above pour down upon them and are shed outside the thick crowds well dressed the continual crowds as they walk and never end the curious appearance of the faces the glimpse of the eyes and expressions as they flit along o oh, you phantoms oft i pause yearning to arrest some one of you oft i doubt your reality whether you are real i suspect all is but a pageant the women never cared much for polite society as such he was now moving in the parlours of a few excellent families who looked upon him with the greatest respect and treated him with the greatest consideration mrs abbey price was one of these and she took pains to invite people of importance to meet whitman generals scholars and women who were doing significant things whitman did not care for lionizing he could often romp with the children better than he could unbosom himself to persons who had come in the hope of provoking him to do so mrs price and her daughters were quick to perceive in whitman what he had perhaps not yet realized in himself a certain intuitiveness which is more commonly found in and trusted by women than by men they saw too that he was living an inward life of joy which occasionally made his face translucent with something more than a smile as helen price said his religion was that habitual state of feeling in which the person regards everything in god's universe with wonder reverence perfect acceptance and love of course no good woman who saw this in him could dislike the man or distrust the goodness of what he wrote but whitman was never too engrossed in his wonder and reverence of things mystical to perform acts of practical kindness when occasion arose memoranda like this are to be found in his notebooks december twenty eighth eighteen sixty one saturday night mike ellis wandering at the core of lexington avenue and third street took him home to one hundred and fifty thirty seventh street fourth story back room bitter cold night works in stevenson's carriage factory it is interesting to turn through the pages of the brooklyn times for eighteen fifty seven to nine and to note how much the editor has grown in the ten years since we made his acquaintance in the editorial rooms of the eagle then he was an ardent advocate of particular reforms now he is impatient with those who in their conceit offer mere panaceas with your farthing rush light you seek to illumine the illimitable caverns of the infinite with your favourite pint measure you would ladle out the ocean it is pitiful these problems lie so deep and you approach them so superficially these qualities are so momentous and you talk of them so childishly heaven is so high and yet you play before it such fantastic tricks 
nature is so calm so serene so certain in her workings and yet you cannot perceive the beauty and grandeur of the lesson she inculcates you can accept nothing unquestioned you place the blatant enthusiast before the reverent philosopher fanaticism stands with you in the place of faith the cliques of society and the schisms of the church he deplores because due to them the life-blood of society does not circulate with vigour and freedom the churches are one vast lie whitman had written emerson but he was to feel the power of the churches when his editorials exposed their unfairness in churching one judge culver a free soiler the columns of an independent paper were expected to be open to both sides in a public controversy but it was suggested to the editor that he had better not take sides he however was not lacking in courage as a journalist those of our readers who have watched the course of the journal during the years that are past well know that we have never hesitated to assume an independent position and to comment on passing events freely and boldly when we considered it necessary and proper to do so but in a few months he was deprived of his last editorial position doubtless he lost no sleep over it for it meant that he was now free to bring out his third edition we may not look at the increment of poems in that edition however until we have turned a few more pages of the old brooklyn times we observe less politics but when the question of free soil comes up he is outspoken in sympathy with its champions greeley and phillips though he demurs to phillips's invectives against the constitution lincoln has not yet caught his eye but he admires douglas's winning fight with the illinois bosses who would not rather now be douglas than to be president he reads such magazines as the westminster and harper's and writes many editorials suggested by what he finds in them he even turns the pages of the yellow press and smiles at the sensation stories which bonner's ledger had popularized as a type such stories he had once written himself and even now he suggests that they cannot be suddenly replaced by the christian standard since the masses can respond to no higher form of intellectual stimulation than they afford he loafs about the factories in the beer gardens at the ball games he attends the firemen's balls and meets many friends there he inspects the schools as in the eagle days and drops in on the police courts as he had done in new orleans but now his report is less cynical more filled with compassion for the unfortunate when the unhappy home life of his one-time idol charles dickens comes to light he expresses only a comprehending sympathy not always do the happy sentiment genial philosophy and felicitous diction of the novelist spring from an inward perennial fountain of peace not always are the tragedies of the fictionists drawn from the vivid imagination alone of all the calamities of authors of all the infelicities of genius it strikes us that their domestic difficulties are the worst take all else from a man and leave him a good and faithful wife and he can never be called unhappy no matter what may be the fluctuations of fortune but take that comfort consolation and safeguard away and he becomes poor indeed a vessel without a rudder beaten here and there at the mercy of the wind and waves do we not here strike the unmistakable note of personal experience even though we cannot know the details of that private pain for at this very time whitman hinted to the prices that he had just composed a new piece which seems to bear upon the matter he was urged to bring it over and read it a visiting friend read it at whitman's suggestion then mrs price and then after urging whitman himself there was a note of pathos in it which helen price could never forget henry clapp took it at once for the saturday press where it caught the eye of john burroughs who was to be a staunch but sane admirer of the poet through life it was a word out of the sea now out of the cradle endlessly rocking based as whitman told the prices on a real incident the ballad recounts how a boy stole from his farmhouse home at night to listen to the mournful call of a mocking-bird by the sea as it sat on a nest to which its mate would never return but the bird evidently symbolizes the poet's own soul learning in sorrow the sweet mystery of death and separation had his lover died surely some lover had died and he could find solace only in song 
it is hard to believe that any man could more tenderly have cherished a wife and a home than the author of that immortal lyric o past o life o songs of joy in the air in the words over fields loved 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 but my love no more no more with me we two together no more happily whitman had found how to turn his private sorrows to public account perhaps all his public spirit all his poetry was no more the lyric outburst of a bird which cannot choose but sing than it was a salutary sublimation of frustrated personal emotions he was thinking more and more of woman the woman that might be no more does he pick out the pretty faces on the street for an editorial tribute he looks at the average and what he sees gives him little hope for the future of the race how different from the magnificent women he had seen and known in the crescent city how unlike his own perfect mother wherever we go we see hundreds of sickly feeble girls who can hardly muster courage to perform the ordinary avocations of life tell them about early rising fresh air and healthy exercise and they heave a lamentable sigh and are ready to faint away and the cause listless idleness inactivity thin shoes late hours muslin dresses horror of fresh morning air and that detestable stuff stitched in pink and yellow covers which is flooding the country over his own ideal for the modern woman had been described in the eighteen fifty six edition they are not one jot less than i am they are tanned in the face by shining suns and blowing winds their flesh has the old divine suppleness and strength they know how to swim row ride wrestle shoot run strike retreat advance resist defend themselves they are ultimate in their own right they are calm clear well possessed of themselves to call forth such a race which fortunately for us has been called forth it would be necessary to begin with a saner prouder paternity and a youth prepared in health of body and mind for that paternity and what of the young men he saw was he content with the self-realization of the young men whose society he so affected far from it speaking more from observation than personal experience he declared that long before they have reached physical maturity most of our young men are old in life with all its experiences and dissipations we may well realize the fact that there is amazingly little moral restraint almost not at all as a general thing the masses probably two-thirds of city young men in common life hold themselves aloof from the influences of the various benevolent the pious and the reformatory leaders whose movements figure in the papers with any literature except the lowest and most superficial the masses in question are not conversant at all lectures churches scientific expositions etc they never attend all the amusements of the majority of nearly grown and just grown lads about brooklyn and new york are injurious they soon get used to drink and to feel perfectly at home in the most infamous places and to look for their pleasure mostly there many of them by the time they become thirty years of age are old men with ruined constitutions in the summer of eighteen fifty nine whitman was out of a job and none was in sight he had enough new poems to enlarge his book by half but he had no publisher nor was he likely to have one as a poet he had largely dropped out of the public view on june twenty sixth he wrote in his notebook an emphatic injunction to himself it is now time to stir first for money enough to live and provide for him to stir first write stories and get out of this slew then followed directions for writing the projected stories one of these narratives he crudely outlines a melodramatic affair which grows so hazy and formless that he drops it in disgust who was the m to whom he alludes probably neither his mother nor his sister mary for their names would have been written out possibly his new orleans lover was in need or sick for the mocking-bird poem was published a few weeks after this we know nothing of whitman's movements for the rest of this year but he was probably whipping into shape a third edition of his poems by the first of the year thayer and eldridge a publishing firm of boston was willing to bring it out and push its sale in march whitman took his manuscript and went to boston for three months to see it through the press it was to be an odd book typographically and 
with a printer's meticulousness he wanted to keep an eye on it in boston he made new friends thayer and eldridge were also bringing out an abolitionist novel harrington and whitman struck a friendship with its author william douglas o'connor one day walt appeared in the courtroom where a young man frank sanborn was trying to convince the judge why he should not be turned over to the federal authorities to answer the charge of having participated in the john brown raid at harper's ferry whitman had never grown so enthusiastic over john brown as had emerson and thoreau for he did not believe like beecher that the cause of freedom should be fought with bibles and winchesters sanborn noticed the distinguished-looking man in the strange garb standing near the door but did not meet him till later then whitman told him he was there to see that justice was done sanborn in case the judge did not release him the underground railroad thanks to uncle tom's cabin was looked upon in sections of the north as a religious institution and there was in boston a plan on foot to rescue sanborn if necessary whitman would write no more boston ballads he would take a hand himself a few years later o'connor seeking to praise his friend published the story of a chance encounter whitman had during this visit to boston i remember the anecdote told me by a witness of his meeting in a by-street in boston a poor ruffian one whom he had known well as an innocent child now a full-grown youth vicious far beyond his years flying to canada from the pursuit of the police his sin trampled features bearing marks of the recent bloody brawl in new york in which as he supposed he had killed some one and having heard his hurried story freely confided to him while women separated not from the bad even by his own goodness with well i know what tender and tranquil feeling for the ruined being and with a love which makes me think of that god which deserts not any creature quietly at parting after assisting him from his means held him for a moment with his arms around his neck and bending to the face horrible and battered and prematurely old kissed him on the cheek and the poor hunted wretch perhaps for the first time in his low life receiving a token of love and compassion like a touch from beyond the sun hastened away in deep dejection sobbing and in tears his most significant meeting however was with emerson by this time they knew each other well enough for wholesome criticism not to endanger a friendship even with whitman who never took advice in boston when one wants to talk he goes to the common said emerson and thither they went pacing back and forth for two hours under the great elms what emerson wanted to talk to his friend about was the advisability of whitman's leaving out of his new edition the open treatment of sex which had hitherto kept whitman's poetry from any popular acceptance but whitman had not only written more and franker poems of this sort for the new edition but had brought them together in a section of his book called enfant d'adam where they stood in a way conspicuously alone yet he was willing to listen to emerson's arguments respectfully if they could not shake his purpose then he would be unmoved by anything and would on this point henceforth be at peace while writing the poems he had not been without qualms on the point emerson's argument had not been recorded except his emphasis that this was a case in which half a loaf was better than none that to include the poems in question would mean that none of the poems would get to the people who so much needed the tonic of whitman's religious individualism he did not argue that they were impure in intent he was willing to take whitman's word for that though personally as we know he found them unnecessarily indelicate in expression but intent does not determine probable reaction as emerson accurately foresaw looking up to see why such good yankee arguments so skilfully and so sympathetically put were not eliciting any reply from his big companion emerson asked what have you to say to such things only that whitman replied while i can't answer them at all i feel more settled than ever to adhere to my own theory and exemplify it that was the tactical reply to make to an emerson who had once said to the deacons arguing that he might be mistaken in his own intuitions i cannot argue i only know so they went to the american house and had a good dinner the real motives at work under the surface of whitman's psychology might have come to the surface for our enlightenment if not his had he attempted to argue at all 
but it seemed to be a case of realizing that to argue would be to yield and he had made up his stubborn mind not to yield he had no willingness to believe that emerson was right accordingly he called the emersonian argument a worldly one and dismissed it this was the more easily said no doubt because there was a half-truth in it but what was it he was being asked to yield this theory was it merely a plan for his life-work he was being asked to trim yes and all that plan implied of satisfaction to himself of service to others as we have seen the impulse to autobiography was compelling in whitman an impulse which was capable of disguising itself as a humanitarian or literary motive if thus it might the more easily have its way his theory was that a man might be absolutely candid in print might put himself entirely on record might make a complete confession he had a certain pride in himself when he looked at his body reflected in water he had an equal pride in himself when he looked at his soul on paper after all he was writing chiefly for himself if others were provoked into thinking the more highly of themselves so much the better but he would not make himself over in his natural impulses any more than in his poetic diction to meet current standards of acceptability he appealed to the future not to the boston bookstores and in part that future has agreed with him that the american of eighteen sixty was too prudish that a frank and natural treatment is more desirable than a furtive and suggestive one but the future has had qualms too and always will have till the argument comes into the open is clarified as whitman failed to clarify it under the elms of boston common it is only fair that holding his self-justifying theory too closely he should be judged out of his own mouth may it not be that the reason why readers do sometimes feel qualms is that he is not whole enough that he gives love a fragmentary treatment having known only a fragmentary love for from either the individual or the social point of view half a love is not better than none discovering in the random outbursts of the first edition much obvious contradiction whitman was complacent feeling that they all came from an inscrutable source but a paradox has no place in art unless it hints a truth which cannot be stated explicitly one who takes literally emerson's dictum that a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds is likely to find too late that his inconsistency lies not in men's partial views of his great purpose but between his personal desires and his saner judgment whitman professed to include some record of his sexual experiences and his sex emotions because they were an important part of the poet's life as and of any man's life but by the same token he should have let stand in his first edition some of the stock poetical touches which he eliminated with such difficulty for at the time he was not so unconventional as his book would make him appear and it was his hard writing of his theory of composition of not a false pride that caused him to seek to be so entirely different from other poets making great display of candour he nevertheless had less of it in certain directions than he suspected his responsibility does not extend of course to the area of his subconsciousness and of all this whitman may have been blissfully unaware save for the occasional qualms which emerson so ironically put to rest psychologists tell us that the emotions of early childhood are for the most part undifferentiated certainly they are not consciously classified for instance the sense of touch later to express itself most completely in sex and the sense of hunger blend in a feeling larger than either in childhood a certain amount of exhibitionism is normally expressed in a total bodily impulse in which appears a strong desire for athletic exercise but as the normal child advances toward manhood he learns gradually to classify and to conserve his emotions cultivating some repressing others except on occasions recognized as proper men of genius are such because some capacity is unusually large often at the expense of other faculties which remain in a state of more or less arrested development hence frequently the bold achievements of the imagination or the religious founding display of affection is coupled with the impracticability or the moral obtuseness of a child in whitman's case it would seem that he retained in maturity much of the undifferentiated emotionalism of childhood even while accomplishing with his poetic imagination what can only be ascribed to genius 
for instance he did not carefully distinguish between the athletic approach to nature and the affection approach to a person or between the sort of affection which most men have for particular women and that which they experience toward members of their own sex emerson's essays on love and friendship for all their emphasis on transcendental idealism when placed beside whitman's love poem enfant d'adam and his poems of friendship calamus reveal how much more normally mature in his emotions the former was than was this unreflecting caresser of life whitman's treatment of sex is further complicated by the fact that while his leaves of grass was chiefly autobiographic he presented much of it as though it were not so the biographers have always been very cautious in treating many of the poems as the expression of purely personal emotion perhaps without realizing it he confused the lyric and the epic treatment this tended to distort his own judgment as to both the real intent and the effect of some of his confessions there can be no doubt for example that he succeeded in persuading himself that he was religiously socializing his egotism by identifying himself with the average reader but the prior question remains was his in every respect a proper ego to socialize in this way in attempting to analyze what in his talk with emerson whitman was unwilling or unable to analyze note should first be made that he wrote three distinct types of poems on the subject of sex and that he never blended the three into one sentimental lyrics born of an ideal romance like out of the rolling ocean the crowd i heard you solemn sweet pipes of the organ and out of the cradle endlessly rocking have never given could never give offence they are morally complete as a human experience so far as we know even though love here ends not in fulfilment but in separation then there are poems of procreation in which the poet like a second adam beginning a new race of men calls for a healthy and proud breed of parents this too has vista and is proper material for the poet as well as for the eugenist but when in the third small group of poems women attempts to do justice to the emotions which accompany the initial act of paternity he falls back not upon the creative imagination but upon the memories of his limited experience sex itself is clean and sweet of course it has not taken the race always wiser than the individual man in such matters so long a time to discover this elementary fact though the puritan degradation of sex to purely utilitarian ends gave whitman an excellent excuse for emphasizing the fact anew but the expression of sex may be good or bad according to circumstances if it involve a disavowal of responsibility to the individual and to society it is itself marred by the injury it inflicts on the moral nature for among cultivated individuals sex can never be complete or completely celebrated except as a link in the evolution of the race moral as well as biological thinking too precisely on the teleological event to be sure inhibits the very emotion through which nature achieves her hidden purpose yet to indulge in emotion to the disregard of all responsibility for the future is to eliminate from what should be an integrating experience that moral element which alone gives it permanence and human dignity sex contains all as whitman said but only when all is given to it doubtless whitman's repeated insistence on identity as the one constant fact in his universe to would have grown less self-conscious had he through normal experiences found a way to such realization of the harmonious wholeness of his nature for perfect physical aesthetic and spiritual mating such as he being a mixture of bohemian and puritan probably never had is a poem in itself too perfectly satisfying to every emotion to be get any impulse to tell of it in print that were an offence for words are not the proper language for such mysteries if memorial poems must be written they will deal with those ideal elements in the experience which alone can have significance for others had women known more of love he would have realized that those who are worthy to speak of its holy of holies have no impulse to do so over the roofs of the world this is not prudery it is the silence of satisfied power 
we must therefore set down whitman's poems of abandon to his own fragmentary affairs to cur and to his longings for such an experience as would bring him the peace he never found he may have had enough of the latin temperament to cause him to judge an attachment on its own merits rather than to refer it to a code but he had too much of the anglo-saxon in him ever to be a contented dilettante a gay lothario why is it runs his notebook quotation of dickens that a sense comes always crushing on me as of one happiness i've missed in life and one friend and companion i've never made we can never know what were the barriers to whitman's ever marrying surely he could have found more than one woman who was willing indeed as we shall see one of the finest of women let him know as much though this particular avowal it is true came too late when he chose to give his questioners on the point any answer it was that he was inordinately jealous of his own freedom how american he was fearful of restraint yet by that fear restrained had he married a woman fit to match his high spirit and able through his love for her to humble it a little he might have had to learn adaptability might even have had to restrain his muse somewhat but would he not have learned also to speak with more authority on all those themes that were dearest to his pen he might then have given us not indeed that fireside sentiment devoid of any original thought which his country found so satisfying in longfellow but stimulating modern songs of the first and last of societies the family without which there can be no sane paternity no solid state one may pity him for his limitation then without making a virtue out of them in many ways he succeeded in loving his art and his fellow-men the more as he had no family of his own to love pity is appropriate indeed for with a happy home life whitman would have discovered attendant blessings his friendship for men would have been purified relieved of that peculiar sentimentality which expressed itself in caresses and which sharply distinguished it from the gospel of the religious leaders he aspired to supplant friendship might then have developed into a useful wholesome comradeship in work something about which he knew little rather than perpetual indulgence in loafing on the open road moreover it would have given him a second great purpose in life to complement and relieve his poetic work and to make it the more evenly balanced he had nature to go to fortunately as did thoreau but while nature is a most comforting mistress she is no wife at all she commonly spoils those who have no other love whitman's determination to publish a complete confession of his inward life led him in this boston edition to set forth a group of poems on friendship or comradeship or love for men which is still more pathetic than his futile reaching forth for the love of woman whitman it must be obvious had one of the most powerful emotional natures that have been exposed to the gaze of the world and emotion no less matter is indestructible if not starved it will express itself in one way or another the emotion here venting itself was so great as to carry with it for a time waltz every ambition the book was published when his craving for affection was at its height long i thought that knowledge alone would suffice me oh if i could but obtain knowledge then my lands engrossed me lands of the prairies ohio's land the southern savannas engrossed me for them i would live i would be their orator then i met the examples of old and new heroes i heard of warriors sailors and all dauntless persons and it seemed to me that i too had it in, in me to be as dauntless as zinni and would be so and then to enclose all it came to me to strike up the songs of the new world and then i believed my life must be spent in singing but now take notice land of the prairies land of the south savannas ohio's land take notice you canuck woods and you lake huron and all that with you roll toward niagara and you niagara also and you california mountains that you each and all find somebody else to be your singer of songs for i can be your singer of songs no longer one who loves me is jealous of me and withdraws me from all but love with the rest i dispense i sever from what i thought would suffice me for it does not it is now empty and tasteless to me i heed knowledge and the grandeur of the states and the example of heroes no more i am indifferent to my own songs i will go with him i love it is to be enough for us that we are together we never separate again 
of course this is a poem born of a mood and must not be unduly exaggerated but it is an unhealthy mood that leads the man away from the work of his life to accomplish nothing for himself or others and it is the mood which predominates in these thirty-eight pages the glory of romantic love for a wife lies not only in its own satisfactions but in that it stimulates man to perform nobly his share of the work of the world but here on the contrary a man yields to an impulse which were common would soon reduce the world to chaos it is true that whitman for a time soothed himself with the dream that he was doing a high public service by encouraging a sort of friendship between men equal in power to the romantic love which would unite the nation by ties more real than laws or customs or institutions but he should have realized from his own experience as expressed in the poem just quoted that when friendship becomes a jealous emotion rather than a shared ideal a comradeship in work it encounters psychological barriers to its socialization many readers have found comfort in these poems no doubt and have for a time acted toward each other as though there were some mystic religious tie between them but this is due to the effort which whitman made to spiritualize the whole conception i think it is not for life i am chanting here my chant of lovers i think it must be for death for how calm how solemn it grows to ascend to the atmosphere of lovers death or life i am then indifferent here whitman runs counter to his own early doctrine that happiness is to be sought in the present that death is but a fulfilling of life like the early colonizing puritans he dreams of a heaven after death because he has no hope of realizing it fully under the conditions of life but why not it is because these dreams will get mixed up with reality because the body limits the soul as much as the soul lifts the body here too he was not without his qualms he has the terrible doubt of appearances the erstwhile self-sufficient man proud of his physical health must now acknowledge that his soul is often sick hours discouraged distracted for the one i cannot content myself without soon i saw him content himself without me hours when i am forgotten oh weeks and months are passing but i believe i am never to forget sullen and suffering hours i am ashamed but it is useless i am what i am hours of my torment i wonder if other men ever have the like out of the like feelings he is suspicious of the whole experience at least the degree to which it seeks to master him earth my likeness though you look so impassive ample and spheric there i now suspect it is not all i now suspect there is something fierce in you eligible to burst forth for an athlete is enamoured of me and i of him but toward him there is something fierce and terrible in me eligible to burst forth i dare not tell it in words not even in these songs throughout the treatment is esoteric furtive symbolical only a few are expected to understand this gospel which is advanced as solution for the ills of the state this dream of the new city of friends others are warned to leave it alone nor will it the candidates for my love unless at most a very few prove victorious nor will my poems do good only they will do just as much evil perhaps more for all is useless without that which you may guess at many times and not hid that which i hinted at therefore release me and depart on your way how different are these hard conditions from those which jesus laid down for entering the kingdom of heaven and yet whitman's conception of himself as a religious leader may well have persuaded him that they were essentially the same we need not dwell longer on the poems in which the poet wrestles with a passion so tragically powerful they coloured his worlds now transfiguring it with a platonic dream of immortal friendship now giving it a hue more lurid saturate them with yourself all ashamed and wet glow upon all i have written or shall write bleeding drops let all be seen in your light blushing drops it is a relief to turn to some of the other poems added in this edition notably to the song of joys to the poem in which he claims christ as comrade and brother in the name of a common promethean spirit and to the poem which paraphrasing the story of jesus sympathy for the outcast whitman professes a charity as impartial as the sunlight with antecedents developing the idea that man is an acme of things accomplished an enclosure of things to be 
may have been suggested by darwin's epoch-making book published the year before the song at sunset strikes the old note of faith in god's creation while the concluding piece so long always kept at the end of whitman's editions is a swan song as if whitman felt this to be the last book he should write but his country was collaborator with him always and her hour of trial would yet call from him a wholesomer aspiration a sublimer art end of section nine section ten of whitman and interpretation in narrative by emory holloway this librivox recording is in the public domain book five part one a glimpse of war's hell scenes despite emerson's fears the new edition of leaves of grass sold well it made whitman known to a large number of readers not a few of whom were willing to show their appreciation in the troubled times to follow to stimulate the sale of the book bayer and eldridge issued a booklet of reviews for free distribution thus clearing the volume itself of all appendices on whitman's return from boston in june he resumed his life in loafing well satisfied at the new turn of events at last he had a regular publisher and it seemed as if he might find after all that a life devoted to writing would harmonize his errant desires he continued to frequent befaffs in the evening to ride with the stage drivers in the afternoons but he also took time to attend his sick friends in the hospitals where the doctors referred to him as the saint at home his brother andrew had married and moved to a house of his own jeff too had married and had named his first daughter manahatta in compliment to her uncle walt's poems the jefferson whitmans lived on portland avenue with walt and the family jeff was steady and though sometimes given to moodiness he was ordinarily the most cheerful member of the group the monthly salary of ninety dollars he earned as assistant to the chief engineer of the city waterworks was when the war left him to be the only breadwinner at home the main reliance of the whole family george too had married but soon he was to be drawn into the maelstrom of war his wife remaining with the family on portland avenue these increasing family relationships made demands upon walt's cheer and advice and he found a sort of vicarious parenthood in his relation to his brother's children the family had many sorrows and some friction conspicuously in the unhappy marriage of walt's favorite sister hannah who moved to burlington vermont with her husband a painter but to one and all whitman preached cheerfulness and resignation self-respect and tolerance affairs in the nation had been growing so ominous that despite whitman's withdrawal from politics and political editing he could not but be conscious that he was treading upon a volcano the fight for free soil in bloody kansas seemed but the prelude to the terrible diapason of civil war and when john brown sought to free the soil even of the south it was obvious that unless such an attitude were repudiated in the north a wall of suspicion hatred conflicting interests and theories of government would divide the country into belligerent camps instead of being repudiated in the north john brown was by even emerson and thoreau treated as a martyr to his convictions they did not flinch from his reductio ad absurdum of their transcendental doctrines whitman too sympathized with the old fanatic in his courage and unselfishness though he did not approve of his methods i would sing how an old man tall with white hair mounted the scaffold to virginia i was at hand silent i stood with teeth shut close i watched i stood very near you old man when cool and indifferent but trembling with age and your unhealed wounds you mounted the scaffold the year eighteen fifty nine to sixty seemed to the poet a year of meteors portents all modelled with evil and good year of forebodings and the ship of state was to be guided through these troubled waters by an almost unknown hand that of the newly elected abraham lincoln 
whitman as a republican had voted for him though new york was far from unanimous in doing so lincoln like himself put the preservation of the union above all other questions but as yet whitman knew little of the homely melancholy man learning that the president-elect was to pass through new york on his way to new washington and would stop at the astor house walt determined to see him in his judgment the presidency had for twelve years been in the hands of deformed mediocre snivelling unreliable false-hearted men but here was a man from the west would he have the look of the future in his eyes and the look of freedom making sure of a good vantage point by climbing to the driver's box on one of the buses that had been turned out of broadway whitman looked over the sullen and silent crowds to catch the first sight of lincoln how different from the time he had seen lafayette on the same spot or jackson webster kosuth clay or a year before the prince of wales occasions when he had thrilled to all that indescribable human roar and magnetism unlike any other sound in the universe the glad exulting thunder shouts of countless unloosed throats of men but on this occasion not a voice not a sound plainly new york did not trust abraham lincoln he was not city-bred but it had been tacitly agreed that if his supporters would refrain from demonstration his more numerous enemies would do likewise though both had come armed for the worst ominous indeed like the false peace and prosperity of the whole nation at the time presently so whitman recalled the experience two or three shabby hack barouches made their way with some difficulty through the crowd and drew up at the astor house entrance a tall figure stepped out of the centre of these barouches paused leisurely on the sidewalk looked up at the granite walls and looming architecture of the grand old hotel and then after a relieving stretch of arms and legs turned round for over a minute to slowly and good-humouredly scan the appearance of the vast and silent crowds there were no speeches no compliments no welcome as far as i could hear not a word said he looked with curiosity upon that immense sea of faces and the sea of faces returned the look with similar curiosity in both there was a dash of comedy almost farce such as shakespeare puts in his blackest tragedies the president-elect looked fit for his great task the sharp observing eyes of whitman noted his perfect composure and coolness his unusual and uncouth height his dress of complete black stove-pipe hat pushed back on the head dark brown complexion seamed and wrinkled yet canny looking face black bushy head of hair disproportionately long neck and his hands held behind as he stood observing the people to do justice to that strange figure the journalist thought would be needed the eyes and brains and finger touch of plutarch and aeschylus and michelangelo assisted by rabelais to lincoln as to any informed person it must have seemed that the nation would be out of hand even before he could take up the reins of power immediately on his election the south mistakenly interpreting his victory as the elevation of the hated abolitionists to power had issued a manifesto calling for secession and within a week after his inauguration on march fourth eighteen sixty one the confederacy had framed its own constitution at montgomery alabama but whitman with true bohemian detachment and quaker passivity saw nothing that he could do about it and went on his way without marked change of habit he was as always fond of the opera which he would attend when he could sometimes taking a friend or his brother jeff with him or martha jeff's wife whom he loved dearly on the twelfth of april he had gone alone to the opera in fourteenth street coming out after the performance about midnight he heard as he walked down broadway toward the ferry the wild shouts of newsboys darting back and forth crying extras walt bought one but it was too dark to see what the commotion was about so he crossed to the metropolitan hotel to read under a lamp what his eye caught was a brief dispatch stating that the south had begun war by firing upon the flag at fort sumter a crowd gathered many having no papers someone perhaps whitman read the news aloud to them too staggered by the sudden insolent blow of war to speak they separated to meditate its significance alone as for whitman who had 
long trained himself to look toward the future and who had seen many of his shrewd prophecies come to pass perhaps the news was a surprise only in the sense that bad news violent shakings of our easy-going lives always seem to come suddenly if only by contrast for in his last edition of poems he had prophesied this very thing a poem called with satirical burlesque to the states to identify the sixteenth seventeenth or eighteenth presidentiad administrations of fillmore pierce and buchanan reveals whitman's fear lest politics in such incompetent hands would bring the country to grief why reclining interrogating why myself and all drowsing what deepening twilight scum floating atop of the waters who are they as bats and night dogs askant in the capital what a filthy presidentiad o south your torrid suns o north your arctic freezings are those really congressmen are those the great judges is that the president then i will sleep a while yet for i see that these states sleep for reasons with gathering murk with muttering thunder and lambent shoots we all duly awake south north east west inland and seaboard we will surely awake in prose whitman made more definite his criticism of the party politics of the period in the following vitriolic description he perhaps has the buffalo convention in mind one of these conventions from eighteen forty to sixty exhibited a spectacle such as could never be seen except in our own age and in these states the members who composed it were seven-eighths of them the meanest kind of bawling and blowing office-holders office-seekers pimps malignants conspirators murderers fancy men custom-house clerks contractors kept editors spaniels well trained to carry the fetch and fetch jobbers infidels disunionists terrorists male riflers slave-catchers pushers of slavery creatures of the president creatures of the would-be presidents spies bribers compromisers lobbyers sponges ruined sports expel gamblers policy backers monte dealers duelists carriers of concealed weapons deaf men pimpled men scarred inside with vile disease gaudy outside with gold chains made from the people's money and harlot's money twisted together crawling serpentine men the lousy combings and born freedom sellers of the earth and whence came they from backyards and bar-rooms from out of the custom-houses marshals offices post-offices and gambling hells from the president's house the jail the station house from unnamed by-places where devilish disunion was hatched at midnight from political hearses and from the coffins inside and from the shrouds inside of the coffins from the tumors and abscesses of the land from the skeletons and skulls in the vaults of the federal almshouses and from the running sores of the great cities such i say formed or absolutely controlled in the forming of the entire personnel the atmosphere nutriment and child of our municipal state and national politics substantially permeating handling deciding and welding everything legislation nominations elections public sentiments etc while the great masses of the people farmers mechanics and traders were helpless in their grip these conditions were mostly prevalent in the north and west and especially in new york and philadelphia cities and the southern leaders bad enough but of a far higher order struck hands and affiliated with and used them is it strange that a thunderstorm followed such morbid and stifling cloud strata but the populace are awakened now at midnight forty years had i in my city seen soldiers parading forty years as a pageant till unawares the lady of this teeming and turbulent city sleepless amid her ships her houses her incalculable wealth with her million children around her suddenly at dead of night and news from the south incensed struck with clenched hand the pavement a shark electric the night sustained it till with ominous hum our hive at daybreak poured forth its myriads from the houses then and the workshops and through all the doorways leaped they tumultuous and low manhattan arming 
three days later lincoln answered the challenge of carolina by calling for seventy five thousand volunteers to put down the rebellion in three months he knew as little as did the rest of the country about the proportions of the war then beginning but though douglas the champion of squatter sovereignty had polled almost as many votes in the north as lincoln neither receiving a majority throughout the country at the call for volunteers there was the natural rush to the colors by men of all factions george whitman though married was one of the first to go enlisting as a private in the fifty first new york volunteers perhaps walt felt the impulse to go also for though his gray hair would make him appear too old to enlist he knew his health was perfect in any case the war was but a few days old when he vowed a vow in unto himself as if in preparation for withstanding whatever hardships the war might bring him on the field or elsewhere thursday april eighteenth eighteen sixty one i have this hour this day resolved to inaugurate a sweet clean blooded body by ignoring all drinks but water and pure milk and all fat meats late suppers a great body a purged cleansed spiritualized invigorated body at once he began to absorb the war to allow it to have over his personal habits and indulgences the cleansing ennobling effect of an unselfish purpose whether from this cause or from motives of patriotic economy we shall see that for years he lived very frugally even though performing the most enervating tasks whitman could enjoy as few others lassitude and loafing but when deeply stirred he showed that there was firmness too in his character what emerson saw whitman felt in an age of fops and toys wanting wisdom void of right who shall nerve heroic boys to hazard all in freedom's fight break sharply off their jolly games forsake their comrades gay and quit proud homes and youthful dames for famine toil and fray yet on the air benign speed nimbler messages that waft the breath of grace divine to hearts in sloth and ease so nigh is grandeur to our dust so near is god to man when duty whispers low thou must the youth replies i can it is a moment which seldom comes more than once in a lifetime the flag never seems more beautiful than when every drum is beating to muster in its defence it is the poet's hour and he must make clear the claims of the ideal mother of all over each man's private loves or hates where bret hart was writing his reveille and thereby making sure that california would remain in the union whitman caught up the same strain in manhattan the indifference of the electorate might have long expressed itself in the sordidness and inefficiency of politics but he would show that the grandeur of a great sacrifice was yet nigh our democratic dust through these summoning drums the call of the nation the hope of the future becomes audible and we who have seen modern warfare enlisting every man and woman and child in the nation revealing the little suspected relation of each to all can respond to this poem even more universally than our civil war ancestors could beat beat drums blow bugles blow through the windows through doors burst like a ruthless force into the solemn church and scatter the congregation into the school where the scholar is studying leave not the bridegroom quiet no happiness must he have now with his bride nor the peaceful farmer any peace ploughing his field or gathering his grain so fierce you were and pound you drums so shrill you bugles blow beat beat drums blow bugles blow over the traffic of cities over the rumble of wheels in the streets are beds prepared for sleepers at night in the houses no sleepers must sleep in those beds no bargainers bargains by day or no brokers or speculators would they continue would the talkers be talking would the singer attempt to sing would the lawyer rise in the court to state his case before the judge then rattle quicker heavier drums you bugles wilder blow beat beat drums blow bugles blow make no parley stop for no expostulation mind not the timid mind not the weeper or prayer mind not the old man beseeching the young man let not the child's voice be heard nor the mother's entreaties make even the trestles to shake the dead where they lie awaiting the hearses so strong you thump o terrible drum so loud you bugles blow 
when the emotion is so strong in whitman and the desire to reach his audience so compelling his form approximates regular metre the freedom that remains being retained not for its own sake but as itself expressive of variations in the matter but especially in the martial spirit of the man as of the nation appears something unsuspected and grand it was painful to see a city go forth to war whitman's own family had sent forth the best soldier it had yet it would have been worse not to go spring up o city not for peace alone but be indeed yourself warlike fear not submit to no models but your own o city behold me incarnate me as i have incarnated you i have rejected nothing you offered me whom you adopted i have adopted good or bad i never question you i love all i do not condemn anything i chant and celebrate all that is yours yet peace no more in peace i chanted peace but now the drum of war is mine war red war is my song through your streets o city and the city responded as cities do with spontaneous enthusiasm one regiment marched forth from brooklyn with pieces of rope dangling from their rifle barrels with which each man expected to bring back his contemptible prisoner but when the fifty first began its many hard campaigns its many decimating battles walt was left behind why had he not marched forth too was it that he was eager to urge others to battle like bryant in our country's call but without bryant's age as an excuse willing to remain behind when the danger neared in making decision on such a point it was characteristic of whitman to feel safest when he followed his own deep impulses rather than the cold suggestions of his reason these would have told him that though forty-two years old he was strong enough to fight and he was practically unencumbered but though he did not go so far as the quaker whittier in protesting against all war he did have the quakers and the poets natural shrinking from anything so coarse and cruel in its methods it was for him to save life rather than to take it and to save it he would gladly risk his own besides he was the virtual head of the family now that his father was dead and his older brother jesse was mentally unfit his uncommon love for his mother moreover would prompt him to remain as her comfort and provider while george was away it was by no means sure that any great army would be needed in any case and if not of course the younger men should go first then too he remembered his own lines in eighteen fifty five concerning the great poet in war he is the most deadly force of the war who recruits him recruits horse and foot he can make every word he speaks draw blood just as it was the duty of the nation's president to remain at washington perhaps it was the duty of the nation's poet to sing the needful song provided only he do it from duty and not from fear already in whitman's mind a new book was taking form or rather an edition of his life book the leaves to record his reactions to this new act in the national drama he would call it drum taps but he might have to wait for some time to get it published and these poems to have practical value in the war should reach the people now the atlantic had welcomed his bardic symbols when he was in boston and proud of having appeared in such a magazine whitman determined to send to it three of his early war poems but the magazine finding that it would be crowded for space till these poems would have lost their timely interest had to return them about this time however a new paper was being started in brooklyn the standard and in june whitman was employed to write for it a series of special articles on the history of the city when these brooklyniana sketches had only begun however something caused them suddenly to cease it may have been the disastrous revelations of the first bull run making it clear to north and south alike that this war would be no summer holiday but a struggle to the death what might it not involve whitman would have to think it over so he betook himself to nature again going in the fall to visit his sister mary at greenport since the bull run fiasco the contestants who were more evenly matched all things considered than might appear were taking time to prepare themselves for a great struggle accordingly little significant fighting took place during the first year george was well and the war was too undramatic to harry the emotions of those at a distance whitman was feeling too a natural reaction to that impulse which had beat the mustering drums if nations stopped long enough when they are mad to ask themselves the question what they are quarrelling about we would have no wars he said with deliberation long afterwards 
that was what the constitutional union party had said in the eighteen sixty campaign were history not always prejudiced in favor of the accomplished fact it might appear that that party though it polled only a handful of votes had been nearest right after all in any case it was nearest what was most fundamental in whitman's temperament he resented any attack on his beloved union yes but what was that union did it not include his magnet south to which he was bound by all that was southern and latin in his nature but the war was on and this was no time for thinking so precisely of the event at any time he might be summoned to the colors himself nevertheless he would take a farewell of the woods and shores of palmanic while he could a brief vacation before becoming involved personally in the struggle let us sketch one more glimpse of him before scenes of war have altered forever the spirit of the fawn it is the day before waterloo but he spends it in outdoor sport not in wild and wicked revel whitman had just hauled up a big black fish at the end of the dock at greenport and was casting in again when he heard a voice from a sloop that was making for the pier ease away your lines for a moment requested the young sailor who was manning her till we shove along the pier where are you bound for asked whitman as he complied to montauk point said the young man adding with sailor-like hospitality won't you go along whitman would in fisherman's garb though he was sending his fish to his sister he entered the sloop not however by using the sailor's proffered shoulder for a step whitman weighed over two hundred in the little boat were a party of lively girls a chaperoning cleric and one or two younger boys the only misgiving whitman had so far as to the party was concerned was caused by the country clergyman but discovering him to be exceptional among his kind in that he laughed and told stories and ate luncheons just like a common man whitman made room on the open road for him too high spirits reigned and whitman contributed his share but he did not need this for pleasure as for me i blessed my lucky stars for merely to sail to lie on my back and gaze by the half-hour at the passing clouds overhead merely to breathe and live in the sweet air and clear sunlight to hear the musical chatter of the girls as they pursued their own glee was happiness enough for one day you may laugh at me if you like he told the readers of the standard but there is an ecstatic satisfaction in such lazy philosophy such passive yielding up of one's self to the pure emanation of nature better than the most exciting pleasures landing at length on montauk point they proceeded to give vent to their pent-up emotions man is always a little wilder even in his recreations in war time it is whitman's voice that is lifted loudest in declamation and merriment we rambled up the hills to the top of the highest we ran races down we scampered along the shore jumping from rock to rock we declaimed all the violent appeals and defiances we could remember commencing with celestial states immortal powers give ear away on to the ending which announced that richard had almost lost his wind by dint of calling richmond to arms i doubt whether these terrible echoes ever before vibrated with such terrible ado then we pranced forth again like mad kind we threw our hats in the air aimed stones at the shrieking seagulls mocked the wind and imitated the cries of various animals in a style that beat nature all out we challenged each other to the most deadly combats we tore various past passions into tatters made love to the girls in the divine words of shakespeare and other poets whereat the said girls had the rudeness to laugh till the tears ran down their cheeks in torrents we indulged in some impromptu quadrilles of which the chasse took each participant couple so far away from the other that they were like never to get back we hopped like crows we pivoted like indian dervishes we went through the trial dance of la bayadere with wonderful vigour and some one of our party came nigh dislocating his neck through volunteering to turn somersaults like a circus fellow everybody caught the contagion and there was not a sensible behaved creature among us to rebuke our mad antics by comparison not far behind such a man as his child and by dropping into its moods he regains the elasticity of spirit which he needs throughout the day the riot of joy was unconstrained but going home the sailors miscalculated the tide so that they had to spend the night on board the sloop at this whitman was at home spreading a huge bearskin on the deck he threw himself upon it and while others sang ditties and told ghost stories he looked silently at the stars 
when quiet ensued he made his bed in the furled sail like an old salt but he could scarcely sleep for watching the constellations the countless armies of heaven marching stilly and slowly on and others coming out of the east to take their places they reminded one of those other countless armies marching to death throughout the land they brought the solitary muser back to reality he would never be the same care-free spirit again poets sometimes have premonitions of such things and it was with no little reluctance that whitman ended so happy an outing we landed at the dock and went up to the village and felt the tameness of respectable society settling around us again doubtless it was all right but as for me i fancied the mercury dwindling down 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 into the very calves of my legs back in brooklyn and to work in december he recommenced his promised articles for the standard running them very irregularly till the next november whitman had for several years been collecting data for such a book reading old histories talking with antiquaries examining landmarks exploring the files of old newspapers in his own retentive memory no one had attempted just that sort of thing in brooklyn and whitman's rambling familiar stories full of local gossip were popular but it was strange business for the bard of the future to be about just now doubtless it was a pot-boiler the only thing he could sell and doubtless also he had like his outing had the effect of affording some relief from the tormenting anxieties of the day if the motives which actuate an individual are mixed those behind the acts of a nation are more so however simple the politicians may try to make them appear so that after the first war fever had passed whitman as an intelligent man must have tried to weigh in his mind the arguments which north and south were sending millions of men to the field of battle his attitude toward life made it easy for him to sympathize with all points of view even though he felt compelled to act according to his own such temperaments are fitted for anything better than the sharp efficient decisions of war time with nearly half the north in sympathy with the south with his own sympathies divided though never his loyalties it was no wonder that the only thing which seemed to remain fixed in this time of doubt was the doubter himself quicks and years that whirl me i know not whither your schemes politics fail lines give way substances mock and elude me only the theme i sing the great and strong possessed soul eludes not one's self must never give way that is the final substance that out of all is sure out of politics triumphs battles life what at last finally remains when shows break up what but one's self is sure but this war was to teach him that there is something more enduring than the individual something nobler than the aggrandizement of one's self and when he should see it he would be free from the torment of uncertainty concerning individual action or reaction the rifts of war disturbed even bohemia one night at pfaff's when the war was being discussed by unionists and copperheads as southern sympathizers were stigmatized regardless of the honesty of their opinions george arnold arose and lifting his glass of wine proposed the toast success to the southern arms whitman usually deliberate thereupon burst out into a speech of patriotic indignation in the heat of the violent argument arnold reached across the table and took whitman by the hair but when he had said his say whitman took his leave of pfaff's not to return until twenty years later when only pfaff himself remained of the old merry group the destiny that has our hero in charge has prepared an absolutely new stage for him and now she gives him his unmistakable cue when burnside failed in his drive toward richmond losing to lee great numbers at fredericksburg this fate listed george whitman in the new york papers among the wounded already the family on portland avenue had learned in reading newspapers accounts of battles to look first not for news of victory or defeat but to see whether the fifty-first new york volunteers were engaged and whether the name of lieutenant whitman appeared among the dead or wounded at last on december fourteenth it did but the dispatch neglected to indicate with the cruel brevity of such communications whether the injury were serious or trifling there was but one thing to do walt must go at once to care for george hastily packing a carpet-bag drawing fifty dollars out of the bank and bidding the family good-bye walt was off for philadelphia where he made a quick change for washington 
as luck would have it he ran across william douglas o'connor whom he had met in boston and the o'connors would have nothing but that he should stay with them eager to see whether his brother were in one of the washington hospitals he hastily made the round of them in two days when he found that george had not been sent up from the front he then tried to get down to the army on the rappahannock and finally succeeded in doing so women's letter to his distressed mother recounts his first experiences at the seat of war washington monday forenoon december twenty ninth eighteen sixty two dear dear mother friday the nineteenth inst i succeeded in reaching the camp of the fifty first new york and found george alive and well in order to make sure that you would get the good news i sent back my messenger to washington a telegraphic dispatch i dare say you did not get it for some time as well as a letter and the same to hannah at burlington i have stayed in camp with george ever since till yesterday when i came back to washington about the twenty fourth george got jeff's letter of the twentieth mother how much you must have suffered all that week till george's letter came and all the rest must too as to me i know i put in about three days of the greatest suffering i ever experienced in my life i wrote to jeff how i had my pocket picked in a jam and hurried changing cars at philadelphia so that i landed here without a dime the next two days i spent hunting through the hospitals walking day and night unable to write trying to get information trying to get access to big people etc i could not get the least clue to anything odell would not see me at all but thursday afternoon i lit on a way to get down on the government boat that runs to aquia creek and so by railroad to the neighborhood of falmouth opposite fredericksburg so by degrees i worked my way to ferrero's brigade which i found friday afternoon without much trouble after i got to camp when i found dear brother george and found that he was alive and well oh you may imagine how trifling all my little cares and difficulties seemed they vanished into nothing and now that i have lived for eight or nine days amid such scenes as camps furnish and had a practical part in it all and realized the way that hundreds of thousands of good men are now living and have had to live for a year or more not only without any of the comforts but with death and sickness and hard marching and hard fighting and no success at that for their continual experience really nothing we call trouble seems worth talking about one of the first things that met my eye in camp was a heap of feet arms legs etc under a tree in front of a hospital the lacy house george is very well in health has a good appetite i think he is at times more wearied out and homesick than he shows but stands it upon the whole very well every one of the soldiers to a man wants to get home i suppose jeff got quite a long letter i wrote from camp about a week ago i told you that george had been promoted to captain his commission arrived while i was there when you write address captain george w whitman company k fifty first new york volunteers ferrero's brigade near falmouth virginia jeff must write oftener put in a few lines from mother even if it is only two lines then in the next letter a few lines from matt and so on you have no idea how letters from home cheer one up in camp and dissipate homesickness while i was there george still lived in captain francis's tent there were five of us altogether to eat sleep write etc in a space twelve feet square but we got along very well the weather all along was very fine and would have got along to perfection but captain francis is not a man i could like much i had a very little to say to him george is about building a place half hut and half tent for himself he is probably about it this very day and then he will be better off i think every captain has a tent in which he lives transacts company business etc has a cook or a man of all work and in the same tent mess and sleep his lieutenants and perhaps the first sergeant they have a kind of fireplace and the cook's fire is outside on the open ground george had very good times while francis was away the cook a young disabled soldier tom is an excellent fellow and a first-rate cook and the second lieutenant pooley is a tip-top young pennsylvanian tom thinks all the world of george and when he heard he was wounded on the day of the battle he left everything got across the river and went hunting for george through the field through thick and thin i wrote to jeff that george was wounded by a shell a gash in the cheek you could stick a 
splint through into the mouth but it has healed up without difficulty already everything is uncertain about the army whether it moves or stays where it is there are no furloughs granted at present i will stay here for the present at any rate long enough to see if i can get any employment at anything and shall write what luck i have of course i am unsettled at present dear mother my love walt if jeff or any rights address me care of major hapgood paymaster u s a army washington d c i send my love to dear sister matt and little sis and to andrew and all my brothers oh matt how lucky it was you did not come together we could never have got down to see george winman remained a week or so in this camp here he was awakened to a life of self-forgetting action saw the grim danger face to face and for a time wondered if the union were not gone after all any glamour war may have had for him at a distance disappeared before this cruel reality as he talked with men eager for nothing so much as to get back home as he ate his monotonous salt pork and hardtack and as he saw the young men he loved mutilated and dying with little comfort or assistance in their extremity looking for his wounded brother on his arrival in camp he went naturally to the lacy house a southern mansion which was used as a hospital as he approached the house he noted at the foot of a tree the heap of amputated feet legs hands etc a full load for a one-horse cart to which he had alluded in his letter to his mother several dead bodies lie near he added in his memorandum book each covered with its brown woollen blanket in another notebook he jotted down this sight at daybreak in camp of the hospital tent three dead men lying each with a blanket spread over him i lift up one and look at the young man's face calm and yellow tis strange young man i think this face of yours the face of my dead christ but to get his emotions we must wait till the experience has had time and the author leisure to find poetic expression a sight in camp in the daybreak gray and dim as for my tent i emerged so early sleepless as slow i walk in the cool fresh air the path by the hospital tent three forms i see on stretchers lying brought out their untended line over each the blanket spread ample brownish woollen blanket gray and heavy blanket folding covering all curious i halt and silent stand then with light fingers i from the face of the nearest just lift the blanket who are you elderly man so gaunt and grim with well grayed hair and flesh all sunken about the eyes who are you my dear comrade then to the second i step and who are you my child and darling who are you sweet boy with cheeks yet blooming then to the third a face nor child nor old very calm as of beautiful yellow-white ivory young man i think i know you i think this face is the face of the christ himself dead and divine and brother of all and here again he lies the note of calamus friendship is now sweetly solemnized by death women who two years before had been so tormented by his hunger for the emotional friendship of men discovered on the battlefield not only the meaning of comradeship for men en masse but learned the blessedness of those who give rather than receive compared to the boys of sixteen and the young men of twenty he seemed in his graying beard and his great benignity a father rather than a friend he learned to address each of these brave youngsters as dear son and comrade and they called him father perhaps this was what he had hungered for so long not knowing it the love of a father for a child on whom to lavish his affection and help he had dreamed of the future of his race his land but here marshalled in the tested power of a great army he saw that future in its youth and he knew that it was safe no poet can be unmoved by the sight of a camp asleep if like whitman he have the mothering instinct in him he feels that he stands guard over an immense family detached from and yet tied by invisible bonds to every sleeping form by the bivouac's fitful flame a procession winding around me solemn and sweet and slow but first i note the tents of the sleeping army the fields and woods dim outline the darkness lit by spots of kindled fire the silence like a phantom far or near an occasional figure moving the shrubs and trees as i lift my eyes they seem to be stealthily watching me while wind in procession thoughts o oh, tender and wondrous thoughts of life and death of home and the past and loved and of those that are far away a solemn and slow procession there as i sit on the ground by the bivouac's fitful flame 
Whitman went impartially among the wounded boys in blue and those in gray he would speak to them with uniform solicitude seeking to be of what service he could to all he had no funds but he wrote letters read conversed or best of all laid hold on despairing souls with the magnetism of his great health and hope he had to cultivate that intuition which makes women the best nurses detecting without words the man who needed him most and who would respond to his care sometimes a deep friendship sprang up to last for years those who have known war only through the experiences of the united states armies in the great war of recent years with its highly organized and adequately trained and financed corps of red cross nurses and its welfare workers can hardly understand how appreciated was such a wholesome and human volunteer as whitman trained to friendship with all classes skilled in nursing disabled stage drivers doing nothing in perfunctory manner or from mixed motives he went into the hospital tents on the rappahannock where homesick boys wounded or suffering from diarrhoea that scourge of camps lay on the ground in the winter and grew worse till sent to washington often too late for better care with a detachment of these whitman returned on a flat car train and a government steamer to washington doing what he could to aid them on the way but what could one man do to handle a problem which required an organized corps on the boat i had my hands full he said one poor fellow died going up every transport welfare worker will understand the meaning of that for a time whitman lived with the o'connors in fact until they gave up their apartment they would accept no money for board and inasmuch as he was devoting his energies to his hospital ministrations for this was one thing he could do not only to help win the war but to save the men from camp he had sent a number of dispatches to the new york times which printed them as special correspondence from the front and now at intervals he sent letters to new york and brooklyn papers recording his observations and describing his work nor did he hesitate to criticize the methods of a feudal military system or callousness and bad judgment on the part of those entrusted with the wounded he also did hack work for the local papers and spent a few hours each day copying in the office of major hapgood army paymaster at a good rate of remuneration this last opportunity to make expenses he secured no doubt through a clerk in major hapgood's department charles eldridge whitman's erstwhile boston publisher but the larger part of his income even when he had left the o'connors and had to pay for his meals he devoted to the sick and wounded whitman wrote regularly to his mother but for all his devotion to her he knew her limitations her strong points were natural qualities of sympathy common sense health and native dignity but she was quite unschooled and unliterary so that whitman consciously trimmed his letters to fit her powers of comprehension falling sometimes even into the colloquialisms of the whitman house he could be all things to all men a fact which accounts for the many conflicting reports that have survived of whitman himself there were in new york however correspondents boon companions of the pfaffian days to whom whitman could not only unbosom himself but could indulge in a wider range of reference in exhibiting his feelings one of the most illuminating letters of this sort was written to fred gray and his brother nat early in eighteen sixty three washington march nineteen eighteen sixty three dear nat and fred gray since i left new york i was down in the army of the potomac in front with my brother a good part of the winter commencing time of the battle of fredericksburg have seen war life the real article folded myself in a blanket lying down in the mud with composure relish salt pork and hardtack have been on the battlefield among the wounded the faint and the bleeding to give them nourishment have gone over with a flag of truce the next day to help direct the burial of the dead have struck up a tremendous friendship with a young mississippi captain about nineteen that we took prisoner badly wounded at fredericksburg he has followed me here is in the emory hospital here minus a leg he wears his confederate uniform proud as the devil i met him first at falmouth in the lacy house middle of december last his leg just cut off and cheered him up poor boy he has suffered a great deal and still suffers has eyes bright as a hawk but face pale 
our affection is an affair quite romantic sometimes when i lean over to say i am going he puts his arms around my neck draws my face down etc quite a scene for the new bowery i spent the christmas holidays on the rappahannock during january came up hither took a lodging room here did the thirty seventh congress especially the night sessions the last three weeks explored the capitol meandering the gorgeous painted interminable senate corridors getting lost in them a new sensation rich and strong that endless painted interior at night got very much interested in some particular cases and hospitals here go now steadily to more or less of said hospitals by day or night find always these sick and dying soldiers forthwith begin to cling to me in a way that makes a fellow feel funny enough these hospitals so different from all others these thousands and tens and twenties of thousands of american young men badly wounded all sorts of wounds operated on pallid with diarrhoea languishing dying with fever pneumonia etc open a new world somehow to me giving closer insights new things exploring deeper minds than any yet showing our humanity i sometimes put myself in fancy in the cot with typhoid or under the knife tried by terrible fearful list tests probed deepest the living souls the body's tragedies bursting the petty bonds of art to these what are your dramas and poems even the oldest and the tearfulest not o oh, greek mighty ones where man contends with fate and always yields not virgil showing dante on and on among the agonized and damned approach what here i see and take part in for here i see not at intervals but quite always how certain man our american man how he holds himself cool and unquestioned master above all pains and bloody mutilations it is immense the best thing of all nourishes me of all men this then what frightened us all so long why it is put to flight with ignominy a mere stuffed scarecrow of the fields o death where is thy sting o grave where is thy victory in the patent office as i stood there one night just off the cot side of a dying soldier in a large ward that had received the worst cases of second bull run antietam and fredericksburg the surgeon dr stone horatio stone the sculptor told me of all who had died in that crowded ward the past six months he had still to find the first man or boy who had met the approach of death with a single tremor or unmanly fear but let me change the subject i have given you screed enough about death in the hospitals and too much since i got started only i have some curious yarns i promise you my darlings and gossips by word of mouth whene'er we meet End of section 10. Section 11 of Whitman, an Interpretation in Narrative by Emery Holloway. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 5, Part 2, A Glimpse of War's Hell Scenes. Washington and its points, I find, bear a second and a third perusal, and doubtless many my first impressions architectural etc were not favourable but upon the whole the city the spaces buildings etc make no unfit emblem of our country so far so broadly planned everything in plenty money and materials staggering with plenty but the fruit of the plans the knit the combination yet wanting determined to express ourselves greatly in a capital but no fit capital yet here time associations wanting i suppose many a hiatus yet many a thing to be taken down and done over again yet perhaps an entire change of base may be a succession of changes congress does not seize very hard upon me i studied it and its members with curiosity and long much gab great fear of public opinion plenty of low business talent but no masterful man in congress probably best so i think well of the president he has a face like a hoosier michelangelo so awful ugly it becomes beautiful with its strange mouth its deep-cut criss-cross lines and its doughnut complexion my notion is too that underneath his outside smutched mannerism and stories from third-class county bar-rooms it is his humour mr lincoln keeps a fountain of first-class practical telling wisdom 
i do not dwell on the supposed failures of his government he has shown i sometimes think an almost supernatural tact in keeping the ship afloat at all with head steady not only not going down and now certain not to but with proud and resolute spirit and flag flying in sight of the world menacing and high as ever i say never yet captain never ruler had such a perplexing dangerous task as his the past two years i more and more rely upon his idiomatic western genius careless of court dress or court decorum i am living here without much definite aim except going to the hospitals yet i have quite a good time i make some money by scribbling for the papers and as copyist i've had and have thoughts of trying to get a clerkship or something but i only try in a listless sort of way and of course do not succeed i have strong letters of introduction from mr emerson to mr seward and mr chase but i have not presented them i have seen mr sumner several times anent my office hunting he promised fair once but he does not seem to be finally fascinated i hire a bright little third-story front room with service etc for seven dollars a month dine in the same house three ninety four l street a private house and remain yet much of the old vagabond that so gracefully becomes me i miss you all my darlings and gossips fred gray and bloom and russell and everybody i wish you would all come here in a body that would be divine we would drink ale which is here the best my health strength personal beauty etc are i am happy to inform you without diminution but on the contrary quite the reverse i weigh full two hundred and twenty pounds avoirdupois yet still retain my usual perfect shape a regular model my beard neck etc are woollier fleecier whiterer than ever i wear army boots with magnificent black morocco tops the trousers put in wear in shod and legged confront i virginia's deepest mud with supercilious eyes the scenery around washington is really fine the potomac a lordly river the hills woods etc all attractive i poke about quite a good deal much of the weather here is from heaven of late though a stretch decidedly from the other point to-night for it is night about ten i sit alone writing this epistle which will doubtless devour you all with envy and admiration in a room adjoining my own particular a gentleman and his wife who occupy the two other apartments on this floor have gone to see heron in medea have put their little child in bed and left me in charge the little one is sleeping soundly there in the back room and i plagued with a cold in the head sit here in the front by a good fire writing as aforesaid to my gossips and darlings the evening is lonesome and still i am entirely alone o oh, solitude where are the charms etc now you write to me good long letters my own boys you bloom give me your address particular dear friend tell me charles russell's address particular also write me about charles chauncey tell me about everybody for dearest gossips as the heart panteth etc so my soul after any and all sorts of items about you all my darling dearest boys if i could be with you this hour long enough to take only just three mild hot rums before cool weather closes friday morning twentieth i finished my letter in the office of major hapgood a paymaster and a friend of mine this is a large building filled with paymasters offices some thirty or forty or more this room is up on the fifth floor a most noble and broad view from my window curious scenes around here a continual stream of soldiers officers cripples etc some climbing wearily up the stairs they seek their pay and every hour almost every minute has its incident its hitch it's romance farce or tragedy there are two paymasters in this room a sentry at the street door another halfway up the stairs another at the chief clerk's door all with muskets and bayonets sometimes a great swarm hundreds around the sidewalk in front waiting everybody is waiting for something here i take a pause look up a couple of minutes from my pen and paper see spread off there the potomac very fine nothing petty about it the washington monument not half finished the public grounds around it filled with ten thousand beeves on the hoof to the left the smithsonian with its brown turrets and to the right far across arlington heights the forts eight or ten of them then the long bridge and down a ways but quite plain the shipping of alexandria 
opposite me and in a stone throw is the treasury building and below the bustle and life of pennsylvania avenue i shall hasten with my letter and then go forth and take a stroll down the avenue as they call it here now you boys don't you think i've done the handsome thing by writing this astoundingly magnificent letter certainly the longest i ever wrote in my life fred i wish you to present my best respects to your father bloom and all one of these days we will meet and make up for lost time my dearest boys walt address me care major hapgood paymaster u s army corps fifteenth and f street washington how is mullen give him my respects how is ben knower how the twinkling and temperate toll remember me to them Whitman would sleep rather late resting well after a night of emotional strain after leaving the o'connors he had breakfast in his room a lady visitor describes what he had to eat tea without milk a little sugar in a paper sack toast with butter from another paper bag with sometimes a sweetmeat then he would stroll down to fifteenth and f streets and climb five stories to the paymaster's office about three in the afternoon he would stop and go to a restaurant for his second and last meal of the day he seldom spent more than thirty cents for it then he would bathe refresh himself with clean linen and putting on as cheerful a heart as he could and slinging his army knapsack over his shoulder he would fill it at the stores with the articles which experience had taught him would be most welcome to his soldier boys the money for this came not only from his own pocket but from contributions amounting to some seven thousand dollars in all which were sent him by emerson and alcott as well as friends in providence new york and brooklyn who had learned of his work he went everywhere to the camps of teamsters where nobody else would go to the hospitals scattered through the government buildings to the barrack-like hospitals about the city and even those several miles out of town but he went more often where he was most needed to the armory square where were the worst cases and where the christian commissioners were least often to be seen or the fashionable women sometimes a friend would accompany him john burroughs once met him on the road leading to one of the outlying hospitals and being permitted to accompany him began a friendship which had been impossible in the more formal manner and one night his early friend john swinton went with him to another swinton has described what he saw the scene which was with whitman a daily occurrence throughout the war until the last hospital closed never shall i forget one night when i accompanied him on his rounds through a hospital filled with those wounded young americans whose heroism he has sung in deathless numbers there were three rows of cots and each cot bore its man when he appeared in passing along there was a smile of affection and welcome on every face however wan and his presence seemed to light up the place as it might be lit by the presence of the son of love from cot to cot they called him often in tremulous tones or in whispers they embraced him they touched his hand they gazed at him to one he gave a few words of cheer for another he wrote a letter home to others he gave her an orange a few comfits a cigar a pipe and tobacco a sheet of paper a postage stamp all of which and many other things were in his capacious haversack from another he would receive a dying message for mother wife or sweetheart for another he would promise to go an errand to another some special friend very low he would give a manly farewell kiss he did the things for them which no nurse or doctor could do and he seemed to leave a benediction at every cot as he passed along the lights had gleamed for hours in the hospital that night before he left it and as he took his way towards the door you could hear the voice of many a stricken hero calling walt 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 come again come again his basket and stores filled with all sorts of odds and ends for the men had been emptied he had really little to give but it seemed to me as though he gave more than other men sometimes when the wounded were dumped on the wharf he would buy all the oyster soup a restaurant had on hand and with the assistance of the nurses feed it to the weak and weary men sometimes he would buy a freezer of ice cream and treat a whole ward sometimes he would gather the men about him in some hospital where they were not bed fast and read them declamatory pieces of poetry if a dying man wished a priest or minister of some particular denomination whitman would scour the city till he got him or if some religiously raised boy wanted a passage read from the bible whitman was ready to read that book of consolation unlike the professional missionaries he had no propaganda to urge he carried no tracts he merely wanted to show his love and gratitude by easing for these boys the horrors of war 
he himself did not smoke but that was no reason he should lecture them on the evils of smoking if a boy declined the proffered tobacco whitman would commend him on his habits but if he accepted it with that hunger which smokers never feel so much as in an army he would give him pipe or cigar saying take it my brave boy and enjoy it in striking contrast to the welfare organizations in the world war the christian commission distributed no tobacco the emphasis they laid on making the boys better rather than happier is perhaps not inaccurately indicated by their annual report tracts had been distributed to the number of seven hundred and eighty seven thousand two hundred and seventy six pages while fifteen reams of letter paper were thought sufficient but walt's work did not fall into the impersonal routine which its constancy and its magnitude would have made all too easy for a less sympathetic and courageous man during the war he ministered according to his own estimate to perhaps a hundred thousand soldiers yet he had time to make diary notes of countless individual cases which he followed up sometimes for months at a time till they had won or lost their fight with death a union soldier named rafferty had been severely wounded above the knee the surgeons who seemed to have used the knife more recklessly than modern army men said he would have to lose the leg or his life he was frantic but to no purpose he was at their mercy but he decided to appeal to walt listening to his story in silence whitman patted the lad on the head reassuringly and said make your mind rest easy my boy they shan't take it off and they didn't many years afterwards that veteran telling the story with a gratitude still warm slapped his thigh and exclaimed this is the leg that man saved for me and the doctors told whitman that he often did more than that he did what in his first edition he said he would do i seize the descending man and raise him with resistless will o despairer here is my neck by god you shall not go down hang your whole weight upon me i daylight you with tremendous breath i buoy you up every room of the house do i fill with an armed force lovers of me bafflers of graves sleep i am they keep guard all night not doubt not disease shall dare lay finger upon you i have embraced you and henceforth possessed you to myself and when you rise in the morning you will find what i tell you is so one case will stand for many and we shall let whitman tell of it with him we enter ward six of the campbell hospital situated at the end of the horse car line on seventh avenue it contains to-day i should judge he wrote at the time eighty or a hundred patients half sick half wounded the edifice is nothing but boards well whitewashed inside and the usual slender frame bedsteads narrow and plain you walk down the central passage with a row on either side their feet towards you and their heads to the wall there are fires in large stoves and the prevailing white of the walls is relieved by some ornaments stars circles etc made of evergreens the view of the whole edifice and occupants can be taken at once for there is no partition you may hear groans or other sounds of unendurable suffering from two or three of the cots but in the main there is quiet almost a painful absence of demonstration but the pallid face the dulled eye and the moisture of the lip are demonstration enough most of these sick or hurt are evidently young fellows from the country farmers sons and such like look at the fine large frames the bright and broad countenances and the many yet lingering proofs of strong constitution and physique look at the patient and mute manner of our american wounded as they lie in such a sad collection representatives from all new england and from new york and new jersey and pennsylvania indeed from all the states and all the cities largely from the west most of them are entirely without friends or acquaintances here no familiar face and hardly a word of judicious sympathy or cheer through their sometimes long and tedious sickness or the pangs of aggravated wounds excepting always that of the good grey poet who before setting pen to paper wrote his war-time poems in unpretentious deeds of love his ministrations were entirely personal as this instance taken at random from many will testify take this case in ward six campbell hospital a young man from plymouth county massachusetts a farmer's son aged about twenty or twenty-one a soldierly american young fellow but with sensitive and tender feelings 
most of december and january last he lay very low and for quite a while i never suspected he would recover he had become prostrated with an obstinate diarrhoea his stomach would hardly keep the least thing down he was vomiting half the time but that was hardly the worst of it let me tell a story it is but one of thousands he had been sick some time with his regiment in the field in front but did his duty as long as he could was in the battle of fredericksburg soon after was put in the regimental hospital he kept getting worse could not eat anything they had there the doctor told him nothing could be done for him there the poor fellow had fever also received perhaps it could not be helped little or no attention lay on the ground getting worse toward that latter part of december very much enfeebled he was sent up from the front from falmouth station in an open platform car such as hogs are transported upon north and dumped with a crowd of others on the boat at aquia creek falling down like a rag where they deposited him too weak and sick to sit or help himself at all no one spoke to him or assisted him he had nothing to eat or drink was used amid the great crowds of sick either with perfect indifference or as in two or three instances with heartless brutality on the boat when night came and when the air grew chilly he tried a long time to undo the blankets he had in his knapsack but was too feeble he asked one of the employees who was moving around deck for a moment's assistance to get the blankets the man asked him back if he could not get them himself he answered no he had been trying for more than half an hour and found himself too weak the man rejoined he might then go without them and walked off so h lay chilled and damp on deck all night without anything under or over him while two good blankets were within reach it caused him a great injury nearly cost him his life arrived at washington he was brought ashore and again left on the wharf or above it amid the great crowds as before without any nourishment not a drink for his parched mouth no kind hand had offered to cover his face from the forenoon sun conveyed at last some two miles by ambulance to the hospital and assigned a bed he fell down exhausted upon the bed but the wardmaster he had since been changed came to him with a growling order to get up the rules he said permitted no man to lie down in that way with his clothes on he must sit up must first go to the bathroom be washed and have his clothes completely changed a very good rule properly applied he was taken to the bathroom and scrubbed well in cold water the attendants callous for a while were soon alarmed for suddenly the half-frozen and lifeless body fell limpsy in their hands and they hurried it back to the cot plainly insensible perhaps dying poor boy the long train of exhaustion deprivation rudeness no food no friendly word or deed but all kinds of upstart airs and impudent unfeeling speeches and deeds from all kinds of small officials and some big ones cutting like razors into that sensitive heart had at last done the job he now lay at times out of his head but quite silent asking nothing of any one for some days with death getting a closer and surer grip upon him he cared not or rather he welcomed death his heart was broken he felt the struggle to keep up any longer to be useless god the world humanity all had abandoned him he would feel so good to shut his eyes forever on the cruel things around and toward him as luck would have it at this time i found him i was passing down ward number six one day about dusk fourth january i think and noticed his glassy eyes with a look of despair and hopelessness sunk low in his thin pallid brown young face one learns to divine quickly in the hospital and as i stopped by him and spoke some commonplace remark to which he made no reply i saw as i looked that it was a case for ministering the, to the affection first and other nourishment and medicines afterward i sat down by him without any fuss talked a little soon saw that it did him good let him talk a little himself got him somewhat interested wrote a letter for him to his folks in massachusetts to l h campbell plymouth county soothed him down as i saw he was getting a little too much agitated and tears in his eyes gave him some small gifts and told him i should come again soon he has told me since that this little visit at that hour just saved him a day more and it would have been perhaps too late of course i did not forget him for he was a young fellow to interest any one he remained very sick vomiting much every day infrequent diarrhoea and also something like bronchitis the doctor said for a while i visited him almost every day cheered him up took him some little gifts and gave him small sums of money he relished a drink of new milk when it was brought through the ward for sale 
for a couple of weeks his condition was uncertain sometimes i thought there was no chance for him at all but of late he is doing better he is up and dressed and goes around more and more february twenty first every day he will not die but will recover the other evening passing through the ward he called me he wanted to say a few words particular i sat down by his side on the cot in the dimness of the long ward with the wounded soldiers there in their beds ranging up and down he told me i had saved his life he was in the deepest earnest about it it was one of those things that repay a soldier's hospital missionary a thousandfold one of the hours he never forgets a benevolent person with the right qualities and tact cannot perhaps make a better investment of himself at present anywhere upon the very surface of the whole of this big world than in these military hospitals among such thousands of most interesting young men of course the question recurred to whitman whether he should not have enlisted displaying the masculine courage to kill and be killed rather than the feminine courage to suffer that life may endure when the first draft was applied though not without protesting riots in new york whitman was in fear that jeff's name would be drawn he could not endure to think of jeff's being taken away from his wife and child jeff still the chief support of the family even though his salary had recently been cut in half so he proposed borrowing money and hiring a substitute but for himself it was a question of where he with his qualities would be worth most but as if to assure himself that his motives were untinged with cowardice he insisted that his name be put down on the draft list where fate might do with him as she would yet for all that it was not in whitman to level a rifle or thrust a sword at his brother man in whitman were many qualities so highly developed that any one might have destroyed his health and his happiness were it not under the control of a natural instinct for letting other qualities have their innings his poise was not that of a simple fanatical nature much less that of a callous one it was the poise of powers balanced against each other if any one gave way the force of its correlative became apparent even his philanthropy in the hospitals was two-sided he was learning from the soldiers as well as comforting them learning for instance the human history of the war learning much of manly endurance and stoical self-restraint and of the strength of the widespread love of america which he had once thought more or less peculiar to himself but the wounds of war did not fill his whole horizon the life he lived was picturesque was well and exciting and there was no place to get at the heart of it like the national capital near the front he sat at his window and contemplated a cavalry camp opposite he studied the expression on the faces of southern prisoners or the union deserters he went freely among the countless teamsters he thrilled to the proud march of a regiment passing down the street one day in eighteen sixty four when burnside's army was scheduled to pass through washington walt stood on the curb scanning the faces of the captains for a sight of george after three hours he picked him out marching erect stepping from the curb to the side of the brother of whose record he was so proud whitman marched with him talking quietly but so eagerly that george to his great chagrin neglected to salute the president on a balcony as they passed whitman's sharp eye had picked him out but not until it was too late lincoln was a sight familiar to whitman in these days passing daily in his open barouche near the poet's rooming place each had recognized the unusual calibre of the other and they saluted each other with a bow the summer of eighteen sixty three was a trying one the heat was unusual and whitman had never spent a summer so far south the depression effect of close contact with the pitiful side of war was not easily shaken off when after each battle fresh thousands of wrecked young bodies were sent to the washington hospitals he opened his heart to his mother in his regular letters of filial tenderness every once in a while i feel so horrified and disgusted it seems to me like a great slaughter-house and the men mutually butchering each other then i feel how impossible it appears again to retire from this contest until we have carried our points so every one feels who is close to war itself possibly both sides could have retired after gettysburg had there been any foreign peacemaker but european governments fearful of the spread of democracy were all too hopeful that the south would make good its secession from the union whitman thought such sympathy with the rebellion a poor return for america's national hospitality yet he blamed not the people so much as their governments those governments doubtless realize that the world cannot always remain half democratic and half aristocratic 
whitman at least realized this for about this time he wrote a poem of remarkable prophecy years of the modern foreseeing as in a mystic vision a civil war of the world on this very issue but america like himself was a pioneer and had to pay the price of loneliness for the privilege of living in the future these western youths willingly dying for freedom have brought to him afresh his theme all the past we leave behind we debouch upon of newer mightier world varied world fresh and strong the world we seize world of labor and the march pioneers o oh pioneers by october whitman felt that he must go home for a time he had left brooklyn on a temporary mission but now he had been away nearly a year his brother andrew was approaching death from a throat disease which steadily grew worse whitman had never been away from his mother so long before moreover he had a new niece sister to manahatta whom walt longed to see besides he needed a change an army friend will wallace steward in charge of a hospital in nashville had urged him to come to nashville and live with him in a hotel the former was running for the army promising him work on a newspaper just being started there he addressed whitman as prince of bohemians and held out as a special inducement the fact that he had a number of beautiful army nurses boarding at his hotel doubtless the laxity and morals which accompany every war was no exception with the armies then wallace admitted in a second letter that he had had to dismiss his most beautiful nurse who was french in order to save the reputation of the hospital and his reference to a whitman letter which has been lost makes it clear that whitman himself unknown of course to the o'connors and the burroughses had to the temporary hurt of his health yielded to the temptation which he had left their mark upon him in new orleans the effect of the experience was however far more incidental than that of his friendship for the soldier boys had whitman gone to nashville he might still have ministered to the wounded and earned the money of which he stood so much in need although throughout these years he contemplated a lecture tour to supply him with the funds his hospital work required nothing came of it doubtless one other reason why he went back to brooklyn at this time was his hope of persuading some publisher to bring out a little book memoranda of a year intended for the christmas trade and for sale among the army it was the realistic yet highly spiritual diary jottings of his hospital experiences the like of which had never been written later he published them in specimen days but in eighteen sixty three publishers were wary of innovations or possibly they feared that such an unmasking of the horrors of war would discourage enlistments his chief ambition however was to get a publisher for drum taps which had now been augmented by many new poems descriptive of scenes at the front and in the washington hospitals he had a right to be proud of these poems for they showed a distinct artistic improvement the fire of inspiration is still there but now it is controlled the poems are purged of redundancy increased in lyrical smoothness carefully constructed and shot through with the most exalted patriotism it was the new chapter in his autobiography all the more his own for betraying so little self-consciousness he had given himself to a great cause he had been rewarded in his art never again did he write an egotistical line or celebrate the matter apart from spirit in drum taps he achieved his ideal that of expressing at once his own spirit and that of his country yet a publisher was not immediately to be found for the book in new york old friendships soul sights and pleasures reached out inviting fingers to draw him back into his former self-indulgent life but they were comparatively powerless he had become father to the army and felt not only a father's responsibility but a parent's joy in investing himself in younger life a single letter written at the time will clearly reveal his mood brooklyn saturday night november twenty one sixty three dear son and comrade i wrote a few lines about five days ago and sent on to armory square but as i have not heard from it i suppose you have gone to michigan i got your letter of november tenth and it gave me much comfort douglas i shall return to washington about the twenty fourth so when you write direct to care of major hapgood may paymaster u s a washington d c dearest comrade i only write this lest the one i wrote five days ago may not reach you from the hospital i am still here at my mother's and feel as if i have had enough of going around new york enough of amusements suppers drinking and what is called pleasure 
dearest son it would be more pleasure if we could be together just in quiet in some plain way of living with some good employment and reasonable income where i could have you often with me than all the dissipations and amusements of this great city oh i hope things may work so that we can yet have each other's society for i cannot bear the thought of being separated from you i know i am a great fool about such things but i tell you the truth dear son i do not think one night has passed in new york or brooklyn when i have been at the theatre or opera or afterward to some supper party or carousal made by the young fellows for me but what amid the play or singing i would perhaps suddenly think of you and the same at the gayest supper party of men where all was fun and noise and laughing and drinking of a dozen young men and i among them would see your face before me in my thought as i have seen it so often there in ward g and my amusement or drink would all be turned to nothing and i would realize how happy it would be if i could leave all the fun and noise and crowd and be with you i don't wish to disparage my dear friends and acquaintances here there are so many of them and all so good many so educated travelled etc some so handsome and witty some rich and some among the literary class many young men all good many of them educated and polished and brilliant in conversation etc and though i value their society and friendship and i do for it is worth valuing but douglas i will tell you the truth you are so much closer to me than any of them that there is no comparison there has never passed so much between them as me as we have besides there is something that takes down all artificial accomplishments and that is a manly and loving soul my dearest comrade i am sitting here writing to you very late at night i have been reading it is indeed after twelve and my mother and all the rest have gone to bed two hours ago and i am here above writing to you and i enjoy it too although it is not much yet i know it will please you dear boy if you get this you must write and tell me where and how you are i hope you are quite well and with your dear wife for i know you have long wished to be with her and i wish you to give her my best respects and love too douglas i haven't written any news for there is nothing particular i have to write well it is now past midnight pretty well on to one o'clock and my sheet is mostly written out so my dear darling boy i must bid you good-night or rather good morning and i hope it may be god's will we shall yet be with each other but i must indeed bid you good-night my dear loving comrade and the blessing of god on you by night and day my darling boy perhaps hundreds of such whitman letters exist revealing how pity has grown into sympathy and that into personal affection comrades or buddies grown into a great family through common love for the mother of all separated when the war is over vainly striving to transmute into friendship that will endure an emotion which after all is spiritual rather than personal the very multitude of such contacts was the salvation for the author of calamus we note that now he has no demands to make he suffers from no jealousy he gives rather than receives and submits the course of his attachment not to his imperious needs but to the will of god walt had just returned to washington and reoccupied his little third-story back room when a letter from jeff informed him that andrew was dead he did not attend the funeral probably because he could not buy a ticket he had travelled before on transportation furnished him by john hay when george's term of enlistment expired he longed to be at home to see him but that pleasure too had to be foregone there is a touch of pathos in his memory of his recent visit when i come home again he writes his mother i shall not go off gallivanting with my companions half as much nor a quarter as much as i used to but shall spend the time quietly with you while i do stay it is a great humbug to go springing about and a few choice friends of horror man the real right kind in a quiet way are enough in february major hapgood went down to culpeper virginia to pay off the army there taking eldridge with him probably it was in this company that whitman also went down he had expressed a wish to see a real battle partly no doubt out of his omnivorous curiosity partly because he could hardly say he had seen the war without having seen any fighting then too he thought his services to the wounded might be more valuable in a field hospital he was in the south only about two weeks but it was worth his while to go the beautiful country the tender air the noble grace of the confederate mother with whom he boarded yet there about him the fever of war the fear of some sudden terrible attack by lee he kept step with the army when on a march in the ranks hard pressed and the road unknown he ploughed the unctuous mud he kept vigil all night with the body of a fallen comrade 
vigil wondrous and vigil sweet there in the fragrant silent night but not a tear fell not even a long-drawn sigh long long i gazed then on the earth partially reclining sat by your side leaning my chin in my hands passing sweet hours immortal and mystic hours with you dearest comrade not a tear not a word vigil of silence love and death vigil for you my son and my soldier as onward silently stars aloft eastward new ones upward stole vigil final for you brave boy i could not save you swift was your death i faithfully loved you and cared for you living i think we shall surely meet again till at the latest lingering of the night indeed just as the dawn appeared my comrade i wrapped in his blanket enveloped well his form folded the blanket well tucking it carefully over head and carefully under feet and there and then and bathed by the rising sun my son in his grave in his rude dug grave i deposited ending my vigil strange with that vigil of night and battle field dim vigil for boy of responding kisses never again on earth responding vigil for comrades swiftly slain vigil i never forget how his day brightened i rose from the chill ground and folded my soldier well in his blanket and buried him where he fell returning to washington whitman resumed his hospital visits but soon the strain began to tell on even his magnificent physique before he not only subjected himself to a daily harrowing of his emotions in caring for and comforting the sick he was wound dresser as well combining in his self-imposed service the functions of the red triangle and the red cross bearing the bandages water and sponge swift and straight to my wound did i go where they lie on the ground after the battle brought in where the priceless blood reddens the grass the ground or to the rows of the hospital tent or under the roofed hospital to the long rows of cots up and down each side i return to each and all one after another i draw near not one do i miss an attendant follows holding a tray he carries a refuse pail soon to be filled with clotted rags and blood emptied and filled again i onward go i stop with wind knees and steady hand to dress wounds i am firm with each the pangs are sharp yet unavoidable one turns to me his appealing eyes poor boy i never knew you yet i think i could not refuse this moment to die for you if that would save you but perhaps the hardest of his task came when despite his best efforts the boy died and he must write the melancholy news to parent or sister even the letter of condolence which lincoln under a misapprehension of the facts wrote to mrs bixby revealed no more compassionate heart than did these letters whitman visualized his mother as she read it seeing in her his own mother reading news of the wounding of george and always he so tempered the winds of war to the shorn lamb as to make even cruel news a benediction often he was rewarded by the gratitude of those to whom he wrote instance his letter about the wounding of cunningham which inspired his touching poem come up from the fields father war is easily made heroic and romantically glamorous when we deal with it in the mass whitman felt this in virginia as standing in the darkness he watched an army passing by not as individuals temporarily forming a cohort but as a majestic people en masse it fell upon me like a great awe he said but it was realistic too and while he believed there were social and political ideals more precious than life he also believed that a war which destroys the humanity of the warriors can accomplish no commensurate good yes walt kept close to reality attendants in a military hospital are lucky if they do not lose their ideals altogether the hospital malaria however and the contact with innumerable gangrenous wounds gave him an infection and undermined his vitality little by little the doctor fearful of the health of so valuable an assistant warned him but he who had never known sickness did not appreciate the importance of the warning in june eighteen sixty four he had to give up entirely for several months he was reluctant to do so however for he was haunted by the fear that george might one day be brought in and, and be he not there to minister to his own he went home to recuperate but as soon as he was able to be about he again took up his task in the poorly cared-for hospitals in brooklyn and new york then came the news that george was a confederate prisoner at the petersburg camp in virginia at once wall tried to get through the lines to nurse him and his comrades but without success he then sought through his connections in washington to have his brother exchanged only to learn that all exchanges had been stopped 
in his personal anxiety he wrote an indignant letter to the press severely condemning this policy of the administration as unnecessarily brutal whatever military reasons might be assigned for it eventually however george was exchanged and continued his career of bravery in the union army meanwhile the energetic o'connor was trying to get whitman a clerkship in one of the departments of washington such as he and eldridge and burroughs enjoyed which letters from emerson and others had never as yet secured for whitman the reputation of the eighteen sixty edition was against him first o'connor obtained for walt a position in the post office but declined to present it to whitman as not suited to his way of working finally however through hubley hashton he found a clerkship in the department of the interior under secretary harlan ex-preacher and ex-senator his work would require but a few hours a day he would have ample funds for his needs and his hospital benefactions he would have an excellent place to prepare his contemplated fourth edition of leaves of grass incorporating drum taps not yet published copying documents and investigating routine cases naturally had little interest for whitman but in the interior department indian bureau he had opportunity to observe many indians themselves who coming to washington to call on the president or to sign treaties would sit on the floor about the wall in the bureau office in the treasury building whitman had imbibed not a little of rousseau's passion for the natural man here he had a chance to see the best that nature unassisted by civilization and art could do with the humanity and he was not disappointed of course he knew nothing of indian life or indian psychology though in his youth he had written the indian stories then so popular but judging by what that life had made the chiefs mean to themselves in pride of personal bearing he was not so sure the white man had not paid too high a price for his elegance his mastery and his smartness their feathers paint even the empty buffalo skull which one wore as a headpiece did not to say the least seem any more ludicrous to me than many of the fashions i have seen in civilized society i should not apply the word savage at any rate in the usual sense as a leading word in the description of those great aboriginal specimens of whom i certainly saw many of the best there were moments as i looked at them or studied them when our own exemplification of personality dignity heroic presentation anyhow as in the conventions of society or even in the accepted poems and plays seemed sickly puny inferior occasionally i would go to the hotels where the bands were quartered and spend an hour or two informally i had the good luck to be invariably received and treated by all of them in their most cordial manner fifteen years later stopping at topeka on a trip to colorado whitman accompanied a group of officials to see a number of these indians in prison they uniformly refused recognition to any of the impressively introduced government men but following the lead of one of the old chiefs each extended to whitman his hand and voiced a cordial howl and whitman meter of saint and savage on equal terms confessed i was not a little set up to find that the critters knew the difference and didn't confound me with the big guns of officialism but whitman's connection with the indian bureau was brief and even that brief connection was broken by a trip to brooklyn whither he went to publish drum taps at his own expense in may he had been promoted from a first-class clerkship paying twelve hundred dollars a year to one of the second-class paying sixteen hundred dollars a year there had been no complaint on the score of his competency or his faithfulness he was the more chagrined therefore on june thirtieth to find himself dismissed from his office by the secretary himself who assigned no reason he was a case as whitman could see in which he must wisely make use of his friends mr ashton the assistant attorney-general called the next day upon secretary harlan to find out the cause of the sudden dismissal harlan was perfectly frank to say that he dismissed whitman because of his authorship of leaves of grass his impression of whitman was that he was a free lover and advocated free love principles the book was out of print but harlan had got hold of whitman's own annotated copy in or on his desk and turning his pages after office hours had at once made up his mind to dismiss him he was not a man of wide outlook and had the that ingrained puritanism common to methodist ministers of the west with little knowledge of literature 
it was not a political move on the secretary's part for he expected it to be kept quiet but he was so sincere whether from bigotry or the same feeling which inspired so many of the early reviews and some of emerson's reservation that he would retreat from his position before no eloquence of mr ashton concerning whitman's character and manner of life in washington indeed he declared he would resign his own position first he appears not to have appreciated the seriousness of what whitman thought most despicable in the affair the surreptitious method used in obtaining his evidence but the same evidence brought to his attention in a less underhanded manner would doubtless have had the same result on whitman's fortunes for this political representative of the land of liberty and aspirin for the vice-presidency whom lincoln refused as a running mate did not believe in the liberty of literature to deal with matters obnoxious to the moral reactions of the average man long afterward harlan found that by his action he had decapitated not whitman whose good was stronger than his bad but himself and is said to have acknowledged his error of judgment however pressed for a written statement of his position he declared that the dismissal like many others was dictated by a post-war policy of economy adding that whitman's chief the hon william p dole had named whitman as the clerk most easily to be spared in the indian bureau had arlen talked with whitman the latter would perhaps have confessed to him that he himself was unsatisfied with some passages in his earlier editions that he was now eliminating many of these lines and altering others for the new edition though he would not admit that there had been any evil intent even at the time of writing shortly before whitman had written o'connor i see now some things in it i should not put it in if i were to write now but yet i shall certainly let them stand even if but for proofs a phrase has passed away but with characteristic obstinacy he would not alter his original plan for putting a man's entire life in a book the high esteem in which he and drum taps were held at the moment among persons of prominence and sense indeed only strengthened the proof which his book sought to make that good might grow from evil this optimistic emersonian doctrine was of more importance than the vicissitudes of his personal life though the latter might serve to point the moral unfortunately however he did not make the most of his autobiographical method in setting forth that truth for he did not always arrange his poems in the order of their composition only recently has that been done whitman might have appealed to lincoln whom he believed to be favorably impressed by his personal appearance if not by his poetry but alas the war which had slain a million privates had also taken the martyr chief despite his charity for all his malice for none the ship had ridden out the storm and with sail and rudder wrecked was making into a peaceful port the port is near the bells i hear the people all exulting while follow eyes the steady keel the vessel grim and daring but o oh, heart 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 oh the bleeding drops of red where on the deck my captain lies fallen cold and dead early on the morning of saturday april fifteenth news was flashed to new york that abraham lincoln had been shot by an assassin the evil tidings enveloped the city with the swiftness of a storm cloud whitman was at home with his mother both were stunned as only those who love deeply and purely can be stunned the daily routine the meals prepared but no mouthful touched by either throughout the day the extras hungrily scanned in hope of the president's recovery it was a personal grief to whitman who had trusted in the president's purposes and relied on his skill when many did not finding a certain kindred loneliness with him as a silent but comprehending great companion on the open road of duty returning to washington whitman learned from a friend peter dore the whole story of the murder the latter having seen it from the balcony of the theatre for whitman it was throughout his life a solemn memorial at home or at the house of a friend years afterward he would lift his glass in silence toward the picture of his dead chief and drink to his memory now however he must find relief in song and in doing so composed what swinburne a master of melody himself described as the most sonorous nocturne ever chanted in the church of the world when lilacs last in the dooryard bloom is just that national religious music and no mere occasional poem whitman's lines must be read as music is read fragmentary quotation here would only do violence to his delicate interwoven motifs of lilac scent and singing thrush and symbolical star to its incremental repetitions to its haunting uplifting suggestiveness taking what one may look upon as quite accidental experiences coincident with his personal shock in the loss of lincoln whitman succeeded in weaving them together with an effect of actuality which was not that of mere 
a circumstantial detail but rather that of the national emotion transfiguring for the moment of the individual's world with the equality of something universal whitman said that never thereafter could he think of the lilac bush without thinking of lincoln and never can the reader of this sublimest of our poems it belonged as the capstone to his drum taps but the book was already in print so women stopped its sale and later added this poem with the stanzaic elegy o captain my captain as a sequel bound in late copies the spirit whose work was done the spirit of liberty at war had laid the to rest private and chief in the common patriot's grave where ballast cannot follow and whitman sang for both a song of pride and peace moreover he added a note of reconciliation which had he lived to read it would have brought tears to the eyes of the man who had spoken the inaugural in march word over all beautiful as the sky beautiful that war and all its deeds of carnage must in time be utterly lost that the hands of the sisters death and night incessantly wash again and ever again this soiled world for my enemy is dead a man as divine as myself is dead i look where he lies white-faced and still in the coffin i draw near bend down and touch lightly with my lips the white face in the coffin End of section eleven